Well, let me, I have to turn it on first. Mandy, can you hear us okay? We're better now. Folks, good evening and welcome to the 23rd meeting of the 25th City Council. We'll call this meeting to order. All councilors are present this evening, and as we always do, we'll begin with a moment of silence and a pledge of allegiance. This evening, it's led in English by Councilor Sanchez and in Spanish by Councilor Bassan. Thank you both. Uh, a few housekeeping items. We're going to play with the volume a little bit here. So, uh, Civic Plaza parking passes will be available for members of the public. If you can, you can obtain a parking pass from our staff at the table near the chamber's entrance where you came in earlier. Members of the public, our staff, and the media also have the ability to view this meeting in person and on live stream through our four different platforms on GovTV, on Channel 16, the GovTV website, YouTube, and our Zoom webinar. All of those live streams can be accessed from our smartphones, tablets, and computers, and our meeting is closed captioned, so you may enable that on your device if you need so. Uh, a video recording of this and all of our meetings remains available for viewing at any time on the City Council's website. City Council staff are always available to help members of the public if you need assistance. Just call our office, 768-3100, for assistance during normal business hours. Our, we will take a break this evening at approximately 7 p.m. if we need it. I bet we will. Uh, with regard to decorum in the chambers, we want tonight's proceeding to be as civil and respectful as possible. Please don't make any personal attacks, and we ask that you help us keep the meeting on track uh, and not by uh, no applause and no other outburst during the meeting. Our meeting goes a lot smoother if we are respectful to each other. And that brings me to the things I have to say. Uh, these are a few words about decorum and rules that are put in place. Uh, Mr. Cornelius will remind us for our public speakers when we get to that as well. There are no signs, props, or panners allowed in the chambers other than that which can be displayed on the overhead during presentations. Such those are limited to normal paper size like an eight and a half by 11. Such materials should not be held or waved in a manner that blocks the view of others or creates a distraction from the speaker or from the business. Any items on the overhead must be removed from the projector at the end of your public comment. Only the individual whom the council president has called on to provide public comment may stand at the podium unless you need an exception for those who need a translator or reasonable accommodations. Multiple persons are not permitted to stand behind the presenter. The timeline for public comment is strictly enforced. Mr. Cornelius will give you a warning and a notice and then uh, will uh, enforce the rule. Public comments must be directed to the council through the president, not at the staff or other members of the audience. There is no tolerance for disruptive public outburst. Our handicapped area is to the right of the dais and must be kept clear at all times. Uh, for those desiring to record the meeting or take pictures, you'll be directed to the landing area and you can check with our staff for spaces you can do that safely. The fire marshal enforces all of our ingress and egress rules so as to ensure public safety. Ooh -wee. I will provide one warning to anyone causing a disruption. Upon the second or continuing disruption, that individual will be asked to leave the chambers and if necessary, security are asked to escort that person out. Such removal uh, will be effective for the remainder of the meeting. If continued disruptions occur, I may recess the meeting until order is restored, and if necessary, may clear the chambers of persons uh, participating in the disturbance. That is all for the do's and don'ts. We are going live to business. Proclamations and presentations. Madam Vice President. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, proclamation re uh, recognizing the selfless seniors. Shannon Barnhill, Executive Director of the APS Education Foundation and Val Birch, Development Manager for the APS Education Foundation to accept. And I would love for our selfless seniors all to come down too. Thank you all for being here. Whereas Albuquerque Public Schools established the Selfless Senior Program to recognize students 
who quietly contribute to our community through selfless acts that do not earn a lot of fanfare or recognition. And whereas APS has partnered with Frank Frost on this init initiative for the last 15 years to recognize and celebrate these students for their dedication to their schools and their commitment to serving others. And whereas students from APS schools are nominated by their friends, school staff, their families, or community members, and most have never been publicly thanked or praised for their contributions to our community. And whereas the young people chosen for the class of 2023 represent the best of our city and our hope for a bright future. And they are, from Albuquerque High School, Ava Stratton, from Atrisco Heritage Academy High School, Roslyn Chevaria Morales, from Cibola High School, Rebecca Thomas, from Del Norte High School, Ezekiel Romero, from El Dorado High School, Myra Lacey, from Free Freedom High School, Matthew Marquez Henderson, from Highland High School, Harmony Jenkins, from La Cueva High School, Michael Lopez, from Manzano High School, Olivia Withrow, from Rio Grande High School, Enrique Nunez, from Sandia High School, William Wartz, from Valley High School, Tiana De Vargas, from Volcana Vista High School, Zoe Baca, and from West Mesa High School, Marielle, um, Marielle Leon Lozano, Lozano. Be it proclaimed that the council, the governing body of the city of Albuquerque, hereby recognizes the Albuquerque Public Schools Class of 2023 selfless seniors and thanks them for their service to our community. Thank you guys very much. I'm so proud of you. Shannon, I'd like to ask you if you'd just tell us a little bit about the foundation and what it does for our community and our children. Thank you and good evening, President Davis, Vice President Grout, counselors and citizens. We appreciate being here and I am Shannon Barnhill, the Executive Director of the APS Education Foundation. I am honored to be here tonight with these amazing 14 selfless seniors. On behalf of the APS Foundation, our 2023 selfless seniors, we want to sincerely thank you for recognizing the service of these incredible soon-to-be graduates. For 15 years, Frank Frost came to us um, with this idea and has been so wonderful in trying to make sure that our community, that our city knows about these amazing kids and what they're giving back to our community. So as Frank would say, he's not looking to honor the already spotlighted kids in their schools. He is looking for those who wanted to give selflessly back to their community and peers without expectation of praise. We tell each class of the selfless seniors that they represent their respective schools and their philanthropic spirit of all students that grace their halls. We tell them that they also represent the school district, its entire student body, and inspires acts of service in their underclassmen, middle school, and elementary schools. Now we can tell you that they have this proclamation and we appreciate that and we appreciate the generous spirit that the city of Albuquerque is giving to them. And this reminds us all that we can make time to give to those in need, champion a cause, give voice to the voiceless, and in that spirit, we can make our city a better place to live. That's what these 14 selfless seniors are doing. I'd like to acknowledge their friends and their family that are in the audience. I would just like them to stand and wave because we are very proud of the students that they have provided Albuquerque Public School. Thank you again for this opportunity and this recognition. Thank you, Shannon. I know you guys are going to do, and gals are going to do great things in the future. I know. Thank you for being here this evening. Madam, Madam Vice President, I think you have another proclamation. I do, yeah. Mr. President. Um, I would like to invite the Albuquerque Public uh, Police Department Homicide Unit to come on up.
ici. Hello. Chief Medina, I'm very proud of these men and women. Um, I'd like to read this proclamation. They have been very, very busy. Whereas the Albuquerque Police Department Homicide Unit had a 94% case clearance rate in 2022, compared with an average of 55% in previous years. And whereas 117 homicide sus suspects were charged or found deceased last year, bringing a sense of closure to families that lost a loved one to violence, crime. And whereas APD homicide detectives solved more than a, more homicides than ever in 2022, closing 119 cases, including 69 of the 120 homicides from 2022 alone. Whereas the homicide unit now consists of 16 detectives and two sergeants, and they are Sergeant Jaime Rascone, Sergeant David Fox, Sergeant or Detective Connor Coleman, Detective John Garcia, Detective Stephanie Cockrell, Detective Chris Sandoval, Detective Curtis Hoffman, Detective Scott McMurrow, Detective Stephen Sines, Detective Brett Warth, Detective Edward Smith, Detective David Small, Detective Ann Bruciaga, um, Detective Ian Melville, Detective Jesse Curry, Detective Jordan Monart, Detective William Jackson, and Detective Brandon Watts. And whereas the unit added a digital intelligence team which assists investigations of violent crimes by collecting digital evidence from historical records, device locations, and cell tower data. That team includes examiner Colette Bridgewater, examiner Kara Mosley, and examiner Catherine Rosoff. And whereas the victim service unit was created this year to ensure that survivors of violent crime are treated with respect, compassion, and dignity. And they are Terry Wartz, Leanne Marks, Hazariah Gallegos, Brittany Martinez, and homicide liaison Jennifer Sanchez. And whereas a single homicide is one too many, and that 120 of these horrible crimes were committed in a single year should shock our community. While we never bring back the precious lives lost, the homicides team diligently worked, work begins the, proce begins the process of bringing justice and closure for those who have lost a loved one to violence. Be it proclaimed that the council, the governing body of the city of Albuquerque, hereby applauds the APD homicide unit for its good work and thanks these investigators and victim advocates for their service to our community. I'd like to thank you all. You all want to come through here and we would like to shake your hands and personally thank you.
Chief, would you mind just saying a few more words about these wonderful men and women? President Davis, uh, Vice President Grouse, I just want to thank you guys for recognizing our officers. Uh, homicide units, uh, they put their lives on hold many times. I can't remember how many weekends, how many nights uh, I get the alert that there's uh, been a homicide and I know that our team are out there and uh, they put their uh, live personal lives on hold many times to go out and help others uh, find a sense of justice and closure in what's occurred to them. Uh, I know we talked about the detectives and the detectives deserve all the credit, uh, but there are a couple other people that have done a wonderful job. Every team needs a coach and I want to thank uh, Lieutenant Rachel Greco, uh, Deputy Commander Kyle Hartsock, uh, Commander George Vega, who had retired and I was able to convince to come back, and uh, Deputy Chief Barker for their dedication in making sure that they build a team that works together, that works as one. And as you saw all those individuals up here, uh, they are one team. I had lunch with them last week and it is just great to see the chemistry amongst the team and uh, the spirit amongst them. Uh, and I think a lot of that spirit has to do with the recognition that they've received in the past year, along with the fact that they have been very successful. And you could add, I think, three more cases to that today, George. Three more homicide cases were closed today, so uh, I know it's early in the year, but they're at 250% clearance now. <laughs> Thank you very much. We appreciate y'all. Thank you, ma'am, and thank you for bringing that. And congratulations, and thank you to everybody, and thank you to, the, to our homicide unit for all the hard work. Um, just a reminder, it's easier to close more than 100% of our cases if we have more closures than homicides. So let's, we're, we're going to work on that. Uh, next up, Councilor Pena, presentation for Ari. I was still looking out, saying, oh, they're all so cool. <laughs> so um, thank you. It looks like you guys fixed the mics, or is it just me? Wow. Um, so the, next we have a presentation on the Albuquerque Regional Economic Alliance area. Danielle Casey is here. She's the president and CEO to present. Welcome, Danielle. I'll turn it over to you. Thank you so very much, um, President Davis, Vice President Grau, members of the council, community members. It is a, a true honor and privilege to be here tonight. Out of respect for your time, I'm going to whip through some slides quickly and give you an overview on what area is, what we've been up to, and... Uh, and hopefully that'll get you some information there. I know I have a, a helper here advancing slides, so you'll hear next quite a bit. So with that, please hit the next slide. Uh, Albuquerque Regional Economic Alliance is a regional economic development organization and partner in the community. Uh, we're formerly known as Albuquerque Economic Development Inc., if you've heard that name, and, and um, I'll talk about it in just a moment, but it was a very intentional shift to start talking about regionalism and our partnership across the community. And also, it was really confusing for people. They thought we were the city, and while um, also I do want to commend you on a wonderful new economic development director who I've had the, the privilege of working with in his state position for several years, and also an amazing uh, economic development staff team here at the city. Our mission as a regional economic development organization isn't just for generating leads and doing marketing and trying to bring jobs in, which is a huge part of what we do, but we are also doing that every day under the guise of how we are diversifying the economic base in the region and how are we making people's lives better. If we're not doing that, then I don't know what the purpose of economic development is, truthfully, and I've been doing this type of work for a couple of decades. Um, next, please. All right, so in terms of supporting the region, again, as a regional organization, we do serve Sandoval, Valencia, and uh, Torrance, uh, and Bernalillo counties. And we have a 45-member board of directors. What's exciting and has been a new thing in the past year is we stood up several advisory councils to better engage the business community, but also a public sector advisory council to better engage local elected officials and leaders, and also an economic developers advisory council. So all of the economic developers working in the region on behalf of their communities can engage with us and work with us to advance and attract business. Next, please. And why do we do this, right? Why do we keep talking regional? Because economies are regional. So if you look at some of this data, um, in the city of Albuquerque, Q3 
people, uh, people working in the city of Albuquerque, only about 61% of them actually live in the city of Albuquerque. This is census data. And you can run these uh, data points a multitude of ways. So we have to be thinking about the rising tide raising all ships. And obviously, the city of Albuquerque is in a unique position to influence not only the greater region, but the entire state. Next, please. So just a reminder, we work at area with the wonderful state uh, economic development department with the New Mexico partnership. And again, with all of our local community partners next. And what are we up against, right? Why, why does area even exist? And what are we focused on, especially in the next couple of years throughout the course of our strategic plan? Well, um, I think you all are very aware and people in the community are aware there's tremendous competition. There are other markets and communities that want the jobs we're trying to attract. There's other communities that want the jobs that we have here in our companies. Um, there is not enough supply of adequate talent in any community in the country right now. Um, many of you as business leaders know this personally. Um, and also challenges with infrastructure and business environment is a, is a real and perceived issue. I can tell you we've got a lot of manufacturing folks looking at us and less than a 1% vacancy rate in the market. So it's hard to locate companies if we don't have places for them. When we did our strategic plan in 2021, uh, one of the things that we noticed when we started looking at our relative competitive position was where we were in comparison to other markets nationally, roughly our size. And we found that, unfortunately, we were in the bottom quartile of job growth rate from 2015 to 2020. That doesn't make me happy. Um, but you know what? We have an upward trajectory, and we've had a lot of great announcements recently, and a lot of wonderful things are underway to spur that forward. But there's significant work to be done. Um, and obviously, also, our GDP grew at a rate lower than that of the US average. And, uh, and we're here to change that. Next, please. So the big top goal, so you just heard about the data that we found when we did our strategic plan. The goal is to reverse that. So over the next five years, area's mission and, and primary goal, along with what my board of directors is leaning on me to get done and all of our community members want us to execute is getting us into that top quartile. So when we look at other markets and communities, uh, roughly our same population size across the country, I want us to be beating them in job growth and in also the right kind of job growth, positive jobs that create career pathways and opportunities for residents of the community and families, not just any job. Um, and that, according to all of our sophisticated and fancy and fun data, means about 8,000 net new direct jobs in target industries over that time period. Um, very aggressive, and I also do believe doable if we all pull together. Next, please. And, uh, and this is important. Um, I always like to compare us to the other markets and communities that we are competing against, because if we just look at ourselves, we can sit back today and say, great, you know, in February of 2020, we had a certain number of jobs. We're almost back there. We're almost back to where we were right before COVID. But these other markets that you see on these data slides have recovered and then grown significantly in net new job growth. So I always like to keep that in the back of my mind. You know, if you're on a football team, you're always thinking about who you're playing against next week, not, uh, not who's at the bottom of the bracket. Next, please. So a high level, if anyone in the community is interested in seeing this, uh, we have information on our website and our full strategic plan is always available for anyone who wants to look at it. But it is made up of three big buckets, um, driving forward our strategic plan nationally um, to promote and market the community and bring in new leads. Another big bucket is all about talent. We could talk about that for hours. And then really breaking down barriers to competitiveness regionally. A lot of it I've already addressed in our new structure. Next, please. So the big thing that we've done over the last year at AREA, formerly AED, we created and adopted this strategic plan. Um, and, uh, and I'd like to add that the city staff was very involved in, in that information and briefed. Um, we renamed our organization. We completely rewrote our bylaws, um, became a public-private partnership for the first time ever. Our bylaws now allow for local elected leaders to serve on our board of directors. Never in our 60-year history was that something that, was, that we were set up to do. Um, we have fundraised. We have raised uh, nearly half a million dollars in private sector net new investment because we talked to them and said it was critical. Um, and we are now officially a 501c3 uh, public charity as opposed to a business association, which means a very different way of operating and thinking about our mission. Next, please. All right. Um, I'm going to go really quick through the rest of these. Um, so this talks a little bit about the public private engagement model of area. Again, everything on the right past the directors is new. Next, please. I do like to remind everyone and those in the community that we also are a big clearinghouse of data and research. 
So your staff can come to us, you all can come to us, members of the community can come to us, and we can do everything from pretty sophisticated economic impact analyses, showing companies how we are competitive in environment, and if we're not, figuring out how we get there, um, onto hosting public jobs boards and other resources for business utilization. And if you can go next and then skip over that. Perfect. In terms of a facilitator, why do you even need a re regional economic development partner and player? You've got great staff, you've got state partners. Well, we offer um, a conduit between all of that. We are a confidential partner. We offer all of the data and research I talked about. We are location agnostic in the region, and what I mean by that is if, it's, if we're bringing in companies and jobs and opportunity, we want it in the greater Albuquerque metro, and we want it in the right place for that individual community and for that business. So that is how we look at locating companies. Um, and then we also are able to leverage our relationships with our board and other leaders and provide what's really important is post-transaction support. Next, please. Um, that means helping companies when they're here, not just cutting a ribbon and then sending them on their way and hoping they survive. Um, in terms of the pipeline that we're driving forward in this market, I just think some of this data is pretty cool and I'm sure you're curious about it. Right now, we have about 65 active opportunities in our pipeline. This is a couple days old. I've already gotten a few new inquiries this week. I will tell you all, we've had two physical site visits and tours from national clients already in January this year. And I have a team member out in Phoenix meeting with all kinds of developers and other investors uh, today and tomorrow, along with the New Mexico Partnership, trying to drum up more business. Um, what I'm excited about by our lead source activity here is, as you'll see, about a third of the work that we're working on comes through our state partners, and the rest is direct to area that we're facilitating and trying to put companies in the market. Next, please. No surprise right now that about 70 to 80 percent of that market-driven demand is in the manufacturing space, if you're watching what's happening nationally with reshoring and friendshoring and onshoring and all those things and changes in how we do business because of COVID and other drivers. Next, please. And in a perfect world, if we were to land every single one of these companies, which any good salesman knows is not going to happen, um, but that is the potential for 14,000 jobs in this market and region. So that's pretty exciting. Our goal this year is to continue to increase that opportunity number so we can close more new jobs in the market. Next, please. You can skip over that one. Awesome. So just a couple of quick impacts, and then I'll be wrapping up. Um, in 2022, we're really proud to say that we had a material influence on eight project announcements, nearly 2,000 jobs in the region that were announced. And what I love is the 165 million of net new payroll. This is over just the first three years of operation in these announcements if the companies do what they say they were going to do. Next, please. Had a great partnership um, with some of the staff. This is just a highlight of some business retention projects we've worked on in tandem with city staff. Next, please. Um, and we are already hot and heavy again in outbound lead generation in terms of calling on companies that have never heard of our market, our community, and telling them why they need to be here. So we've already held um, about uh, 10 meetings just since early November, and we're gonna go up to 25 on that and then reassess. Next, please. And you can skip over this one that's just illustrative of some of the great reports and data that we have available for you. Um, Live.abq.org is also a new offering we have for businesses and the community. Um, think of this as not a tourism landing site or website, but it is a site for anybody thinking about moving here for a job or a job opportunity um, to take a look at. So things like healthcare and, and other services, housing. Um, so please take a look at that. We're using that as a resource. Next, please. And then finally, what are we going to be doing over the next year? We, it's pretty aggressive. Um, we're going to be working on an advocacy agenda that really thinks about how do we get product and infrastructure in the ground Again, for businesses so that we can actually have a fighting chance of locating them. Um, we're going to be working on talent and workforce analysis. We're going to be doing a lot of research to figure out what people outside of our market think about us, especially business decision makers. So we're not just doing haphazard marketing. We're actually doing it very strategically. Many more things listed here, but I'll skip ahead uh, next to the next slide. If anyone does want to know what we've been doing, we have quarterly reports. These are available to the general public, to all of you. And uh, we will have our annual report for 2022 out for public consumption in a couple more weeks. Next, please. And then uh, last but not least, I do want to thank our board of directors very much uh, for all of the amazing support that allows us to survive and thrive. Next, please. And our investors. And I think the last is our closing slide. So thank you. Um, I know that's a long presentation early in the evening. Uh, again, an honor to be here. And thank you for your ongoing support. Tonight, uh, one of the things I am appealing to you all is to think about 
our request for public sector investment at a per capita rate commensurate with other regional partners so we can continue this and really double down our efforts and provide greater results over time. Thank you. Mr. President. Um, thank you, Mr. President. So thank you for being here, Danielle. I really wanted you to come and present to City Council. I've been so impressed with the work you're doing and how energized you are and how um, so many businesses, I'm echoing, but sorry. Um, first you couldn't hear us and then now it's kind of really loud. But um, but just really impressed with the work that you're doing. As a matter of fact, I think that um, area can be a tremendous resource to us, even looking at putting it on the agenda as an, uh, um, an economic um, development discussion, maybe quarterly, because the people she's meeting with and attracting and bringing to Me New Mexico is helpful. And not only that, she's been like a resource to me in District 3. We had a tour of the Southwest Mesa just recently with NAOP. Um, you know, um, business um, leaders and developers, you know, had this perception of the Southwest area, wanted to um, really take a tour and look around and see what kind of opportunities um, there were. And Danielle helped us um, with all the data and information, information that I didn't even know about the area. So I just thought she's just a tremendous asset for us here on uh, City Council. So thank you for being here, Danielle. I appreciate the presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Council President, Vice President. Thank you. Councilors, next up would normally be any other economic development discussions, uh, but seeing no others, we're going to move to administration Q&A. We have a few councilors with questions this evening, but I know that Chief Medina has another commitment this evening, and so we've got a few councilors with APD questions, and we're going to start there. Councilor Feeblecorn. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Chief Medina, for being here. I um, just have had a lot of calls from constituents, and I share this concern. We kind of are seeing an influx of exotic animals into Albuquerque. In the last couple of months, we've heard of alligators and tigers, and there's rumors that there are additional tigers being shipped here. And I just wanted to see if you could just give us a little information um, about how APD is, is responding to this, because this is, also, this is beyond animal cruelty, which of course it is, and it's against our laws, but it's also a serious public health threat. Um, you know, tigers and alligators are not pets. And so, um, can you just talk a little bit about, I know you've been working with the Game and Fish Department, but can you just talk about how you um, evaluate these threats and what's being done? President Davis, uh, <laughs> Councilor Feeblecorn, uh, it literally is, there's lions, tigers, and bears out there. Uh, I think we've all seen them, and uh, no, it is, we've had an influx of tigers. Uh, we got our first report of a tiger uh, in the fall, and we investigated it extensively. Uh, we do have investigative leads that we believe the tiger has recovered outside of the state of New Mexico at a certain point because it had grown beyond the capacity of the individuals who had it. Uh, we recently had another tiger uh, that we took into custody we were able to turn over, and the zoo did a great job. But uh, I think that one of the things we have to remember is some of these uh, actions are being committed by individuals that are involved in the narcotics world and that are tied to uh, possibly have cartel ties so they're very complicated investigations, but yes, we take every investigation serious. We do look into them. Uh, we, at times, have to work with our federal partners who may or may not have investigations on some of these locations. And we have to remember that uh, we have concerns about the animals themselves, but we also have possible other active investigations. So we will continue to investigate them. We will continue to work with our partners. And, uh, you know, you, you gave me an idea. Maybe we could put something out on Crime Stoppers to get people to report individuals and uh, I'll work on that as as we leave here. Thank you chief. I would really appreciate that as you know, you know, folks are forwarding me um, public social media posts things like that that are very very alarming and I just appreciate that APD is taking this seriously um, for all the reasons um, beyond, you know, beyond just animal welfare but for the public as well. So thank you for that. Mm -hmm. And if I can help with that crime stoppers, please let me know. I would support that 100%. Thank you, Councilor. Thank you, Councilor. Councilors, any other questions for the Chief before he has to go, and then we'll go back to our normal record. Seeing none, thanks for making time for us this evening. It's good to see you. Thank you, Councilor. Mr. President, just as he's walking away, I just want to commend him for all their work um, with these uh, recent shootings with the elected officials, so really appreciate that. That was a that was a scary, a scary endeavor there. As you all know, I mean, I've talked and called 911 in terms of gunshots 
in my neighborhood uh, pretty frequently, but to have somebody shoot directly at your house is another thing, and yeah. people's safety, and, and there's, um, you know, Senator Lopez's daughter is very frightening. So I just want to just commend you and all your officers for all the work on that. President Davis, if, if I could make one statement, we did send out a letter. We are asking for our public officials to give us their home address. And I know that some members of the public may be concerned about this. It's not for preferential treatment. It is for us to develop and see if there's a trend occurring faster and to move more quickly on these cases. So I hope that you all can take that into consideration. Uh, this is my request. We have reasons to do it. I think it will help us to develop trends faster. And I hope that each one of you consider letting us flag that so that we know something is occurring and that we could put the pieces of the puzzle quicker together. And this is all the work of our detectives. Some of them worked 14 days straight. There were at least countless warrants written, and they're the ones that put the hard work in to get the results that we saw. So thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you, ma'am, for bringing that. Uh, Councilors, we're going to go back to our normal order. Uh, Councilor Fiebelkorn, you had a, another question for another department, and then we'll go to Councilor Hassan. Thank you, Mr. President. I do have a question for DMD around Vision Zero. Thanks for being here, Valerie. Um, so I just had two quick questions. Um, we've had a lot of conversations and a lot of constituents reaching out about the amount of money that we've raised for Vision Zero through the speed cameras. Um, can you tell us how much has been raised for yeah. Vision Zero through the allocation that City Council made of all the funds from those speed cameras going to Vision Zero activities? Yes, of course, uh, Mr. President, Vice President, and Council Fiebelkorn. Um, to date, through the Automated Speed Enforcement Program, the portion allocated for Vision Zero traffic safety initiatives is $269,400.10. Thank you. And can you just give us a rundown of how those funds are going to be used? And I assume we'll be getting more, and we're thinking about raising those rates. But what, what will that money be used for? Yeah, that's a great question, uh, Mr. President, Vice President, Council Fiebelkorn. Um, our team currently hired a, a consultant to put together what we're calling a year in review and a prioritization strategy. And what that year in review is kind of looking at some lessons learned. What we, have we learned over the last three years of our Vision Zero program? What's working? What, what can we replicate? Um, and then it's going to prioritize all of those action items within the action plan. And then the second phase of that is prioritizing our high fatal and injury network corridors. That's taking five years of crash data to identify where recurring fatal and injury crashes are happening so that we can prioritize the worst first. So a consultant's putting together that report for us. The first phase of prioritizing the action plan will be complete in April, and prioritizing those high fatal and injury network corridors will be done in May. Um, and then a second part of that effort is actually doing some workshops with our engineers to identify some low cost, high impact safety countermeasures that we can deploy once we have enough funds to deploy them. And then we'll also identify longer term, uh, larger construction projects that will take additional funds to be able to implement. Thank you. So I just want to make sure I understand. So the funds that we've raised so far and the funds that we know are coming in are being used for the consultants and for planning. There are actual no Z Vision Zero projects being implemented at this time. Um, currently, yeah, no Vision Zero projects are being implemented using the automated speed enforcement funds. We haven't spent any of the automated speed enforcement funds allocated for this. We've been using other federal funds um, to be able to do this prioritization efforts. Okay, thank you. Of course. Thank you, Mr. President. Councilor Brisson. Mr. President, uh, is it still, do I remember correctly that with the Vision Zero funding, really honestly, or not, I'm sorry, not the Vision Zero funding, but the actual mobile speed enforcement with any of the citations that are paid, actually a large chunk of the percentage of that goes to the state due to the regulations. Is that, do I remember that correctly? Um, yes, Mr. President, Vice President, and Council, Councilor Bassan, um, that's correct. Um, and that's state statute. Right. Um, uh, we pay our bills, you know, we pay our staff costs, we pay for the global speed enforcement, and then whatever money is left, we pay the state, or we split it in half. Half of it goes to the state, and then that other half, that's what goes to Vision Zero. Okay, Mr. President, I just don't remember ever anticipating us to be able to fund Vision Zero projects, though, with the mobile speed enforcement citations in particular. Um, it wasn't going to be a significant amount of money at that point when we were discussing it. So I just, I'm throwing it out there for future conversation, I guess. Councilor Fiebelkorn had a comment there, and then we're going to go to uh, your questions. 
Thank you, Mr. President. You know, we passed that in the budget process where all the funds that were staying within the city um, would go to Vision Zero. I, my impression was projects. Um, and the, at the time when I asked how much it was going to be, I was told it would be in the millions. Um, so that's a lot of money. I just wanted to make sure we were actually using it for something. If, if, we, have, if we have that much money coming in, we should be implementing projects um, whenever possible. Thanks. Councilor Bassan. Questions for the administration. Mr. President, uh, and I want to preface this by I have had some conversations with administration today, but I still feel it, it relevant to ask these questions. Um, so after having multiple IGR meetings, the Intergovernment, Intergovernmental Relations Committee, uh, it was decided after several conversations that all nine counselors and the mayor should all agree on a project if it was to be considered a citywide prior priority. Um, there's a document that came out to us um, about Saturday night about 8 p.m. from the administration that lists the legislative funding priorities and in there it has the mayor's priorities in the front and then it has city priorities um, in all of the following pages behind it. Uh, I want to ask because in, in District 4 alone there are some projects that were listed on there that one of which I'd never even heard of much less would call it a priority. Um, it, I know the answer now, but I do think that for the public and for those legislators that are going to be seeing this book that went out or this document that went out, I do want it to be clarified. But I'm curious, what is the Alameda Boulevard pedestrian trail that's requesting $18 million and is listed as a District 4 project? Mr. Real, is that for you? Mr. President, um, Mr. Padilla is here uh, who is uh, helping us with this capital outlay process, but... Uh, Councillor Bassan, to answer your, your question directly, we had a conversation earlier, and I, I do appreciate that conversation, but um, just to make sure there was a, a typo on that uh, particular item, that item is actually in District 2, uh, Councillor uh, Benton's district, and it really is the Alameda Trail that goes along the Alameda Drain that connects into the area uh, by I-40 and, and where the... Uh, if you will, where the uh, range cafe is in, in that particular area. And so it got inadvertently uh, logged in uh, as a district project in your district, and it was our, our error, and we'll change that to district two. But most of that project, just for the council's information and the public, is pretty much in the county of Bernalillo, the lion's share of that project. However, around Montano or in that area, it does become part of the city of Albuquerque's project and there's some development that is, that is occurring in the, along those areas, and uh, there was a desire potentially to upgrade those, uh, that trail so that uh, as the development occurs, the trail is in place. But again, it was inadvertently put in your uh, district, and so we apologize for that. Mr. President, Mr. Rail, thank you for that, and I'm glad that it's going to be corrected. I know that it's, it was discussed, I mean, but it's hard when we're calling it a priority, and I've never even heard of it, to see it on a list that the city is advocating for for $18 million, which happens to be the same dollar amount for a priority that I have in the district, that I am actually truly prioritizing. So, uh, you know, there's also two other projects that were left off the list, um, and I, I do understand that they're supposed to be added back into that list. I do want to bring it to, to the council's attention, Mr. President, that there are some projects that were approved in the resolution, fully approved unanimously by this council and signed by the mayor, that are not listed in that document as a citywide priority. So I think that if we're going to call it a citywide priority, all 10 of us should approve it. If one of us doesn't agree, that should become, it should become then an individual priority, not, not something that's collectively lumped together because there's things that I don't agree with and I'm sure there's things that other counselors don't agree with, but that doesn't mean we can't lobby for them. It just means that we should accurately represent them in this document provided by the administration without us knowing about it in advance. So thank you for adding those back in. One more that was in that document that I'm concerned with and curious about is what, what can you please elaborate on the request for $15 million for Desert Hills? Mr. President and um, Councillor Bassam, let me have our Family and Community Services Director come and visit a little bit about this project. And as she's coming down, I will uh, talk to you a little bit about it. This is a, a a facility that was a state facility that was operated by the state, uh, state of New Mexico through a contractor. It is a uh, facility that has um, 
I think several, some of the counselors may have toured it. I'm not quite sure if you got a chance to see it yet. But um, it's, a, it's a facility that has a lot of infrastructure. It's on the west side. It, uh, at first glance and looking at it, uh, it would appear to us that there are opportunities to reutilize some of those uh, buildings and maybe bring them back into uh, some work, if you will, in the area of housing, et cetera. But let me have Ms. Uh, uh, Pierce here talk a little bit about their recommendation to, to the mayor and our uh, interest in at least looking at whether or not the legislature might be looking at a, at a partnership with the city and the county to provide some services. Director. Um, oh. Council President Davis and Councilor Bassan. So we were asked to evaluate and look at Desert Hills, which is a facility out near Sequoia and Coors. Um, the current asking price is something like 15 million. In our evaluation, I mean, it's got a a great campus, it's got a lot of different buildings. Some of those buildings need a little bit more love than others. And we could see that there is some potential use for some of the projects. I know two counselors, and I think Councillor Bassan were in the process of scheduling something with you to go look at that for potential for the youth shelter. We know that if you've got something where an existing facility could work, then that only gets us to meet that gap sooner. We also know that housing is important and also some of things like medical um, sober living or um, housing navigation or even a family source for shelter. But ultimately we think that it would be best to be some a partnership with the state or the, the county. The county, we have a lot of behavioral health gaps and I know all of us know that. And that's really where the county takes the lead. We have a lot of interest in really seeing that continuum built out. So I think that um, is in there as potential, if that could be partnered with the city, with the county or the state to really collectively use it. I don't know that the city alone has the need for all of those buildings, but I think there is some potential there to use an existing facility in our community in a new geographic location. Mr. President, thank you. Director, uh, so when you say, I have a couple follow-up questions to that though. So when you say that you're asking the, for a partnership to see if the state would even consider a partnership, is our method of considering a partnership with the state to ask them for $15 million in advance? Council President Davis, Councilor Bassan, I think that's one way to have that on the docket as a potential for that if, if they're willing to to do that with us. Mr. President, Director, is this the same facility that had, uh, had significant litigation about child abuse and mm -hmm. very, very significantly detrimental abuse and um, many other words that I probably shouldn't say, mm -hmm. uh, that it was shut down for those purposes and there's still even pending litigation about it? Um, Council President Davis and Councilor Bassan, I don't know about pending litigation. I do know that facility was closed down because they did have problems and there were problems in their treatment of the people that they had there. So it, it has some history in our community. Mr. President, uh, Director, I just, the people that were there were youth. Mm -hmm. So I just, I really hesitate to be excited about um, considering putting youth there again, just for the record. Uh, but also I think that I have been trying to get a schedule to go and see that. I wasn't, uh, somehow some, somewhere something got dropped and I wasn't included on the invitation to go and tour it last week. I would be happy to get that scheduled. I know we've been trying and I think we might have just heard back right before tonight, um, finally. So if we can get that on the books, I'd mm -hmm. be grateful um, to see it. Yeah. Well, uh, Mr. President, uh, Mr. Rayal, or was an appraisal sought on this property or are we just gonna be asking for what the um, asking price is from the legislature? Uh, Mr. President and Councilor Bassan, we literally within the last month and a half started exploring the options of looking at that building. Um, so we have asked our real estate department to look and see if we can get an appraisal. Um, the, the asking price when we toured the facility with uh, the broker, uh, they gave us um, this number as potentially the, the, the asking price. Obviously, we won't pay any more than what is required under the, the, um, the state law as it relates to procurement of, of property. 
Uh, we don't believe that it's at that high level. I think that there is probably a lower price. And we also know that if we do get additional funds, we could devote those funds to um, doing some improvements to the site if we choose to do that. But um, it was um, a, a initiative that we thought that was worth at least exploring with the state. Thank you. Mr. President, I just, I guess my question now might be for Mr. Melendrez. If the state were to give funding in the, let's just say the state gives us $15 million of funding for Desert Hills, what happens if the council doesn't approve this acquisition? Does it have to come to council to be acquired and approved? Mr. President, Council Bazan, the city's real property ordinance would require council approval of an acquisition of property. Um, there are a few ways that the council can do that by an appropriation for an acquisition of a specific property or in the absence of that through the approval of an actual contract. The ordinance does specify that the council has discretion on how it treats that approval, um, including um, uh, essentially do nothing with it, approve it, or, or decline to approve it. Thank you, Mr. Melendrez. I just, I, I think that, and I see that there's probably a follow-up um, regarding this topic, and I, I respect that. I just want to say that I think it seems a little premature to be asking our state legislator, legislature as a city priority for $15 million for something that I haven't seen. I don't know if the rest of the council's heard about it. It wasn't ever really discussed as something that was of interest per se. So it seems to me like perhaps maybe the administration is planning on purchasing a property without our knowledge and or at least prioritizing it without our approval. And it's irritating. We'll come back to you, Councillor, for that, but we do have Councillor Grout on this topic. Thank you, Mr. President. I wanted to follow up just a little bit. Um, when I went, I went on that tour with Council Feeblecorn Feeble the other day, and um, the realtor, I think that's who he was, she was, um, she mentioned that um, they would possibly take $10 million. What, what is concerning to me is that we had we were there on Friday, and there was no mention that this was going to be in the citywide in our proposal to the legislature. We had no clue. Um, and so I'm wondering what happened there, too. Mr. President and, and Councilor Grout and, and members of the council, obviously, the mayor um, asked to put this on our legislative agenda as a potential um, partnership with the state. Um, I think it's pretty clear that the councilors uh, have the right to put requests for their districts in the legislative requests, and, and so does the mayor. And so the mayor thought that this would be a good opportunity to at least explore the option. We're not sure that the legislature will approve this. I would also just mention um, that we all have been talking about housing as well as, as an issue in our community. And if we were able to negotiate a procurement um, of some level of this land, it could become a, a housing project of sorts. So I, I would just echo that, uh, that this was a mayor's uh, priority as, as he felt would be good for the community. And one follow-up to that also, um, would you, uh, do you have any plans of possibly making this uh, the new WEC? Um, Mr. President and Councillor Grout, no, that's not been part of the conversation um, at all. Thank you. Councilor Feeblecorn on this topic, then we'll go back to Councilor Bassan. Thank you, Mr. President. So I guess I just want to voice my concern about the document that was distributed to legislators. Um, you know, I've been on IGR for the past year. We've started meeting monthly so that we can work together to develop legislative priorities for the city of Albuquerque. I thought we were all doing that in good faith. Um, and I'm a little confused because the document that went out to legislators, of course, has the mayor's um, priorities, and he is welcome to have those. But there is a large section at the end of this book that says City of Albuquerque priorities. And they are not City of Albuquerque priorities. We have a document that passed this council unanimously that says what the City of Albuquerque's legislative priorities are. And I don't understand why that was not taken into account with this list that clearly at the top of every page says City of Albuquerque priorities for 2023 session. For District 7, there are two projects in here that I have not had any conversations about, did not know that they were capital outlay requests, and heard about them when a legislator called me and asked about it. This is what we were trying to avoid with our monthly IGR meetings. And I think it's really, it shows a bad faith between the administration and the, and the council 
of these monthly meetings that we have been really, really working hard to develop shared priorities for. While it sounds like Councillor Bassan was um, successful in getting one change, although I don't know what good a change is going to do at this point because it's already been distributed to all of the legislators, I would ask that one additional change be made in here. The east and west side animal shelters were clearly labeled as a citywide priority in our joint legislation because those shelters serve the entire city of Albuquerque and all the homeless animals in Albuquerque and it is not listed as such buried in page 21 of this document. Um, it just says that it's in, incorrectly, it says it's in council districts three and seven. I'm the city councilor for district seven and I can tell you that there is actually not an animal shelter in my district. However, it is a priority for me and it should be for the city to get those funds to update that. So while we're going back and changing something that no one will ever see, I would appreciate a change on that at least. Thank you. Councilor Sanchez on this topic. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, my question is basically involving the, the 15 million to acquire Desert Hills. Desert Hills is actually in my district mm -hmm. on Sequoia across from West Mesa Little League. I don't want that building to become an issue when we're dealing with the residents in the area and the Little League that has been there for who knows how many years. I want that thing to not be purchased by the city of Albuquerque and then turned into whatever facility the administration, administration sees fit to deposit in it. I think we could find a better use for that facility. And right now, what we're looking at is a distrust of the administration from city council. And I think that's something that we need to fix um, ASAP. I agree with Councillor Feeblecorn and I agree with Councillor Bassan. This is something that needs to be taken care of and we need to be taken seriously as a city council. And it's quite frankly a slap in our face. Mr. Real, before I get back to Councillor Bassan, Mr. Real, let me just follow and ask. What's, I know the administration knows that the council's frustrated and upset uh, with the process here um, and the presentation and has been in years past with the same process. What's the administration's plan to address this with before legislators make their final appropriations and before all of us and our lobbyists go to the Santa Fe to, to be making our cases for projects? I mean, there's clearly some stuff that is in the law that everybody passed that's not on the list, so that's an issue, like a real issue. Um, so are there other issues that this is not the process that was designed. How is the administration gonna rectify this? Mr. President and, and counselors, um, first and foremost, um, as I said to Councillor uh, Bassan earlier today, that we are happy to go and make the changes that include the two projects that were left out. Um, Mr. Padilla is, is working on a new document. That document will be distributed to legislators with the information that is requested. Um, some of these were, errors that we made on our part, but I would also just tell all the counselors, uh, and Mr. Padilla can give you the details, we sent information to your staff asking for the projects. Um, this is the information, according to what Mr. Padilla received, that was included in the booklet. Now, I get that maybe not all the council staff knew all the details, um, but we did uh, attempt to pro set up a process to get all of these projects included. Uh, there are close to 60 projects in here. Um, as it relates to, to the books, uh, these are the books that we did before, 85 pages. Yeah. The IGR said, let's not do a book. So I don't know that I would characterize this as a pamphlet, but we tried <laughs> to get to a smaller book just because uh, yeah. we heard loud and clear that that there's a better way to get the information to legislators. Um, I am happy to go back and make the changes and get a document back to legislators that is a little more that is more reflective of the issues that and the errors that we made in the process. And and we'd be happy to get that done. Um, Mr. Padilla is here. He can tell you what he's done up to this point as it relates to the issue that Councillor um, that Councillor Feeblecorn raised about the, the shelters, et cetera. Uh, Mr. Padilla, briefly. Yeah, Council President, thank you. I'd, I'd first, I'd like to kind of start with the history of what we're doing with the uh, um, capital outlay process. In 2020, the city received $28 million for city projects. 
and then we see $3.1 million in a nonprofit money that would help the citizens of Albuquerque for a total of $30.9 million. In 2021, that increased to $45 million in city projects, $5.2 million for nonprofits for a total of $50.2 million. Last year, we received $48 million in city projects, $9.6 million for nonprofits for a total of $57.6 million. I'd also like the council to understand that we had done the, the, this particular process the same for about four years. What's happened the last two years is the, legislator, the, the legislative session, they changed the process that they have up there, so we're having to adapt to what they're doing. They change it again this year, so we're having to adapt to what they're doing this year, and we have four new counselors. And so when you have change like that, what we need to do is it, you have to adapt. And so what we're trying to do is adapt to the new counselors that are coming in, the new processes that the state, and that's kind of a learning process, and we're going through that now. And so um, it's good to hear from the counselors, and, and we wouldn't have been able to receive the amount of money that we've gotten over the years if it hadn't been for your advocacy and hadn't been for the help of your council staff. Council staff and the administrative staff have done an amazing job to help us get money to the city of Albuquerque to help the residents of the city of Albuquerque, not only for city facilities, but for nonprofits. And we hope to actually make that even better this year. We had some hiccups, and we're working through it. What we're going to try to what we're going to do is there's there's an additional document there's two documents that we're going to be producing for legislators that are in addition to the book. The first document is to give an update on existing capital projects that have been appropriated. Those that document's going to show which projects have received grant funding. So the first process, whenever we get money from the legislatures, they pass the bill. Then we have to receive the grant. Once we receive the grant, we have to pass and get an NOO from the Department of Finance. That's a notice of obligation. After we receive that, then we can start spending money, and then we get the money reimbursed by the state. So the document that's going to go um, to the state legislators is it's going to show which the, the, all the appropriations that we received, which ones that we received grants from, which ones that we have NOOs, and which ones we've actually started to spend down the money. In addition to that document, we're, what we're going to do is break down um, all of the requests this year, and it's going to break it down by legis legislative district. But we're going to include the citywide projects, like the, the main ones. So we're going to have the animal shelter that's going to be in there. So that's going to be part of every legislator's document. So every legislator is going to receive the animal shelter. Same thing with the pool. Those are citywide. And then it's going to break down the, um, the, the projects that are individually listed in each um, council district. What I also want to propose and, and look at is, in addition to that, is actually separate out in this new document that shows which are the councilors' priorities, so that the legislators know what priorities that the, that the councilors want, and then the additional priorities that the mayor wanted, so that it's, it's understood exactly what's happening, so that the, the legislators know what's coming from the councilors, what is citywide, and then additional recommendations from, I mean, requests from the mayor. So that's what we want to do moving forward. Thank you, Mr. Padilla. I, going forward, and it sounds like we all have a, a better understanding of each other, let's be sure that the IGR committee gets whatever those documents are and gets a chance to review those through staff and not just sort of a blind weekend email. I think that would help tremendously to help folks be sure that we're back on track. Uh, do we have Councillor, I'm sorry, Councillor Pena on this topic, and then we're going to go back to Councillor Passan. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. President. I was actually just going to make a, a few comments um, just related to this. I, I Hearing you now, um, Mr. Padilla, I agree. You know, there's been a lot of changes. There's changes on IGR. I think I've been the one that's been on IGR, um, on IGR the longest. But I think, though, as through this process that we're trying to develop is we're trying not to hinder anybody's ability to ask for requests in their respective council districts. And the mayor, um, in in his um, prerogative to ask for whatever he wants, I think moving forward, and I think um, Councillor Davis was alluding to this, that we really need to put forward the um, uh, citywide priorities. I think that's where, because there's been a lot of effort put into um, developing this and working together. Um, you know, um, we're asking uh, city councilors to come up with three top priorities when we all have like 20 in our, our districts. So we we do that. And, you know, we've ourselves have had legislators say, well, how come this isn't in your top priority for the city of Albuquerque? But we're trying to add so many projects that we're trying to be a little seamless in terms of 
well, yeah, we do want these other 20, but we, you know, these are the top three that we think we can get funded in, in, a, in a timely manner. So I think moving forward on IGR, and thanks for keeping me on IGR, by the way, uh, Council President. Anyway, um, moving forward, I think that we should have maybe just a booklet about City of Albuquerque priorities that was voted on. And then maybe we all put in, because I do, I put in my own list of all my other 20 projects, and then the mayor says, hey, I support the um, citywide priorities, but these are also um, my priorities. And maybe that will help to alleviate some of these hiccups that we're having, because it is, I mean, we, we don't want to um, hurt any opportunity to, to get funding for our districts. And my example would be is that, you know, there's this opportunity with the, with the Unser Museum now. It came after we voted on this legislation. So it's become a priority of mine, but it's not on our citywide priorities. So I want to make sure that we still have the flexibility and ability to do that. So I think maybe just, you know, we'll work on communication. And, and I know you were absent for a little while. I don't think you had been going to IGR either, right? And I think you had some of the most knowledge. But um, I would agree with uh, Councilor Bassam. We have to have better communication. So thank you. Thank you, councilors. Uh, I'm sure we're going to hear more about this and, uh, and be back to visit. So thank you very much. Councilor Bassan, you have another thing. I do, Mr. President. Just one more sentence on this. I think a logical starting point for next year's book, pamphlet, document, whatever we want to call it, is to have the mayor's priorities in the front, which is fine, and then have the council approved and the mayor signed resolution immediately after that as a city agreed upon legislation, not in the back as an afterthought. Mr. President, uh, uh, Councillor Sanchez had said there seems to be some dishonesty, and I'm, I'm kind of, I think I'm getting to my point that I agree at this point, and I'm having a hard time swallowing some of this stuff, so I have more questions, but individuals have been referred and bused to the Gibson Health Hub for emergency winter shelter. Why can't they be bused to the WEC until the good neighbor agreement is completed and we actually follow through on putting in, and, and let me also preface this, because I said that I had to clarify this earlier. I haven't read the Good Neighbor Agreement for the Gibson Health Hub. I kind of am hoping that Councillor Davis handled that since it's in his district. So I haven't dissected all of that. But based off of what you said, Mr. President, at the last council meeting, there needs to be lighting and security at the very least to fulfill our commitment of what was agreed upon in the Good Neighbor Agreement. So until that's done, why are we using the Gibson Health Hub for emergency winter shelter? Why can't people be referred and bused to the WEC? Mr. President and Councilor Bassan, let me have uh, Ms. Pierce um, address the question. Director, welcome back. Oh, I guess, thank you. You do have to speak up a little. Okay. Folks at home are hard, having a hard time hearing that one today. They can hear us, not you. Okay. You have all the information. Okay, Councilor President Davis and Councilor Bassan. So the Good Neighbor Agreement was signed um, three of the six signatories did sign that, um, I want to say November. We've continued to have our meetings with the neighborhood, and that's part of what that agreement is, and continue to have those discussions on improvement. Security, as I mentioned at the last council meeting, is in place 24-7. It's been in there since we um, purchased that facility last year. And lighting is um, being addressed. There is Plan, our plans, there were, there were concerns voiced about pedestrian safety, and there is a hawk signal that is being planned for, as well as other lighting. But lighting itself as a specific item was not in that good neighbor agreement. There are um, ongoing discussions about as we go, we've fulfilled the, the quarter mile radius on encampments, very specific things in that good neighbor agreement. So we'll continue to have the meetings. We have another one next week. And I think just to answer the question, Councillor Bassan, so we, we're concerned, as everybody is, about people in encampments on the street while, while it's cold. So while we have room at the WEC, not everybody will go to the WEC. So people from encampments are being taken via bus directly for those beds to keep them from perishing in the cold. Um, this coming weekend, we anticipate, as we see the dip in the temperature, we will be opening our warming stations that we've been doing with volunteers and city staff, 
and this will be a place where people can go to the WEC if they choose. Some people will choose to go back on the street or some people could be housed out at um, the gateway. Mr. President, Director, so would you say that the Good Neighbor Agreement, we've, we've fulfilled the commitment that was in, that was agreed upon in order to start housing anybody, whether it's emergency or not, into the Gibson Health Hub? So President Davis and Councilor Bassan, yes. Part of what that good neighbor agreement says though, we wanna have ongoing discussions about broad neighborhood concerns. When we purchased that facility and have had lots of neighborhood meetings, there were concerns about the city buying that. What would happen with that facility? What about economic development? What about crime? What about traffic? What, I mean, a lot of concerns. So that neighborhood council, we, we see that as a vehicle to continue to discuss issues, bring in other departments, whether that be APD and DMD. So it's, an, it's not a one and done, it's an ongoing conversation with those neighborhoods. Mr. President, Director, I think that's great. I think it should be an ongoing, and I'm glad that that's in there, and I'm glad that you're doing it. Um, I know that you also just mentioned not everyone will go to the WEC. So one of my uh, next questions is the latest IG and AG's reports, the, the IG has published a report regarding um, a complaint that was filed and an investigation that was opened mm -hmm. up regarding the WEC. So I'm wondering if bed bugs, broken showers, and unsafe living conditions might be significant reasons that the majority of Albuquerque's unhoused don't want to go to the WEC. Now let me also say, I recognize that the showers are in areas that are not being used. The kitchen is in an area that's not being used. The bed bugs are being fumigated. Like, I know that we're doing some of this, but like, could this be why things are getting mm. contributed, that people don't want to go there? Why aren't we taking care of that? Let's prioritize that instead of buying Desert Hills or spending money on priorities that are not a priority. Let's fix up what we have to where at least it's habitable living conditions. So, uh, you know, is that, is that why you think, do you think that that might be part of why people would prefer to live in tents in the elements than go to the WEC? Council President Davis and Councilor Bassan, I think there are a lot of reasons people choose not to go to the WEC. But let me first start with, the, the facility is a 30-year-old facility. And so when we opened that full-time in 2019, which it had only been open, open very part-time, we have done major repairs to the facility. We've done the whole HVAC system. We have redone bathrooms. We have redone a pod. We have added the medical clinic out there, and we've added case management suite. So we've done a lot of improvements and changes. In the OIG report, of which all those pieces have been addressed, there were pieces on the fire hydrant, there were pieces about um, bed bugs, that there is routine bed bug control, and then I think there was another piece. We have an ongoing maintenance um, system with work orders to address an old building that, and our list is always long on the work orders. I think the, the reason that people don't go there um, are many. Everything from and it's, a, it's an old jail. Everything from it's, it's a 30 minute ride out there and my friends are back in town and, and I need to get back into town. Um, some people don't feel safe. Um, one story I recently heard when I hear the voices I know when I'm out of my tent, I know those are my voices. When I'm in a, in a big room or a dorm, and we like to call them dorms, and sometimes I slip and call it a pod because pod is old jail language, and I, we're trying to not do that. But when I'm in a dorm and I'm let next to a lot of other people and there's talking and voices, I can't distinguish what are the voices in my head that I know how to manage those and what are the voices in the bed next to me. So the range of reasons people don't go there are, are long. We want to and do our best to keep an old facility the best it can be. It's, um, we have plans for the future. I know counselors, when we've been out there before, we've talked about why don't we have washing machines. Um, I think, Councilor Benton, that was a conversation that we've had over the years. Um, we had some limitations with the water authority and how that drains into the pond. Um, we have recent news with the Water Authority that we've had conversations that a new water line is going in there so we could actually get those washing machines and not tax that water system. We um, have money to do a warming kitchen out there and that process is in our future to do that and continue to just really address the ongoing work orders. 
I, I do want to say, I, I, I'm not here to say I think it's a perfect facility because it's not, but I do think we work very hard to be respectable for the people that will go there. Our count this week was about 430 people. That some of those people that we call our guests, they are choosing that to be their home. Their friends are there. We are providing food. We are having the medical clinic and services. So I always think we can do better. Um, and I think we're doing um, the best we can. Mr. President, uh, Director, I'm glad to hear that. I'm glad to hear things are getting improved. Um, I know that there, you know, it definitely, you said it yourself, it's a 30 year old building. So I'm wondering like at what point is an old building an old building and when do we call it quits? So is there, is there a plan to eventually shut down? Does the, does the administration eventually plan on shutting mm -hmm. down the WEC and destroying it or selling it or whatever? Yeah. Councillor, oh, oh. I think Mr. Real was okay. Uh, Mr. President and, and Councillor, um, we don't have any plans to shut the facility down. Uh, given the, the number of uh, folks in our community that need these services, um, we have made the determination that we have to include the WEC, at least for the time being, as part of the continuum of services, if you will, um, just simply because the need is so great. I do think that um, I was, as you were talking and we were talking about the facility, I was looking at Councillor Jones, who is uh, by trade someone who worked in the uh, facility management world when she was in the real estate world. At some point, I think we do have to make the decision that how much good money do we spend after bad. The, bu the building is so old. Um, there were pods that were, built, that were built back when I was 12 and I was a CAO before. And, and these, uh, uh, that's just a joke for you all. Um, these, th these uh, it was an interim jail and, um, and it was revived to become a, a shelter, if you will. And so at some point, we're gonna have to make a decision, the council and the administration about, do we want to build a new facility? Uh, and where will that be located? Um, but in the meantime, um, we will continue to do the repairs that we want, that we need to get done to make sure that we're having a, a safe and clean environment for folks who are using that facility and, uh, and keep an evaluation and, and have the dialogue with you all about uh, what we might do down the road. But to answer your question directly, no, there are no plans to shut the facility down. Mr. President, Mr. Rael, thank you. I think that, you know, for what it's worth, I think we should be, you know, definitely doing what we can to maintain the WEC and, and update it and make it better until we realize that it's too much good money after bad. So I would say that I guess the obvious is that eventually when Gibson is up and running and working well and uh, hopefully a well-oiled machine, I would hope that we would maybe stop using the WEC. I think that that seems to be the logical next steps, but while we continue to fulfill the promises to the neighborhoods around and to everyone else that's not utilizing that facility either. So I think that speaking of fulfilling promises, I'm gonna switch gears a little bit, unless you want to pause and keep going. Councilor Brasson, could I ask sure. a follow up on Gibson really quickly while mm -hmm. we're on this topic before while the director's here? Um, and thank you for, for continuing to help us elevate and, and monitor the progress of that. Director, I just wanna say like, I, I hear what you're saying. I know that there's progress being made at Gibson and I'm proud to see that, that services are being uh, acquired and added there every day. I love some of the nonprofits that are being added to the hub that making service. But I do kind of object to this, to, not kind of, I do object to the language of saying, we have a good neighbor agreement in place because it's only signed by three of six organizations. So that's, we also have as many people who don't, didn't do it or who don't feel like it met those needs as we did that do. And not all of the folks that have signed um, directly represent a neighborhood around. Like the coalition sort of agreed in principle and it's one of the signers, but they don't represent a neighborhood. They represent an organization of neighborhoods that doesn't include a majority of those impacted. So um, I, I, I object to, to saying we have an agreement. I say we have folk, I, I prefer to say we have some folks who are, who, uh, who are more optimistic than others. And I think there's work to be done and I appreciate working on that but I do think that's important. I did wanna ask, since we're opening emergency housing there, how many beds were not filled at the WEC last week versus how many were opened at Gibson? Like, do we have beds available at WEC if someone wanted to go from Civic Plaza right now? Could they go there? Thanks. Is that off? Oh, there I am. There, they have to flip it back, go ahead. Okay. 
um, your question last week, I would imagine this off the top of my head. We've been running because it's been cold outside in the 400s. I mean, the our, I'm sorry, Carol was asking, what's our capacity at the okay. WEC? And, yeah, the I'm sorry. No, no, thank you. The capacity at the WEC is 600. We, that means we're using pods that don't have bathrooms immediately accessible, that haven't been fully renovated, um, but, but can we use those? Yes. And, and as um, Mr. Rael said, I mean, that facility we always know is probably always going to be in the city coffers when you have a big emergency. So we would use the, those back dorms, sorry, um, if needed. So it's, six, it's 600. The, the emergency beds at Gibson, those are individuals that wouldn't be going out to the WEC. If, if given a choice. They're, um, they are going from an encampment, they're not going over to the bus pickup sites, but through our outreach, our outreach folks, that they're the ones, that's the mechanism to get into those winter emergency beds, are using them there. And thank you, I appreciate it. And we, we've had this conversation and we'll continue to have it. I just, I, I just don't, I don't think Gibson's ready. I want us to do the right thing there. But again, like if our, if our barrier, and Councilor Lewis has mentioned this before, if we have vacant beds at the WEC, or we need to upgrade facilities in order to maximize the use of the facility we're already using, requiring people to go to the bus stop to get it, to this, the pickup centers has a capacity of its own. And so if we're doing outreach, that should be towards the system that works, in my opinion, and not into a new facility that's not ready or with all of the services. It, it, that, that's been my impression from the beginning. I think there's ways we could do it better. Uh, and Councilor Lewis is gonna follow, and then we'll come back. Mr. President, Director, so those that are, that are at the, uh, the WEC, are they, you mentioned that not all the ones that would go to the Gibson Center would be, um, would go to the, the West Side Shelter. Would, would the, those that are at the West Side Shelter, are they candidates? I mean, would they, would they go to the Gibson Center? Is that yeah. the intention? Council President Davis, Councilor Lewis, the intention it was not to relocate people from the west side. I, I, yeah, I realize that, oh, but I'm we sorry. said that uh, we said that the people that would would go to the, the Gibson Center would not necessarily go to the shelter. I'm, I'm wondering if that would be the other way around if they chose to. Maybe that's not our intention to do that, but if they chose to, would it be suitable for them? Oh. Councilor President Davis, Councilor Lewis, if I understand your question, would the WEC be a suitable place for somebody given if they wanted to go? Absolutely for an unhoused person. I, if I'm understanding your question, I'm sorry. I mean, and I think, I think Councilor Davis also asked about just the capacity of the Gibson Center. Yeah. What, what is the current projected capacity of the Gibson Center? Councilor uh, President Davis, Councilor Lewis, as I stated, the capacity for the WEC is 600. The capacity for the Gibson Center. Oh, I'm okay. We didn't ask for you. The count, the capacity for the winter beds. Well, to start with, I mean, what the, it's what okay. it's projected to be used for the, now, currently, what is that? But yeah, start with the winter beds, and then okay. what we're the uh, Council President Davis, Councilor Lewis, the capacity for the the Gibson winter emergency beds, fifty about fifty fifty five, and our plans when the gateway, which is distinct, right. is we will open that for 50 women, um, an anticipated, you know, a 90-day stay. So we'll see several hundred over the course of a year. Yeah. And I think it is, it is important to talk about the, the unused capacity on the West Side, Side Shelter because I think at one point it sounds like it's being used more right now. I'm assuming maybe because of the winter months, but you're saying there's about 200 um, empty or, or available unused beds. Whereas over the summer, it seems like the last time we talked about this, uh, it was about close to 400 that were unused during that time. Council President Davis, Councilor Lewis, yes, it does fluctuate by the weather. So yes, roughly 430 are out there right now, capacity of 600. I will add that when I mentioned the, the dorms that aren't there with beds, we bring in emergency cots when we need to, when, if there was a need um, to expand. And the, and the shelter, say 30 years old, I mean, that's old. I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't, I, I guess I wouldn't say it's that old, but, uh, but I'd also, I mean, I'm assuming the Satrisco building, I mean, the Desert Hills is probably more than 30 years old, isn't it, <laughs> as well? 
Council President Davis, Councilor Lewis, I don't know the date that building was built. I'm assuming it is. I mean, that's an older neighborhood and uh, it's a building that I imagine we'd probably be faced with some of the same uh, challenges uh, in, in that way as well. So, all right, thank you, Mr. President. Thank you. And let me make a quick announcement and we'll go back to Councilor Bassan. We know that some folks following along at home have been having some problems if you're on Zoom in particular with hearing our uh, public speakers. So we're going to continue this process. You can hear them on Zoom or on GovTV16 pretty well, I understand. We're going to do some microphone resets when the council takes a break after uh, the normal course of business and Q&A, &A and, uh, and then we'll come back and do public comment after that break. Uh, but for those following at home, if you're having a hard time, you can always find us on the city council's on the city's YouTube page and on Gov16, and I understand you can hear us better there. So my apologies, Councilor Bassan. Mr. President, thank you. So I just, uh, just to kind of finish up with that one, I guess to me it's, if we're going to call it an emergency and the WEC is there for emergencies and we have room for COTS for emergencies, then I just urge the administration to be honest and fulfill their promise to the community near the Gateway Center, the Gibson Health Hub, the emergency winter bed shelter, whatever we're calling it today. Like, I think it's important that we fulfill the promise to the community. And if we're going to start saying it's for emergencies, then let's use the emergency shelter that already exists without doing a loophole and finding, because that's what it looks like at this point, in my opinion. And so I, I think that it's important that we fulfill our promises if we make them. So, Mr. President. Uh, Mr. Real, then back to Councilor Bassan on another topic. Mr. Real. Mr. President and, and Councilors and, and Councilor Bassan, you know, I, I get the, the, uh, the perspective I also get the perspective that there are lots of people sleeping in the street at night. And we also see those in our neighborhoods across the city. I think it's really, um, would not be in good, in good uh, if you will, faith for the city to have a facility that's capable and able to handle at least a small group of folks to spend a cold night in a warm place. Uh, especially when we know that some folks are just not going to go to the WEC and maybe there is an opportunity for those folks to go to Gibson and we are saving one or two lives or hopefully more than that a night. So I just want to make sure that we're sort of keeping that in, in the forefront in that why wouldn't we use our facility if it's available within the structure that we've, we've, we've placed? We've got security. It's, we only are going to open it for the next three months. And look, I get the fact that we've committed to go through a process, but look, we all know, and, 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 to, and with all difference to Council President Davis, we all know that these neighborhood agreements are challenging to get 100% support from all the neighborhood folks because everyone has a perspective on this issue. Um, we will continue to do that in good faith, but I just want you all to know that the reason we opened this facility is because we have it and because it's available to be used in cold nights when people need a place to sleep. And I think it would be worse for me to sit here and talk to you about, we have folks that are dying in the street and someone says to me, well, why didn't you open up Gibson? It's a big facility. Why don't you just have them spend the night in the, in the lobby, if you will? So I do think that uh, for all the conversation that you all at least would know that this was our intent, was just to try and use the facilities that we have uh, that are available to us so that someone doesn't die in the streets tonight. So I just want to make sure that you all appreciate that. Thank you, Mr. Rayal. Councilor Bassan. Mr. President, Mr. Rayal, I couldn't agree with you more. I absolutely think that we should make sure that people are safe and warm. But I also think that in good faith, we should fulfill our promises made to the rest of the community as well. It shouldn't be a one or the other. And so that's what I'm simply saying, is that if a promise is made by the city, and then we solidify it through legislation, I think that it should be in good faith and legally an obligation that we fulfill. And I agree with that. So let's make sure that we're fulfilling our promises so that we can keep everyone safe and honor everyone's um, you know, protection and safety in that regard. So moving on, Mr. President, HopeWorks is one of Albuquerque's largest providers of services to the homeless. And it seems like they suddenly had their contract canceled. Um, and I mean, again, from what I read and from what I'm learning about, um, it seems like it was, con it was uh, coincidentally canceled after a publicly, they were, the city was publicly accused of fraud soon after the co-CEOs penned an op-ed criticizing the Gateway Center. 
which is now called the Gibson Health Hub. So since HopeWorks has now been exonerated by the AG's office uh, and that they didn't actually do anything wrong, what is the administration doing to repair this relationship? Mr. Rio. Mr. President and Councillor Bassan, uh, I'm going to ask uh, Councillor, uh, excuse me, Director Pierce to yet again uh, explain where things are. But I, I do want to make sure that you all can appreciate this. This is the OIG's investigation, and there are, it's multifaceted. Um, the opinion that the AG rendered related to this audit is one dimensional. It, it does deal with one particular phase of, of the audit that, um, but there are other issues with the audit that really create a challenge for us administratively to go forward with, um, with, the, with the actions that we, or to basically to um, go back on the actions that we've taken relates to the facility and to the, and to the program and the organization. I know that I talked to Councillor Benton about this. Uh, look, we are working with HopeWorks on many endeavors, and we will continue to hopefully get a better relationship and a stronger relationship. But I do want uh, Director Pierce just to maybe qualify a little bit of what the concern is as it relates to this particular audit, because um, the, the audit was, that was done by the OIG versus what the AG reviewed are, are not quite uh, the same. Council President Davis, Councillor Bassan, um, HopeWorks is a valued partner. And we've worked with them a long time and we continue to work with them today and they have multiple contracts with Family and Community Services. The OIG report came out about this time a year ago. And through that process, there were many, many conversations. In that OIG report, we recently, there were several documents through that, those conversations. One, HopeWorks um, had a forensic audit done by an outside agency, and they, they produced that. I think that was given to the OIG. And then this recent um, from the Attorney General's office, I did receive the copy of that. I got the copy from HopeWorks. That too is with the OIG. So I can't speak on behalf of the OIG when that report was done. The piece that um, there was debt owed to the city that because of some billing practices, and that was about 155,000. So we've continued to talk about that, and HopeWorks has, makes a payment of $10,000 per month. That is very distinct and separate from the Medicaid fraud. So we continue to work with HopeWorks. They have contracts with us to this day. They are a vital partner. Um, I think it was probably lost on my time frame. I think it was, well, it was many months ago when the CEO and I met, and because we'd had many conversations about that OIG. We, we got the OIG report, then we had to look at that information. But um, our, my staff went over to HopeWorks to meet to kind of, again, to rekindle what we've had as a longstanding relationship, and that continues to this day. But I think if there's questions on the OIG and that AG report and the Medicaid fraud, I think that's questions for the OIG. Mr. President, I, and that's, I respect that. I just feel like if HopeWorks has been paying the city back, which is my understanding, that HopeWorks has been paying the city back for something that's been now exonerated by the AG, are we giving them their money back? Um, Councillor Davis and Councillor Bassan, there are two distinct pieces. So when I received that AG report on the Medicaid fraud, I too said, that's great news. That's great do news that there's no Medicaid fraud. Family and Community Services didn't say there's Medicaid fraud. An OIG report did the, the finding a year ago. There was a separate piece in that OIG report that talked about 155,000 that doesn't have to do with Medicaid double billing. It has to do with what the city was billed against a federal grant. And so from the documentation from the OIG, they said that HopeWorks owed the city 155,000. So it is distinct from what that AG um, report was talking about on the Medicaid fraud. Thank you for the clarification. Mr. President, I, Director, I'm wondering, you know, if, if the administration is claiming, and we all have agreed that homelessness and fighting it and helping it and minimizing it and all of that 
is a priority of the city. We have all agreed to that. Um, that's a no-brainer. But if we've all agreed and the administration is claiming that homelessness is a priority, I just it sounds to me like more can be done to repair some of the relationship with Hope Works if they're one of the biggest and, and one of the strongest advocates and experts, mind you, also experts in helping with homelessness, not just um, people, right? They're experts mm -hmm. in doing this, and it, it just seems like we should do everything we can in the city to repair that relationship because those experts are a valuable resource and I would hate to lose them because of any potential for defamation of character or any potential for having diversity of thought. I just, you know, are we to expect to be in trouble for, am I going to be in trouble for diversity of thought tonight? Because I can tell you I already heard that I am, right? But because I'm asking questions that are having a diverse opinion, I think that it should not be something that we as a council should come to expect that we are going to be retaliated against or have some kind of repercussions. And I, I do think that that seems like um, a potential for setting up the future of what may happen. So I, I'll be interested to see what happens to me. Not that I'm scared or worried about it because I'm an equal elected official as are all of you with the mayor. Councilor Brisson on that topic, Councilor Benton. Yeah, I, I have had <clears throat> some of the same conversations that apparently uh, Councilor Bassan has had, and I've also been in, in meetings with the administration and with HopeWorks, and um, I can vouch for the fact that I think there's, there's good faith has been shown, and, and I, this has been considered by everyone concerned, that unfortunate, but, but it's water under the bridge, and we do need to move forward. Um, but uh, that, that doesn't mean all your questions have been fully answered. I'm not saying that, Councilor Bassan, but, but I do, uh, I value uh, HopeWorks. HopeWorks has a great relationship with the neighborhood. We do have one neighborhood that, that had to agree, and they did do a good neighbor agreement with the, with the housing that was built there, supportive housing. But um, uh, it's unfortunate, no doubt about it. Um, uh, I think the, the AG has cleared them on one front, and then there's still discussions about this other matter, but, uh, but uh, I'm hopeful and I'm confident that we can move forward together. Thank you, Councilor Benton. Councilor Besson, uh, yes, Councilor Besson, you have another item? Mr. President, thank you, Councilor Benton, too, for that, because that helps me, too. I definitely would, at this point, like to hear that opinion, and I value it a lot, a lot more as of today. Yeah, and I, I had some of the exact same questions and concerns and alarm about it myself. Thank you. Mr. President, I believe this is going to be my last subject of questions. <laughs> Thank you for, um, for allowing me to do so. So um, Albuquerque taxpayer dollars were spent to purchase an artificial turf playing field for the Gladiator Stadium in Rio Rancho. Um, it was said on the, the news story that it was going to benefit all council districts in New Albuquerque. So these funds were, they purchased the turf I was told today that we were leasing the turf to Rio Rancho, but I didn't get a copy of the lease, so I'm hoping that that will resolve a lot of the situation here. Um, however, when those funds were, um, when, when the, I guess, lobbied at that point, I don't know about the NOO and all the things and the promise, and the, but so the city spent money from Parks and Recreation to buy the turf for the gladiators. It's my understanding that the city then invoiced, which apparently they do regularly when we're doing um, any kind of legislative funding, they invoiced the state for a repayment of those funds, and the state denied that request because it was going against the anti-donation clause. So I'm wondering now, and, and this just to also preface it, has nothing to do with the legislators that contributed to this. I don't, that's not one of, they can contribute to whatever they want, it's state funding. What this has to do with is the city of Albuquerque Parks and Recreation Department bought turf. The turf is now in a facility in Rio Rancho. If we're leasing it to them, I'd love to see the lease. I'd love to know where that money is going and how much it is every month. I would love to know, you know what fund that's going into and what we're doing with the money. But I also currently, based off of the information I have, would like to know where did that money come from? Because I don't remember, and I could be wrong, you can, you can tell me I'm wrong, if the council approved purchasing turf for Rio Rancho and giving it to them instead of using it here in Albuquerque. Mr. Rao. <clears throat> Mr. President and Councilor Bassan, um, I believe our Parks and Rec Director 
is here and, and can give you a little more detail as and as he's walking up uh, first and foremost the council approves all of the capital outlay appropriations during the budget process so all of the capital uh, outlay uh, if you will that we get from the previous if you will legislative session is in that bill so that's how the council approves and appropriates the money for the projects just uh, for any of the projects that we do typically um, it's part of the budget but mr. Uh, Simon has uh, at least give you some details on how this uh, transaction occurred <coughs> thank Correct. you uh, mr. president uh, counselor yeah the city uh, purchased and owns this indoor turf field um, it is temporarily positioned in Rio Rancho um, because that is where uh, the team is playing that uh, is utilizing the turf field. The field is owned by the city. It is portable and will come back to the city, um, I think, eventually. And it is the objective of the team primarily using the field to do that, to come back to the city and and the, the turf field will, of course, is completely um, subject to the city's use as well. Um, it's being stored and maintained there on behalf of the city, so we have no cost for that, which is excellent. And the agreement for using the field is, is um, it's an agreement, counts are not a lease, so uh, we have a, a partnership and in-kind uh, trade for a variety of services that benefit the city uh, and also benefit um, the citizens through supporting this uh, sports and recreation activity, which citizens from around the region attend and I, and I believe enjoy. So uh, the field you know, remains our property and uh, it's, te it's temporarily there uh, because originally because of some COVID restrictions that prevented this uh, organization from playing in Albuquerque and uh, we look forward to its return to the city. Mr. President. Councilor Brisson and then several others. Thank you. So, Mr. President and Director, so it's it's being utilized through an agreement with a private team for city-used and owned product. Mr. President, Counselor, it's a three-way agreement between the city, the team, and the uh, Rio Rancho Event Center. Yes, ma'am. Okay. And thank you, Mr. President. Uh, you know, and I, I'm getting more clear every year about mm -hmm. our budget process, but I don't recall ever saying that we should buy or knowing about any turf that was going to be temporarily placed in Rio Rancho, and I'm pretty sure that people in Albuquerque would love to use that. I, I think it's great that they probably would love to go cheer on the gladiators too. That's fabulous. But what about Albuquerque? Because there are things that should be funded here, in my opinion, before we start giving things to, or I'm sorry, agreeing to loan things to Rio Rancho. Um, you know, I know that in the budget process, we did approve funding multiple times for you know, and I know it's not there yet, but for an indoor sports facility in Councillor Sanchez's district. <clears throat> so I know that we're trying to get there, but again, I feel like the cart is getting put in front of the horse, and now Rio Rancho gets it. So I think that that's, that's really also irritating, that, you know, I think our taxpayers don't really want, I, I mean, maybe they do, I would love to get emails, so please, taxpayers, residents, people in Albuquerque, let me know if you're excited about having turf in Rio Rancho. Um, because I think we should use it here, personally. I think that Albuquerque and our dollars, I didn't see an agreement. I asked for it. I'm sure that we did approve it. I would love to be reminded about it. Um, but I think that, you know, if the state even said they have a problem with it due to anti-donation, it is concerning that we're doing it. Thank you. Mr. Council President, Council, I'm, I'm, I'm pleased that we've had uh, uh, hundreds of Albuquerque youth be able to use the turf field under this agreement and... We have a, a full schedule of access and events that will continue to allow Albuquerque youth sports to use the field. So that's one of the ways we are producing benefit to, Mr. to the city residents. Mr. Councilor President. Councilor to respond and then other councilors. Thank you, Director. That's the first good thing I've heard about this turf. That's awesome. Will, thank you. I, I mean, make more good things. So thank you. I think that that's fabulous. My next follow-up question to that is, is the city helping those same youth and the ones that don't have the appropriate resources to get to Rio Rancho? Are we busing them? Are we helping them with some of that? Are we taking them on our transit system? Because I know we've had those issues too. But I'm just wondering, like, are we accommodating and helping those underprivileged and underserved youth, or is it just for those families that can drive to Rio Rancho that have the youth that are able to use that field? 
Well, Mr. President, uh, Councillor, I am aware of uh, some partnerships that fall directly into that uh, very good um, objective that you've raised. And one of those partnerships is with the Boys and Girls Club of Central New Mexico. And um, they, they do serve a lot of kids um, kind of who uh, benefit from those programs and uh, could use a little extra assistance and help. And uh, that's one group that is accessing the field and the partnership there. I'd like to, to grow that as well. Mr. President, it's just to say that I look forward to, to that okay. continuing, but I look forward to it continuing in Albuquerque. Councilor Bassand and Councilor, I mean, I'm sorry, Councilor Grout, then Councilor Lewis, then Councilor, I mean, Councilor Sanchez, then Lewis. I have a real quick question, Mr. President. Um, why did we buy $250,000 worth of turf anyway? Uh, uh, Mr. Why? President, uh, Councilor Grout, uh, the, the total uh, cost for the field is uh, $236,000. Okay. Uh, this was uh, a project that the city agreed to be the fiscal agent for, for the state legislature. So that frequently happens, as you, as you know, with uh, state legislative projects and requests. And uh, when asked, the city is usually uh, there to be a willing partner with state legislators if they have a project in mind. That's how this project uh, originated. So did we, excuse me, did we, um, did we put any money into this? $250,000 also? The city of Albuquerque, not just the legislators? Uh, Mr. President and Councilor, the, the total cost, of, of the total cost, about uh, $74,000 was contributed by the city. Was what? By the city, contributed by the city. So we contributed $74,000. And then the remaining... 130, 130 came from the state. Legislators, is that what you're saying? That is correct. Okay. 160. That's it. It's still interesting that we paid for some of it and it's up in Rio Rancho. I am glad to see that the children are using it, but we have some really good questions about getting those kids there. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Vice President. Uh, Councilor Sanchez. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, I just think we need to tighten this down a little bit. Um, you said it's going to be back eventually. Accountability is what we're looking for. And if you're talking eventually, then eventually we need to know what date that it'll be back to Albuquerque. Um, I saw the pictures, and the pictures show that it has the team name on it. So with that, it almost looks like it's purchased for the team. So when will that be back? Is the team name on it? And why? What are they going to pay the city for using it? Um, we should get a list of, of Albuquerque youth who are using the field. Um, how often is the field being utilized by Albuquerque youth? Those are things that we need to have documented and shown to, to us and proven that this field is being used in the way that you're saying it's being used. Accountability is what we're looking for. Transparency is what we're looking for. And if you can't tell us where that, where that field is being, or how it's being stored, how it's being utilized, how many times it's being utilized by the youth that it's being utilized from Albuquerque, how we're getting, all that information needs to be put on paper and given to the council. And the citizens of Albuquerque should be able to access that document to see exactly how that's being spent. And I think every counselor in here is going to agree with me on that. Another thing, that, that field probably should be in Albuquerque if, it's, if we spent it. I could only imagine the conversation that'd be going on right now in Rio Rancho had Rio Rancho pur purchased a field for Albuquerque. So that needs to be addressed as well. I just, I just think it's a very, very, very poor judgment on whoever, on, on Mayor Keller who made that. Obviously, it was had to be the Keller administration that made that choice to to do this outside of City Council. Mr. President, Mr. Real, then Councilor Lewis, and, and Councilor uh, Sanchez will certainly get you some information as you requested. But I think this this issue goes back to the same issue we had earlier with beds that are available. Look, this is an indoor turf. 
we don't have an indoor facility in the city of Albuquerque. So we could have purchased this because the legislature provided the funding, the lion's share of the funding. We could have purchased it, rolled it up, it's a piece of carpet, and put it somewhere in a building and left it there for three or four years until we decided to build a building. It was an opportunity to, shall we say, make lemonade out of these lemons. We have a, a, a turf that's perfectly usable. We have a facility that would accommodate the use of the turf and it would provide some uh, services for youth of Albuquerque. No question, not everyone in Albuquerque gets to use it, but at least we put it to use. Otherwise, the turf would sit in a building somewhere and, and would not be used because we don't have a building that's big enough for the type of, uh, of event that, or for the type of use that this turf is designed to be. So I just want to say to you, look, it is not a, uh, by our intent to at all to have it in Rio Rancho. We would have preferred to have it here. But it was our intent that since we have it, let's put it to use and get some benefit for, uh, for the community and for the region. So I, I appreciate your, your, your concerns, Council Sanchez. We'll get you that information as best we know it from the, from the folks at, uh, at, the, at the Star Center. And, um, and so, you know, if we want to get the turf, we'll be happy to go pick it up and roll it up and put it in a warehouse so that it's in Albuquerque and nobody gets to use it because we don't have a place to put it. Uh, I mean, that's just, I'm not trying to be uh, difficult about that, but that's just the reality of it. Um, and, um, and yes, it does have the logos on it. That was uh, part of the conversation about the gladiators are a, a, a community team just like the Isotopes and just like um, United where we try and help to create other activities for our community. And so if we don't want the logos on those, we can take the logos off. I mean, it's, it's just that simple. So, but I just want you all to know that that was, again, trying to use the, the turf while we have it. It was a state appropriation. We didn't ask for the appropriation. It came to us and we were trying to make the best use of it. Why would we actually agree to it if we don't have a facility? Mr. President, um, Councilor Council Sanchez, we don't, on some of these appropriations, they don't even ask us if we want to agree to it. They, we, they show up, and we are always trying to be helpful in the, in the West best way we can, but, um, but I, I don't mean to interrupt, and I apologize for that, but I just want you to know this wasn't a, a request that we went out and put in our, in our book that said we want a turf for the United, for the, for the gladiators. It was an appropriation that was sent to the city of Albuquerque. One last thing is, how often is that field set up? You know, if that field is if that field set up right now because there was a concert last week, I, obviously not. So it's going to be picked up, put back, picked up, or is it out there the whole time? Yeah, Mr. President, Councilor Sanchez, the the field is. Uh, used and stored there at the event center and it's uh, assembled and disassembled or you know um, set up and taken down okay. um, at the center uh, I'd be happy to try to give you a little bit more clarity of how often it's being used it is being used frequently uh, depending on the events at the center what free use days uh, Albuquerque youth are, 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 are accessing and, and other events at the center because so it would have to be, so. we'd have to actually have the Albuquerque youth utilizing it when it's set up right around yeah. game time. Otherwise, yeah. it gets picked up and put away for a concert yeah. or a basketball game or another, another uh, event that's going to be taking place there that's not actually that, um, used, used, utilizing the field. So Yeah, we, um, Mr. Uh, Council I think we President need to know that information Council, as we, well. I, we did some great things, for example, over the winter holidays when many kids were off school. The field was down and, and, and set up in the event center and you know, took good advantage of, of youth being able to use it. It's not always just around a, a game time, but uh, when the field's set up, it is subject to the overall schedule at the event center. But all that work of putting it up and down is not on the back of the city. And uh, I think uh, great idea, Councillor. I, I think maybe we get... Uh, Rio Rancho to get us a field, and uh, we'll try to balance the balance it out. Mr. President, <clears throat> so uh, no nobody's saying that we want to roll this up, put it in a put it in a closet. Um, 
nobody's saying we want to take the name of Albuquerque off of it, but I, I you know, let's be honest. Uh, we weren't just we weren't just given this field and didn't want it. You know, uh, the mayor clearly wanted this field. Worked with the legislators on it. There's absolutely no way that we would have this field if the mayor didn't initiate that and want to have this field and work with the legislators and the owners of the gladiators uh, to do that. There's no way this director, you know, would have acted on your own to do that. I mean, this came from the administration and you, you we acquired this field. And my understanding is the way Capital Outway worked too is that, uh, that we paid for this field and then we've not been completely reimbursed for this field. So we have paid for this field and now, because we have the field in last year's budget, uh, the department has some money, needs some money to be able to maintain it and utilize it. And so this came out of the budget uh, from, from Parks and Rec. I mean, with, without this coming to council for council to approve. So if councils haven't heard of this, it's because they haven't voted on it in any way. You know, this is the department trying to manage this uh, now that they have it. But I've seen the agreement. And, uh, and the agreement does require the, the gladiators to hold a certain amount of youth events for kids in the city of Albuquerque. And because of COVID, uh, you know, the field is now there because that's where they're playing. Um, by the way, it would be a, a state-owned facility if it was, uh, um, you know, back at Tingley. But at least it's surrounded by, you know, the city limits there. It would make sense more kids from Albuquerque would be using it. Uh, so se several things, and some of it's been mentioned. One would be... Uh, when do the gladiators plan on moving back either to Tingley um, or to the convention center or another you know, facility like that? Because again, we said it's temporary. I mean, they're in Rio Rancho for a certain amount of time. And then number two, I think it's reasonable this, this council would ask for uh, a specific number of events over the last year, 2022. Uh, Director, if you can give us a specific number of events that the gladiators held that specifically served kids in the city of Albuquerque, whether it be the Boys and Girls Club, but I think, I, think, I think this council needs to know um, how the kids in the city of Albuquerque were served because of that field. Mr. President, Councilor, happy to do that. I believe we've had 12 events already in the preceding year. Another seven are scheduled. And, the, you know, uh, the reality is um, the presence of the field has not jeopardized any park projects whatsoever. Um, the funds uh, are receivable to the state right now. And I'm actually confident that we will see some reimbursement. Mr. President, uh, Director, I would respectfully disagree with the fact that there are city projects that have not happened. That I mean, I've sent emails asking for benches and trash cans and I'm told to use my set aside because Parks and Rec doesn't have the funding. I don't either. So when I see something like this, it is concerning to me when there's residents in Albuquerque that say that they need assistance at the city parks that they're walking in and utilizing every day. And yet I'm told more than once that, well, if we, counselor, if you can identify funding, then you can go ahead, we can make sure to make that happen. And so I think that it would be great to make sure that the funds stay in Albuquerque that belong to Albuquerque is, is my point there. Mr. President, um, just really, it's the job of the city council to provide accountability and oversight for our city government, right? Um, we provide the checks and balances. The legislative branch, the executive branch, we are equal. There is no authoritarian dictator. There's no singular person in charge. There's 10 people that run the city of Albuquerque. And I definitely feel like that hasn't been treated fairly of late. And I've remained quiet on a lot of these questions lately over the last several months because I tried to play nice. I tried to really lay low and see, you know, give the benefit of the doubt. That seems to not be working. So now I'm at the point where I'm angry and I'm disturbed. And this is where we're at tonight. Um, so I think that, you know, the mayor doesn't get to independ operate independently. We have to be involved. Um, I, I'm very clear now on my role and position um, in his perspective. But I think that the best thing I can say is that the best predictor of future behavior is past behavior, and I really hope to see things change when it comes to accountability and oversight, because we do count when it comes to the way this city operates. Thank you, Councilor Brisson. Councilors, any other questions for the administration? <clears throat> All right, seeing none, and we're just past our seven o'clock sort of check-in moment, I think what we're gonna try to do here is uh, let our staff do some reset on the microphones for our, our audiences at home. 
And so we're going to take a brief dinner recess. We'll come back and pick up with the journal communications, introductions, and public comment uh, when we get back. And we'll stand adjourned. Testing. This is just a test. Oh, great. Okay. Testing. This is just a test. Testing one, two, three for Zoom. Testing one, two, three on Zoom. Uh, testing, test, test. Oh, ADA, can you go on the uh, inputs to make sure ADA is not bumped up, I guess? Test, test, test. Anything there? And test, test from the regular podium. Regular podium, test, test on Zoom. Really? Just bad?
All right, all right. Listen, what is, what is uh, Testing on Zoom. Test one, two, three. Testing, testing, one, two, three. Testing, one, two, three.
testing. Testing from the podium on Zoom. Testing on Zoom from the podium. Testing, testing. One, two, three. T testing, one, two, three. Testing, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. Testing. Testing, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. Testing, one, two, three. Testing, one, two, three, from the podium. Test, testing, one, two, three, from the podium.
Okay, I have a quick minute. I didn't even know you called me. I just listened to her voice message now. So, it sounds like what she asked me was how I deal with the negative thinking. And <coughs> if I reassign a case number, if you did the people. Sounds great in the room, though, right? Sounds a lot better in the room. All right, folks, we're going to try to get this back on track again when you're ready. Somebody call upstairs. Let's see how this works.
Okay, folks, I think we're back now. So for all the folks that emailed us and tweeted at us and called us and said they couldn't hear us on Zoom, uh, please keep us updated as we work through some of this this evening. But uh, I think our, our tech team has figured this out, at least for today. Uh, the folks, welcome back. I apologize because of our mic issues. Uh, we neglected to let Councilor Sanchez finish his comments during uh, Q or his question uh, during Q&A. So we're going to let Councilor Sanchez finish that, and then we'll move straight into the order of business on the agenda. Councilor Sanchez. Thank you, Mr. President. The comment that I wanted to make towards the administration, towards Mayor Keller, is the fact that we have an opportunity to actually build a facility, the Ken Sanchez Indoor Sports Complex, on the west side. We have money ready to go in reference to that, and we need to start working on, on building that complex, and we can actually put this turf right smack in the middle of it. It'd be a, a field house, so to speak. And while we're spending money in a different city, we should be spending money on our youth uh, in this city so that we can make sure that they have a facility here to enjoy. And uh, I think we should work on, on getting that facility as soon as possible so that we can actually bring that turf back and put it in that facility. Mr. Mr. President, Mr. President and Councilor Sanchez, we couldn't agree with you more. We have done a design of that facility. It's somewhere in the neighborhood of 36 to $40 million. And we don't nearly have enough money to do that. But look, um, I would love to have that facility in place. The mayor supports that as well. And we would love to have the turf there. So we'll work with you and see if we can find the funds to, to make that a reality. So. Thank you. And I know every counselor here would like that too, to keep the monies here in Albuquerque. Thank you. Council Lewis, briefly. Just quick, kind of, and, uh, Mr. President, um, there there is another, uh, maybe more cost-effective solution to that too. That I think uh, talk with the other councilors about, and you know, um, Council Sanchez mentioned a West Side, um, you know, facility, and so, um, and and uh, um, we we've discussed that as well. So I would love to. I just I guess I wanted to mention that as a reminder. Uh, that I'd like to have some of those discussions again and, and talk with the other councillors, Councillor Pena and Councillor Sanchez, uh, along with the administration on that as well. If we, we can we can schedule that here pretty soon. I'd love to do that. Mr. President and Councillor Lewis, um, we'd be happy to have that conversation. Got it. In many ways, I think what um, Councillor uh, Sanchez talked about as a use of the field would be a very different use than the, the project you and I have talked about before, but we'll have those conversations and see if we can come to some agreement. That, that is true. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Councilor's moving on. Uh, Councilor Grout, we're moving on to the journal. Madam Vice President. Thank you, Mr. President. I move approval of the January 4th journal. There's a motion and a second from Councilor Bassan. All those in favor, say yes. Raise your hand. Thank you. Any opposed? And Councilor Pena will be excused until she returns. Next up, communications and introductions. Councilors, are there any changes to the letter of introduction? Let me get us started. I move that the rules be suspended for the purpose of placing EC222 on tonight's agenda for action. 222 is approval of a contract with Tyler Technologies for professional tech services to implement uh, enterprise leasing and permitting software. I move that the rules be suspended. Second from Councilor Bassan. Any discussion? Seeing none. All those in favor say yes. That matter carries unanimously for Councilors present. Councilors Benton Jones. Pena and Feeblecorn, somebody for RA1. Uh, Mr. President, I move the rules be suspended for the uh, purpose of uh, placing RA1 on tonight's agenda for action. RA1 is amending Article 1, Section 10 of the City Council Rules of Procedure relating to attendance. Second. I think you got enough votes in seconds alone. Councilors, all those in favor say yes. Raise your hand. That matter carries unanimously. Next up, Councilor Lewis, OC25. Mr. President, I move the rules be suspended for the purpose of introducing OC25, referring it to the Land Use Planning and Zoning Committee. OC25 is appointment of Mr. Giovanni Coppola, Coppola to the Environmental Planning Commission. Motion in several seconds. We'll take uh, Councilor Bassan because I can hear her louder. All those in favor say yes. yes. Councilor Pena is back with us. That matter carries unanimously. Councillor Grout, Madam Vice President. 
Mr. President, I move approval of the letter of introduction. And we have a second from Councilor Brisson. Councilors, all those in favor, say yes and raise your hand. That matter carries unanimously. Thank you. Reports of committees. We don't have any committee reports this evening. Uh, those all will pick up next month. Deferrals and withdrawals. Councilors, any deferrals or withdrawals at this time? Going once, going twice, seeing none. We are on to consent. Thank you for staff for sticking with us through that break. Uh, we wanted to usually try to get you out of here earlier. I know some of you are just here for something on there, but uh, we had to get the tech fixed. Uh, Madam Vice President. I move approval of the consent agenda. We have a motion and a second. All those in favor say yes, raise your hand. Yes. That matter carries unanimously. Thank you, ma'am. Next up, general public comments. Thank you folks for hanging around with us this evening. Mr. Cornelius is gonna do some microphone switcheroo here while I read the rules. Members of public comment can provide live public comment to the council in person or virtually if they've signed up for public comment per the instructions published on the agenda and on our website on Friday. <clears throat> here are the ground rules. Each participant will have two, up to two minutes to present. Comments must be addressed to the councilors only but through the council vice president or council president and any disruptive comment will result in removal from the meeting. There is a two minute time limit and a bell will ring to, when, to indicate your time limit is up. Mr. Cornelius, it is your show, sir. Thank you, Mr. President. Our first speaker tonight is Joshua Uriate, followed by Tad Numitsky. Thank you, folks. If your name is called and you're called up next, come on down and sit in the front row so we can get you ready to go. Tad Nowitzki, followed by Kenny Elkomos. Come on, Tad. Yes, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, which is... We can see it now. Thank you. Okay, thank you. My name is Ted Nemeiski. Let me begin uh, this meeting this way, uh, my comments. Uh, if, we, if we don't have uh, oversight and accountability, we have corruption in every level of our government, including court system. Right here, I'm showing my case, changing date from August 3rd to, to July 3rd, impossible to file default judgment on the 3rd of July, day before a 4th July, and also false on Sunday, Ju July 3rd, last year. So now, two lawyers involved it. Menekuchi brother, Mike and Carver, and Judge Jaramillo, and court administration, changing date backwards, so they cannot lose that case. Okay, they got caught, because impossible for me was file on the 3rd of July. Number two, uh, on Sunday, that's where we at with this case. They got caught and they going to jury trial. All three parties, I have right here evidence to prove it. So that is one thing. Well, shooting. I don't have any sympathy for these county commissioners. I don't feel any bad because they, they how rude they Mr. were. Mr. Kaminsky, and, thank you for your comments. Oh, yeah. Kenny Elkimus, followed by Maureen Skorin on Zoom. Council President Davis, VP Grout, I'm speaking up this evening for countless victims of gun violence, including me and my family, whose Northeast Heights home in District 8 was shot up 26 times on November 23rd, the family in Southwest Albuquerque, 
whose home was shot up 52 times on December 4th, and families like that of 13-year-old Karan Blake in Washington, D.C., who was murdered by a so-called good guy with a gun. On this topic of gun violence, my overarching position uh, is that Albuquerque City Council members should adopt the position that United State that the United States should have federal gun laws at least as strict as what they have in the United Kingdom, and that they lobby New Mexico's three U.S. representatives and two U.S. senators on this position. As for municipal and state action on guns, any such proposals ought to be informed by the aforementioned belief. Otherwise, we're just going, going to be chasing our tails on this issue, and innocent people and law enforcement will continue to be harmed or killed due to needless rates of legal and illegal gun ownership. I am aware that the majority of elected officials at any level of government of any party do not support such ideas. I am not naive. 15 years ago, at the age of 23, I was a newly minted federal infrastructure lobbyist in Washington, D.C., sitting across the table from members of Congress and cabinet secretaries and working on national polls with the likes of notorious Republican pollster Frank Luntz. Suffice it to say, I know how politics and public opinion work. I also know how cause and effect works, and the primary cause of census gun, gun violence is indisputably the overwhelming rate and ease of gun ownership in this country, the devastating effect. In closing, I want to let you know that I will be following up with each and every one of your offices in the coming weeks at first to provide a brief fact sheet on UK gun laws and ultimate, ultimately to demand that aggressive action be taken. Thank you for your time. Maureen Skoran, followed by Barbara Taylor. I would like to ask you to oppose the amendment to the police oversight ordinance. In 2022, there were 18 shootings by police resulting in 10 deaths. So this is not the time to weaken police oversight. Thank you. Barbara Taylor followed by Peter Kalitsis. Garrett. Ms. Taylor's texting us saying that they're having audio issues again. So can we, let's revisit with her in a minute and see if they can catch up. Peter Kalitsis, followed by Saeed Mati Hosang. We do have Barbara. There's Ms. Taylor. Please proceed, Ms. Taylor. Um, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Um, thank you, Mr. President, members of the council. Um, as you know, I'm a former director of Parks and Rec and a current member of the Open Space Advisory Board. Um, at a previous meeting, I listed what will be lost if the Open Space Police Unit is dissolved. I want to add to those remarks. I don't know if you realize that an injured person in open space who calls for help can only be located to the nearest cell tower. The advantage of a trained open space officer is that they know the terrain and have EMT skills. In the proposed system, the responding officer will be unfamiliar with open space and likely rescue will be delayed. I would also like to point out that the state mountain search and rescue team is composed of volunteers. It takes time for them to assemble. Open space officers can be on the spot to assess the situation and render aid or rescue immediately if necessary. And finally, I just want to say how disappointing it is that the formal commitment made by a previous administration, and I'm not naive, to maintain the mission and purpose of the open space police unit is being abrogated. Ken Burns said that the national park system was the country's best idea. Open space is our best idea. We need to protect, preserve, and expand it, not degrade it. Thank you for listening. Peter Kalitsis, followed by Saeed Mati Hosseani.
Saeed Mati Hosani, followed by Rosemary Blanchard. Awesome. Good evening, everyone. Uh, thank you for having me here. Uh, my name is Saeed Mahdi Hosseini, and I'm with Together for Brothers. I would like to speak regarding the Zero Pairs and how it impacts the people who are most impacted. And also wanted to share uh, my experience on uh, Zero Pair as well and the people that I met around the uh, city and also on the bus stops as well and how they were uh, telling me that like it affects them in many ways. It helps them to get around the town without worrying to pay or like to have like a bus pass, especially the people who are uh, experiencing homelessness. They, um, they're they like very happy with the zero fares. And also during the zero fares, I have seen and heard from other uh, refugee families who have uh, benefited from the free fares and that includes getting access to resources their families needed. And I felt like it would be a good opportunity for everyone in the city to have free transportation. And uh, based on the data that was collected, it shows that the ridership has increased as well. And uh, if, we, if we do end up using like uh, IDs or like any type of uh, passes, I don't think so it will help the community in general and it will uh, decrease the ridership as well. And um, I would like uh, for uh, everyone to uh, just, just decide on like what is beneficial for the community and also for those people who are impacted as well. Thank you. Rosemary Blanchard followed by Anita Cordova. Good evening, <clears throat> um, President Davis, members of the council. I'm Rosemary Blanchard. I reside in Council District 6, and I'm speaking with concern for three items on your agenda and the overall city approach to services for our most marginalized and resource poor members of the community. This would be your 047 or 062 and R70. I'm here today just to reinforce my earlier testimony, asking you not to place burdens on free bus service, which will disproportionately negatively affect people who are unhoused, people without access to technology, people who experience cognitive and other disabilities that affect their ability to follow directions required to obtain and maintain the free fare pass. I also ask you to be cautious in using related ordinances, such as the proposed transit security ordinance that criminalize being in or around transit stops. I realize you're seeking to prevent people from hanging out or lurking at tra traffic transit stops, but the people I'm most concerned about may need to sort out what they need to do to use a zero fare rate, what the schedule is, et cetera. People cannot occupy transit stops except when a bus is coming. However, often the buses are delayed. How are we going to determine who is legitimately at a transit stop trying to find out when the next bus is coming or others who have no good reason to be there? Will we go by appearance? How is that to happen without triggering stereotypes being applied to people who look poor or unkempt or easily stereotyped by race, gender, etc.? We need safe public transit, but we do not need public transit that creates a spurious aura of safety by exclusions plagued by stereotypes. We do not need to increase the ways in which we criminalize people with no place to go or with the difficulty negotiating systems, either electronically or in person. Thank you. Thank you, Rosemary, and say hello to your cat again for us. Remind me her name. She's a popular figure here at the City Council. <laughs> oh, this is, this is Brandy. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Rosemary. We need to add her to the if, comment if list. She's the time, enough time to translate what Brandy had to add. Thank. You. We'll we'll work on it next time. She's uh, she's with you every time, and we uh, we we always look for her. So thank you. <laughs> thank you. Brandy likes that. Up next is Anita Cordova, followed by Peter Kalitsis.
Good evening, counselors and president. I'm uh, the board president of Albuquerque Affordable Housing Coalition, a longtime employee of Albuquerque Healthcare for the Homeless and a transit rider. I'm here this evening to tell you that any proposal to dismantle zero fares is highly disappointing. Getting a pass, having to find the pass, temporary or permanent, pay the dollar, $2, showing an ID or proof of Medicare if not age related, et cetera, is a barrier. And the freedom to not have to worry about money, transfers, et cetera, is bigger than folks who don't ride the bus realize. Despite the equity analysis showing no disparate impacts, it's significant burdens on extremely low income people, many of whom are also black, indigenous, people of color, remains deeply concerning. Extremely low income, uh, people pay between 50 and 80% of their income on housing. That was pre-pandemic. Housing has now increased by 38% at some rates year over year, one of the highest in the country, with no commensurate income increase in income. This increased rents creates disparate housing outcomes and increases in homelessness. Transportation is in and of itself an affordable housing issue. With the city's aim to improve affordable housing, zero fares is a step in the right directions. I urge you to retain Retain zero fares and vote against any passes or payment measures that will only burden already overly burdened people. A pass-based transit system is riddled with barriers. Passes can be lost, stolen, thrown away, or misplaced. Keeping people off the buses, away from work, away from school, out of health centers, away from housing appointments, etc., are unnecessary and can result in cruel and disparate impacts. These missed appointments and social mobility opportunities are not free. They impact lives and cost our systems money and unused capacity as the staff and or resources, resource their services to serve people, teach people, or employ people. That capacity is lost. Thank you. Peter Kalitsis. Council President Davis and City Councilors. We would like to thank the counselors for seeing the plight of the gateway neighbors and giving voice to the battle we've been fighting essentially on our own. Thank you, Councilor Blasson, for standing up for neighborhood associations. And thank you, President Davis, for recognizing that only two out of the five neighborhood associations have signed the good neighborhood agreement. And of those signatures, of those two signatures, they are from people who occupy space in the gateway or have received funding from the city in the past. Despite what you hear from them, in no way has the city acted in good faith in negotiations, and we appreciate your recognizing this. Additionally, we su uh, please support funding for the West Side Shelter beyond the current 500,000 towards repair to provide for future operations and upgrades to this older facility. In December 2020, uh, family and Community Services wrote me saying they anticipate the West Side Emergency Housing Shelter shall remain open for at least another two years. Um, two years is, a, has, is approached now. In February 2020, in the Albuquerque Journal article, officials stated the new facility would replace the city's existing emergency shelter in an old jail on the far west side. The later the city had changed it. Um, we hope you would upgrade the West Side facility rather than close it and transfer 450 persons from Gateway, resulting in over six or 700 um, that uh, would be done. Thank you all for your support. And we really appreciate, counselors, that you've actually brought this up for discussion. It is, it's wonderful to have someone to actually be who cares. Thank you. Mr. President, that concludes general public comment. Thank you, Mr. Cornelius. Next up, we have announcements. Uh, there will be a Finance and Government Operations Committee on Monday, January 23rd at 5 p.m. via Zoom video conference. Um, Councilor Fiebelkorn. Mr. President, there will be an Intergovernmental Relations uh, Legislative Relations Committee meeting on Friday, January 20th at 3 p.m. via Zoom video conference. Next up, we have public hearings. Uh, in the matter of AC 2221, the, uh, the appellant, Mr. Giuseppe Moscardelli, um, has withdrawn uh, his appeal, and so I'll make a motion to accept the withdrawal in this matter. So as second from, I'll take from Council Feeblecorn. Any other comments, counselors? All those in favor say yes, raise your hand. 
that matter carries unanimously. Thank you. Uh, next up, approvals. EC199, this is the mayor's recommendation of award to Employers Pro Advantage Recruiting Source International and David Gomez, partner for executive search services. I believe this was held over a lot from our last meeting uh, for some follow-up, so I'll move approval for discussion. I have a second from Councilor Fiebelkorn. Councilor Sanchez, I think you were on Thank you, Mr. President. Yes, I am, and uh, I also have uh, Mr. Manicucci um, walking in the, in the gate to help out as well. Um, this thing was, this item was pulled um, for the sole purpose of making sure that uh, we have a focus on white collar executives and also hoping that we had some wording in here um, that has to do with blue collar and boots on the ground. I'm glad to hear that we have that focus on white collar because those are specialty um, items that um, Councillor Feeblecorn um, brought up. Uh, she actually shouted out a list, and uh, so I'm glad that those those are being looked at. But uh, one of the things that we still need to make sure that we have on here is to make sure that we are filling the positions that contact each and every uh, one of the citizens of Albuquerque, and that's the boots on the ground. And uh, Mr. Menacucci, can you uh, go ahead and uh, give us a little more information on on that as well, Mr. Um, Manicucci. And, and my, Mr. President, uh, Councillor Sanchez, my apologies. We were in another side discussion, but you're asking for reference to the memo that was written. That's correct, sir. Okay. Basically, <clears throat> the agreement that the meeting Councillor met with the Director of Human Resources and his Assistant Director, and what came out of the meeting was that they did uh, commit um, to and explain their effort to use these contracts to make a you know a, to, to further the e efforts to get professional white collar employees on board. Um, and so what they did is they issued a memo and they agreed to issue a memo <clears throat> to basically state it, to show how they could state a record. Um, and I think that's what the, it's on the second page of the memo. If, I'll, if I can get to it real quickly here. Um, on that one, my apologies. But it's the second sentence of the memo. And it is... Um, and it says, um, on the second paragraph on page two of the memo, um, and it says, as a method of tracking the support that the staffing agencies provide, we are, prepared to pro we are prepared to provide reporting of performance by staffing agencies on positions identified for fill, current status, and time to fill, if applicable, quarterly. So basically what this would do is would be allowed to provide the council kind of a quarterly report on how these agencies and how the, 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 depart the administration is uh, doing or how they're proceeding with filling these white collar vacancy positions um, to kind of give a tracking system on it. Thank you, and it's my understanding that when budget comes around, we're going to get in the weeds, make sure that we know what's going on in reference to um, making sure that we have those boots on the ground um, positions filled, correct? Correct, Mr. Uh, Chairman, I think, or Mr. Uh, me, Mr. President, uh, Councillor Sanchez, one of the things you can do is, like you had mentioned also, how we could impact blue collar. If I'm, my understanding is that the correct. Discussion? That's correct. So what I said is that this, 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 these methods of tracking help you helps the council to kind of understand what's going on. Even though this is white collar, uh, with the uh, arrival of the budget, we can through the budget question process ask, just kind of say how though, over the past year does the the blue collar hiring pr process proceed get that reporting in, and then with that, that could help guide the council if they would like to work with the administration to fund some additional efforts um, within house to, to continue to make a more robust recruitment of blue collar employees. Thank you, Mr. Minacucci. With that, I feel satisfied that uh, we met the obligation. Thank you, Councilor Sanchez. Councilors, other questions on this matter, EC199. Seeing none, the motion on the floor is for approval. Um, is there anything else from the administration? You had a memo. Great. All those in favor say yes. Raise your hand. Yes. Yes. And that matter carries unanimously. Next up is EC 208. Councilor Benton. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, EC 208 is the mayor's appointment of Mr. Adelmo E. Archuleta to the Albuquerque Development Commission. I move approval. There's a second for Councilor Jones. And Mr. Ar uh, Mr. Archuleta. Uh, is a uh, design professional uh, in, in engineering and 
think it brings a lot of, uh, of uh, good uh, balance to the uh, commission in the sense of it is about development, and uh, we do need to have that kind of representation uh, in some form on the uh, on the commission. So um, happy to uh, to uh, support it and urge your support. Thank you, Councillor. Councillors, other questions on that matter? Motion. I'm sorry, Councillor. Uh, line of Vice President. Mr. President, I just have one question. Does he live in Albuquerque? Um, my understanding is that he does not, but, but that he's not precluded from uh, okay. from serving because of that. Uh, Mr. Rowell, do you know? Mr. Rowell has to get his microphone back. We're going to share today. Somewhere in our capital outlay request, we should ask for microphones. <laughs> I thought that there was a, some kind of, a, Mr. Chair, Mr. President, but that was some kind of a message that maybe I wore out my welcome earlier. <laughs> Take it how you will, sir. Okay. Uh, Mr. President and, and Councilor Grout, um, he does live outside the city limits, um, across um, uh, the river, if you will, but he's in an area that's really surrounded by the city. If you'll, it's it's one of those little small enclaves of unincorporated area. Um, we selected him and asked uh, for your support simply because of what Councilor uh, Benton just described. He's very familiar with the development of the community. He's president of Moles and Corbin, which was a major uh, company here in town and, and, and does still, it still exists and does good work. So okay. appreciate your support. And it's okay that he doesn't live in the city and was appointed? Yes. Okay. Thank you. Councilors, other questions? Councilor Pena. Mr. President, um, I didn't realize that, and I just wanted to ask a question of our staff, because as you know, the Southwest Mesa is very checkerboard. One side of the street can be city, one side can be county, and I have asked the question about appointing somebody, as difficult it is in communities, marginalized communities, to get people to even serve on boards. Hearing this is just... Um, the information I've received is that I cannot do that. Mr. President, Councilor Pena, um, the city, as you know, has dozens of boards and commissions, and um, some of them have different requirements for membership. Um, some of them require a position that, that um, either works or lives in the city. Some of them require a person that lives in a district. Um, those types of requirements exist within the different ordinances that create those specific boards. The EPC is a good example. They have to live in the district. Um, however, the general rule for boards and commissions that don't have a specific requirement listed in their creating ordinance is that they shall normally live in the city. And so that qualifier normally gives latitude um, in the event that somebody brings um, exceedingly good qualifications to override uh, the general requirement that they should live in the city. Well, Mr. President, so that would apply to other boards and commissions then? Mr. President, Councilor Pena, it, it would. Again, not, not all of them. We have to go through um, a board-by-board -board review of what the specific ordinance that created that board says with respect to membership. Um, some of the ordinances do have that criteria, some of them do not. And so for the ones that do not, that's where this general provision in the Boards and Commissions Ordinance comes into play. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Um, thank you, Mr. Melendez. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you. Councilors, other questions on that matter? Councilor Bassan. Mr. President, I, <clears throat> I'm not okay with the city putting turf in Rio Rancho and paying for it. I also am not okay with us having commissioners on our Boards and Commissions that are from outside of Albuquerque. In, in theory of that. Like, I mean, here we are in Albuquerque. And we're saying Albuquerque is great. And yet we're putting stuff in other cities and then we're getting commissioners from other areas. Like, and maybe he is great. But based off of tonight's conversations, I, I, I'm sorry, but I can't support that if he's not going to live here in Albuquerque. Thank you. Councilors, other questions or comments? Anything from the administration? Seeing none. Councilors, the motion on the floor is for approval. All those in favor say yes. Raise your hand. Yes. All those opposed? One, two, three, four, five. That matter fails on a four, five. Is that right, McClurk? So, so we have a vacancy on that board. Next up, final actions. Councilors Pena and Lewis. I think Councilor Pena, you want to carry this one? 
defer to you. Yes, so I think we have Mr. Minakuji here, and I think we're going to handle, um, try to figure out how we're going to meld uh, three different resolutions and ordinances into one, and then um, it's my understanding that we're going to defer it. So I'm going to ask <laughs> you for help, Mr. Minakuji, <clears throat> and maybe I can just preface it with that we have a resolution, I think, later on this um, agenda, and I'm not quite sure because I didn't ask the question earlier. Are we going to meld that into um, the two, or does that one st stand alone? Madam, uh, Mr. President, Madam, um, Madam, Mr. President, Councillor Pena, could you rephrase the question? I didn't quite understand. So we have the um, security plan that was the initial um, mm -hmm. resolution that was introduced. Yeah. Okay. And that's on the agenda this evening. And then we have um, myself and Councillor Lewis's um, 047, and then we have um, Councillor Davis and Feeblecorn 062. Are we going to meld all three or just two? Yes. Um, <clears throat> Mr. President, uh, Councillor Pena, yes. Uh, basically, 0247, did the, or the original 0247 that was introduced mel melded together both uh, R70 and the first 0247 as proposed. So as it was introduced in that, I already had those two melded together. This legislation then brings in R62, or no, excuse me, O62, and melds right. them um, with that one. Although, with that said, of course, there's, there's a, a significant change in it. Correct. So does that mean that R70 this evening will get deferred again, withdrawn? What's the... So, Madam Chair, that would be the discretion of the counselors. So this basically yep. takes O62 and R70 now are dealt with in four substitute three for O47. And, um, and, you, and it's your choice as to whether you want to defer or, or withdraw. Okay. Well, what I'd like to do is I'd like to make a motion to approve 047. I need a second, and then we'll introduce the floor. So. We have several seconds, so go ahead. Okay. So Sorry. we want to. It's up to it. you, ma'am. Okay. Yes, ma so, Mr. President, I was just waiting for the okay. So I'd like to now um, move the floor sub. And for the record, for the from the clerk, this is going to be for substitute number two, actually, right? Because this is our second time doing this. Three now. Um, yeah, we've done this three times now. Okay. Thank you. They all kind of run together. So for substitute number three, and you have a second from Councilor Feeblecorn. Thank you. Okay. Well, with that, I guess I can just start by saying I know we have the other two on on um, the agenda this evening, so. Um, give everybody a little bit of history. I had initially submitted R70, and that was for a transit um, tactical plan for safety. And then talking to Councillor Lewis, which I really appreciate, you know, he was like, you know, um, a plan's gonna take time. We have some issues now, let's address them. And I really appreciate his effort to try to address safety on, on the buses. And so, you know, then through that communication, obviously, Councillor Davis and Feeblecorn introduced a, a, a different resolution. And I'm just, I'm real happy and pleased to say that, you know, it's uh, great to come together because I think we're all concerned. We all support free fares and we all support um, safety on the buses. How we get there, I think, I think it was decided that we need to put the uh, responsibility on the people who really know about safety and put the onus back on them and have them bring some, um, um, some measures so that we can see if we can pass um, in the future. So with that, I would urge your support of um, deferring, deleting, melding 047, um, floor sub number three. And then we would defer it, correct? Oh, no, I need to defer it. Uh, Councilor, just to clarify, you intend to, we're going to pass tonight's floor substitute. Yes. And then we're going to defer, defer. The, new, defer the new substituted bill until final action on the 4th. Is that your intent? Yes. Okay. <laughs> so the motion will be for the mm. floor substitute number three. Any discussion? Again, all those in favor say yes. Mr. President. Hand. I'm sorry, uh, Council Lewis. Yeah. Uh, we should, I, I would like Mr. Minacucci to uh, give some explanation to the um, little changes to the, to the floor sub. Regarding the um, uh, the past system, I mean, we, we discussed sure. how this uh, implements the two other bills. These are in the bills. I'm assuming, I'm expecting that the other bills will be. Um, I'm, I'm assuming they'll be withdrawn tonight, um, and this this encompasses those. and uh, And there there was some some changes in this bill that that this substitute you know specifies regarding um, a study and intent to to take a good hard look at. 
uh, a complete study with, with a lot of departments involved. Um, and uh, so, Mr. Minicucci, if you'd explain that and also explain um, just how that study would take place. Um, Mr. President, count members of the council, basically what, so what the bill does is that it, first of all, it consolidates the title, so it's much shorter title. Um, second, um, it consolidates the whereas clause, kind of makes them tie it up to just basically those that report the purpose of the bill and the events creating the need for the bill. Uh, third, um, it clarifies exemptions for who may be in a transit boarding area, mm -hmm. and that was, those were amendments that were added to 02, 062 last week that would have been heard if 062 carried forward, um, and that being those persons exiting, exiting or entering a transit vehicle or who has the intent to board a transit vehicle. Um, it then states that the zero fare will continue until the 12-month pilot is completed and a study on whether or not to continue the zero fares has been submitted to the council and if the council has ordained to continue the program. Third, it removes the pass ID program as a mandate and instead, as Councillor Lewis was, was referring to, requires that the transit department, if it recommends in the post-zero fare study to continue the zero fare program, to also then include in the study, an analysis of the feasibility of a pass ID program and how it would be implemented. Uh, the study would shall be overseen by a technical advisory team comprised of members from the Transit Department, the Metro Security Division of the General Services Department, the Office of Equity and Inclusion, the Council Services Department, the Information Technology Services Department, and other members the Transit Department deems beneficial to the team. Councilor asked that we discuss a little bit as to what all that study would include. Um, and Mr. Ms. Ms. President, yes. Ms. And, and really, um, I think I think important to clarify that this is not about a study that would just say, "Hey, this is good or not." You know, having a pass with this is this is uh, really taking a good hard look with with very specific detail of how uh, a pass system could be implemented, which which technically the department has already gone a pretty good ways to demonstrate that and show that. And so I'm assuming that this would. You know, I, I would expect that this would include best practices from around the country. Um, you know, certainly there are, are programs wrong, all around the country that where they don't have uh, just a, uh, anything goes free fair, where there's not some kind of a pass system, uh, where they're not being accused of uh, uh, making criminals out of homeless people and things like that. I mean, you know, uh, um, so so it's not going to be about that issue. It's going to be about how, uh, like many other cities. And how Albuquerque, like we've already begun to be able to to put together, uh, could you know could implement uh, fully successfully implement uh, a pass program like that, and I and I and I believe that the this floor substitute um, sets the direction for that. Now, ultimately, of course, that's the decision of the council to come back with and and to look at with you know how they can have very we can all have various opinions on that and ultimately decide whether we want to move forward with that or not. But that is the intention of the of the substitute, correct? Uh, Mr. Mr. President, Councilor Lewis, correct. Thank you, Councilor Lewis. Councilors, any other questions? So the motion on the floor is to uh, substitute uh, floor substitute number, uh, Councilor. <laughs> yeah, to be honest, I want to make sure to get everything straight with the floor subs and also the bill. Uh, I just want to make sure I'm not confused here. Okay. So if you can explain it from the very beginning and then how it all breaks down. I want to know um, how, it, how it affects and remind us what the other floor subs were, just, to, just so that the public has an idea of how it all breaks down, if you wouldn't mind doing that. So, Mr. President, uh, Councillor Sanchez, so basically 047, did, uh, uh, without having to go into a real long, but to kind of get it clear, was that it set, first of all, it established a, uh, a FAIR program as a mandate, saying that, not a FAIR program, excuse me, a, a PASS program, PASS ID program. And with that PASS ID program, you would still have zero fares on transit, but you would have to have a PASS to get on. It then set parameters to try to make that PASS as equitable, as, access, as accessible as possible. Uh, that established certain IDs that were already present, such as driver's licenses, Medicare cards, veterans' IDs, school IDs, et cetera, a couple more that would uh, be allowed. It then... Um, went forward and allowed, uh, it set up so that the past, the transit department, as Councilor Lewis referred to, they've already been working on looking at best practices and identified ways of being able to allow people to um, download a pass on a, their iPhone or to go to a computer and download a pass so they could get e-passes. They could either put on their phone or they could put, they could print out on a computer from any computer. 
Um, it also looked at ways of making sure that we worked with the social service agencies so that they could also assist in using their facilities to uh, distribute passes to their clients. So that was kind of the majority of the pass program. It then recommended, and this was the original R70, which, which was put into 0247. Um, also, put, uh, two security plans. One is a short-term security plan, um, and that security plan would look at quickly, um, you know, the best, pract uh, best practice, not best practice, I'm sorry, to get a tactical plan in place to start addressing uh, security on buses. That'd be working with APD, Metro Security, um, uh, the Albuquerque Community Safety Department, Transit Department to get a tactical plan on place. They'd have to re that will have to come back to the council within 30 days of adoption. Um, then also it would establish a program to identify those people who um, are, are, who have been uh, convicted of causing, uh, you know, creating a crime on the bus, of being able to prohibit them from being on the bus or being prohibited for either, again, whether it be a forever or for a period of time was not yet determined. Then from that, and so that was it, then it required a long-term plan, and that was to look at the whole in depth of trying to, re trying to create a robust security a transit security agency, either whether it's within transit department or a mix of ACS and transit and APD. And that would be a best practices report and how to fund it. That'd be a longer term plan due near towards the end of 2023. So that was primarily 0247. 062 came in and it basically said, we're gonna first of all try to start funding transit, a transit security. So it put a million dollars in, in for, towards that. It also looked at some cleaning up some of the, or making filling in some of the gaps on the current transit um, boarding and fare ordinance, uh, which is 711, I believe, or 721, and basically tried to make sure that it made it clear that you cannot be at a bus stop um, unless you're there for the, for the sole intent of boarding a bus or at a transit station for boarding and alighting a bus, uh, trying to address the issues of, of crime that are, are, are being more, more and more reported at bus stops. So those were those two. What this does is that combines those two. The only major change it makes is that it changes the transit. It does two things, and there's one. It changes the transit um, mandate for a transit fare program. And instead, says, "Oh, we'll all, let's go ahead and take a study. If we determine we want to go with zero fares, finish out the pilot. Let's go ahead and proceed with a study or a study of how to do a pass program. But it would have to be a very. You would have to come forward with a with a, a study that could be implemented very quickly." I mean, the study would have to show a plan that can be implemented, a ready-to-go, uh, shovel-ready, for lack of a better word, plan to go. It also uh, adds in that um, it, would, it looks at SunVan, and it says to make SunVan equitable, what they wanted to do was try to, it, that one originally set a mandate to allow people to self-attest to uh, be on SunVan. You could come down and, and just kind of sign a paper and describe why you're eligible for SunVan for whatever need and therefore uh, qualify. Uh, that is what that was doing. The second thing it did is it also allowed for the art and sun van to become zero fares. So that comes in. What 62 does is that it keeps those in except makes a few changes. One, it, under federal regs, from what we read, as we kind of read through the 300-page document of federal regulations governing it, what we were able to determine was is that it doesn't allow you to self-attest, but it does say that, no, it's, that transit agencies should make it as simple as possible. So, and I'm glad you brought this up because we need to point that out that's in this bill is that it, it, this would instead create a one-stop, one-visit kind of shop for being eligible for SunVan. Basically, a person could come down to the uh, SunVan if they make an appointment, mm -hmm. that they would be interviewed there on site by a tra trained transit person from transit. They would then be qualified. If, they're, I mean, if they meet the qualifications, they'd be qualified. They wouldn't have to go to get doctor's appointments and doctor's notes. Or if they had enough documentation to prove, like for instance, they had some doctor's certificate, they could bring that in and the train is acceptable by a trans department, they could use that. So that's also now in, oh, in uh, four substitute three. The second thing though is that also the art and sun van are also in there as free zero fares. What the transit department though informed us early this evening was that that most likely would, it's, it'd be best, and I think we spoke with the counselor, the sponsors that we might remove that, we would probably remove that from that this bill because what'll happen is they'll require this bill deferred two months while they do an equity analysis. So instead, next week, that will be removed from the bill, and we will introduce a new separate bill that just basically says zero art, um, the art and the, zero, and the sun van will be zero fares, and that way then it will go and be parked either in committee or wherever the council determines to park it um, for two months for, until the uh, transit department is able to complete the equity analysis. So that's the, the summary.
Okay, thank you. I just wanted to make sure that we are all understanding exactly what's going on. Um, one of the things that I have not heard is um, how many times have we actually talked to the bus drivers, the ones that actually have to deal with the security issues and everything that's going on that's taking place on the bus. I recently just spoke to um, two bus drivers and I just want the council to get an idea of what I just experienced um, speaking to one of the bus drivers and um, hopefully this has some sort of bearing on, on the whole thing as well. Um, I spoke to a bus driver who actually works on a route um, here in Albuquerque. He is a hardworking union individual and one of the things that he stated when he runs his bus route in the morning is that he only picks up 13 people who are going to work and then other than that it's just others who are just um, seeking shelter or trying to get from point A to point B and um, it's not a lot of um, what he was saying you know usefulness in terms of what he would be expecting a bus to be providing also he he said that um, the biggest issue that they face as a bus driver is the fact that um, we had a security item built in, and that item that was built in was the fare. We all we always had the fare, and the fare would keep individuals from jumping on the bus that otherwise would not have gone on the bus. And um, some of these are the criminal element, the individuals who are using drugs, um, on the bus, uh, he sent me a picture yesterday of a guy who was tenting on the bus and using fentanyl, and then every other person after him walked through that cloud of burning uh, pills. And that, to me, is an extreme danger um, for anybody that's getting on the bus, an innocent person who just gets on the bus and has to walk through a cloud of fentanyl is being exposed to that drug. So he mentioned that. He also stated that any kind of checking IDs or any kind of, of communication, even um, just getting the bus pass or getting a bus pass shown to him, um, that we passed that security problem when we passed that security problem when we actually decided to implement no fares. That was actually a security, that actually helped with security. Now what we're dealing with is we're dealing with with individuals who are going to be in direct conflict with the bus driver if they have to provide any type of documentation or have to show anything. And at that point, that's going to put our bus drivers in, in, in jeopardy and cause a one-on-one -on -one confrontation with them. So right now, he told me that last week he had an individual who was driving, who was, he was driving, and this individual passed out on his bus from using fentanyl. And he knew they were using fentanyl because he could smell the pills burning, which is also exposing the bus driver to the pills burning. And fentanyl stays suspended in the air and you can be, you can ingest it just by walking through that. So that individual remained on the bus, used the drug, the drug was able to transfer to several different people while it was still suspended in the bus and then he ended up having to park that bus and wait for security for 45 minutes the alternative he said is to drive that bus all the way down to the Alvarado Transportation Center where somebody from security could assist at that point if he does that then he exposes even more people to that burning pill that's inside the bus so basically the point I'm trying to make is that one we already had security in terms of having a fare. Mm. Now that we don't have the fare, we need to concentrate on security before we can implement anything other, any other type of um, way to um, uh, provide accountability. The bus drivers are, are very worried about them being put in a situation where they will have to deal with or confront any individuals on the bus for any cause at this point and what we need is we need a security protocol that goes in now and handles those things um, right up front we need enough security on the bus to actually provide security for the individuals who are getting on and off the bus the person who's using the drugs is also um, at risk 
and then you also have the bus driver. And when you're talking about a bus driver, if you have 30 individuals and he's and he's actually uh, being exposed to fentanyl burning in the bus, then you have that issue where you have somebody who's in charge of 30 other people in the bus. So bottom line is, is what he was suggesting, and this is coming from a bus driver based on all the issues that I just described, is we need to provide security first, keep the zero fares for now, and then once we get the security protocol taken care of and the buses are safer, then at that point we implement um, some other sort of, of project to help out with the accountability and, and um, some sort of fare project. I, I just wanted to make sure that uh, the voices of the bus drivers were heard and um, I think it's very important that we as council take these items into consideration. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor. Councilor, uh, Madam Vice President Grout. Mr. President, I have one question about the Sun Van qualification. Do federal uh, transit rules allow people to self-attest to a disability mm. to access paratransit? Mr. Mancucci. I didn't um, quite understand. Um, so, Mr. President, Council Grout, so that, I think that might be from SF, FS2. Um, on FS3, what we're saying is, is that federal rules allow, um, don't necessarily allow for a self-attest. What they do allow for, though, is a very simplified system. They try to encourage that. And that's what's proposed in FS3, which is the one-stop, one-visit uh, system. Thank you. As good as we get, right? Uh, thank you, Councilor Grout. Councilors, other questions? Councilor Feeblecorn. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, folks are a little confused, so I just want to try to clarify. There are three bills before us tonight. We are going to combine them all. The floor substitute that Councilor Pena has moved um, would combine all three of those bills and will be, we'll be withdrawing the others. And what this new floor substitute does is, number one, it keeps the original zero fares program in place through the entire year that it was originally designed to go, and it gives time at the end for transit to do an analysis of that program to make sure that we know what we're looking at in terms of if we want to continue that program or if we want to continue something else. The second thing that the floor substitute does that, you're going to, that we're going to vote on here in a minute is increase security. And again, this is something that we've heard over and over again to Councillor um, Sanchez's point. This new floor substitute includes $1 million for security. It creates a transit security plan, and it does things like make um, transit security an actual law enforcement officer. So it gives them more authority to do the things that we need to be done, which are like remo removing drug use from our transit department, our transit buses. The third thing it does is it allows the most streamlined process possible for people who ride the sun van so that they are not overly burdened with having to apply, fill out forms, go back in another day. This is, the, this is what I'm told is the most streamlined option available under federal law. And the fourth thing it does is creates a plan to do a study along with whether free fares works or not at the end of that one year pilot project um, that does what Councilor Lewis was telling about, which is review what could be done um, with the past program, and it's going to look at things like, is the technology available? I don't, I don't think that it is, but we don't know that for sure. Um, how would the logistics work? All of those things would be in a, in a study that would be given to us so that when the one year of the zero fares pilot is over, council has all the information we need to make a decision moving forward. So that's what's moving forward if we move this floor substitute tonight. Um, and I just want to thank real quickly all the sponsors and other counselors that have worked on this in the last couple of weeks, come up with a you know, compromise that actually makes sense and addresses what I think are the major issues here. So thank you. Thank you, counselor, and I agree. I think this is the, the way to move forward on the stuff we agree on and get some more data and, and set a schedule for determining what we don't know yet. Councilors, other questions on four substitute? I'm sorry, Councilor Lewis. Mr. President, um, the the bill that we don't, I don't think we really set this out in the substitute, but um, uh, 
just decisions moving forward on on who will do that study? Are we look? Did we, did we specify? Or we? Can we just, who is that? Who would that be? Mr. President, Councilor Lewis. Basically, it, it would start with the transit department, but they would organize. Um, they would work with the other departments. I, yeah, yeah. I, I mean, I recognize that, but normally that you'd have like a third party, or we'd have a third we'd hire. Um, that we, I think on the I think at that point in time it is not yet. Usually, what does it, it puts together a tech team. And the tech team begins to look at what they, I might be lack of better words, a needs analysis, what's needed, and is that, can that be done in-house, or can that, does that require a, 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 a consultant, something like that. And usually that's the first step. Ultimately, it could result in a consultant that could help us get the kind of data that we need. Okay. Yes, yes. And, and my understanding, too, is that, um, it's a little bit off subject, but the transit department does have on uh, the firm on contract for other purposes. Mm -hmm. That's by far one of the world's leading transit research firms. So they're already on contract. Whether that contract can be extended or supplemented, I don't know, but they do have them on. So we'll have a chance to review the objectives of that study um, before we were to give it to a, a consultant of, hey, these are, this is what we want to look at. We want to look at the feasibility. We want to look at implementation. Um, we want to look at best practices and be able to get a full picture. Um, so, but, but we'll be involved and be able to set the, some of the objectives of that as well. Correct? Uh, our staff, at least. And our yeah, Mr. President, Council Lewis, yes, staff will be on board, and if those are the instructions given to staff, we can, as part of the tech team, request that we get a, you know, either an executive communication or a council OC, however, to, uh, to the council for review. Right, okay. Councilor Sanchez. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Just one more thing. I just want to make sure that uh, the Sunban users, how are we working with that again to make sure that uh, our elderly and disabled are taken care of? Um, um, Mr. President, Mr. Or Councilor Sanchez, are you referring to how they would be able to become eligible to that process? That's correct. Uh, correct. So basically, what we look under federal law, what it would allow is they have a system in there, and it's, I believe it's called, um, uh, um, it's, uh, and I, it's something like basically re reduce the titles, kind of like reduce the administrative burden, something of that nature. And what and the and the easiest simple it said the simplest one of those bird of those looks to be where the transit department would have a system where if you're a person who wants to apply, you would have, you would be able to schedule a meeting with somebody at the transit department, a specialist. You would come down and you would say, and they would have a process to review your to, to kind of meet with you, work with you, and to kind of see you know through that appointment whether they believe you meet the qualifications to be on board. Um, that would be one way. Or if you already have, you know, some sort of, <clears throat> you know, uh, a paperwork that's already available that you don't, you would come down, that would be a very short meeting because the paperwork would kind of show in depth, you know, that you're available, that, you know, they could go ahead and approve you from there. Thank you, Mr. Bernicucci. Okay, counselors, any other questions on the floor substitute? Mr. President, Mr. Real. Um, Mr. President, um, I, I recognize that um, this may get deferred tonight just because of titled publication issues. Um, but I, I do want to just express a concern. Um, we didn't get the bill till late this evening, and that's um, when our folks, folks reviewed what was included in here. Uh, I do want to just raise one concern that I do think we need to work on during the course of, uh, of the next two weeks. Uh, on page four, uh, it appears that we are expanding the definition of a peace officer. Yes. Um, and. Um, it also includes transit security and metro security folks, along with any other public official or others vested with the laws. Da -da 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 -da. Um, I think that's really a significant change to how we deal with um, with our with that group, um, and so we probably just need to have that conversation. Um, and I, I understand what we're trying to get at here, and actually, Councillor Benton and I have talked about this on occasions. But that is a, a very different, uh, very different than what we do today, and um, and that also is is, is a, some concern just from a liability standpoint and, and really operational standpoint. So, and then the last piece, uh, counselors, uh, obviously there are some uh, practical applications of how we keep people off buses by providing a list of folks who are not eligible to ride on the buses. Um, this, I think, from a practical standpoint, may be very difficult to, to enforce in that um, it would require 
a facial recognition and a name for a transit operator to know who's coming in, who's not going, and who's not uh, eligible to ride the bus. So I think there are some issues, but on none the whole, I just wanted to raise those two concerns because I do think that our, our transit folks would like to weigh in with the council staff to see if we can maybe work through some of these changes. Thank, and thank you. you, Mr. Rail. As you mentioned, the intent tonight is to get the four substitute with both all of those bills pulled together. None of these is, none of these are new. There are all the pieces here, and it's my understanding. Of questions like how do we verify the ID or the person is the question that came up as part of the conversation around 047. And so we're directing the administration to go and give us some technical expertise and answers to that. Relating to the peace officer, that's actually not new. It was in the original language of 062 and has been around for six weeks now. And your administration has given us some comment on it, but we'd be happy to revisit it. Um, but it was a, a provision that, uh, that folks in the administration had supported for a way to be sure that if someone were to assault or ignore a security officer, there was a way for us to enforce that rule. Um, but we would love to revisit with that. Um, I just want to point out that nothing in this substitute is new. It's all just pieces that have been out for about six or eight weeks. But yeah, we need to revisit it, and that's why we're going to defer tonight on the substitute if we ever get there. Um, and so is there anyone else? Great. All those in favor of four substitute number three, say yes and raise your hand. Any opposed? That matter carries unanimously. Councilor Pena, back to you. Thank you, Mr. President. Just reiterating what everyone said, I just um, I'm really happy to to you know see that we've been able to come together to come up with a, a good compromise that really addresses everyone's concerns. I also want to thank Councillor Bassan. Um, I think this is a huge win for our uh, Sun Van riders. I think they're going to be very excited. And once you know, we're still got a ways to go, but I think um, throughout this whole process, I think we really unveiled some. Um, some issues that we, we had with some ban, and I'm so pleased that we're able to address those. But um, with that, um, I'd like to ask for a deferral of uh, floor substitute number 3047. And there's several seconds there, and that would be until our next meeting. Is that right for February 4th? Yes, two weeks. Councilors, any questions on the motion for deferral? Seeing none, all those in favor say yes. Raise your yes. hand. Yes. That matter carries unanimously. We'll see it again in two weeks. Oh, I'm sorry, uh, Mr. Cornelius reminded me that we do have a few folks signed up for public comment. Um, let's do this. Uh, Mr. Cornelius, why don't we hear public comment? If any of the counselors want to reconsider the motion to defer, we'll come back and do that after comment so that we can accommodate the folks who've waited on us today. Is that okay? Very good, sir. Thank you, Mr. President. First up on Zoom, we have Althea May Atherton, followed by Patrick Martin. Hi, um, President Davidson, members of the City Council. I'm Althea May Atherton. I'm a board member of the Victory Hills Neighborhood Association, um, the Transportation Chair of the District 6 Coalition, um, a member of the Albuquerque Bus Riders Union, and I'm also an expecting parent who is very excited to raise my uh, future child on the bus. Um, I have not gotten a chance, obviously, to take a look at this new floor substitute. Um, it sounds different than the ones that were on the agenda. Um, but I still have a lot of hesitations about it. Um, I don't think we need to do a feasibility study on the past system. Um, I think that zero fare is working great as it is. And at a time when the Albuquerque ride system is planning to suspend some service due to the lack of bus drivers, we should not be adding any arduous burdens to the soldier shoulders of our already taxed um, and frankly undercompensated bus dri drivers. I would love to see us um, commit to having more um, an, a larger increase of pay so it can be competitive with other CDL type jobs. Um, I've been talking to bus drivers over the last few weeks um, about how they feel about this bill, um, and I wanted to share a few of those comments. Um, I'm worried about the conversations we'll have to have if we take zero fare away, was what one driver told me um, on the bus. Um, another bus driver uh, that I follow on Twitter tweeted, all the money they want to spend on new technology and the hoops they want passengers to go through to get a free passes, so I'll substitute in darn pointless. Skip all that and let leave the fare free, hire security for these buses. Simple solution, this is nonsense. Um, also, the Transit Advisory Board had asked for a comprehensive um, safety plan that was community-based, and I want to make sure that the text of this bill, which I'll be going through with a fine-tooth comb um, once it becomes available to the public, um, will 
um, allow for things like the um, the ACS to be able to be um, responding, um, have lay people who are able to um, be kind of customer service uh, people on the bus, uh, as we talked about in the District 6 Coalition meeting last night. Um, I think that there are a lot of challenges. I'm really concerned about how this is all going to get melded together, and I look forward to reading it. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Evans. Patrick Martin, followed by Sarah Manning. Hi, thank you, uh, Council President and Councilors. A few months ago, I spoke about my negative first experience trying to use transit in Albuquerque because I was foiled by non-functional fare machines here. Um, this was before the start of Zero Fares. And I wanted to speak this time about the reverse situation. This past October, uh, my parents visited me out in Albuquerque, and we for example, took the bus from Knob Hill down to the Railrunner and back. And even now, months later, my parents still talk about how easy and convenient it was to get on the bus because of zero fares, how they could just walk on board and get on the bus and off we went. And it was easy for me too. I didn't have to apply for a pass um, for them ahead of time under what might be the free pass system that y'all are considering or not considering anymore. It's so confusing to keep track of what you guys are trying to do. Um, I didn't have to pre buy fare cards for them um, or do any really preparation for um, whatever transit we wanted to use in the city. So there's lots of reasons why zero fares are great. There's what Althea was talking about. There are the equity concerns, but also it just makes the transit system so much more convenient for people to use. And so I really hope that when the council, as the council continues to work for uh, making the transit system work better, that Keeping zero fares is an important part of doing that. Thank you. Sarah Manning, followed by Rosemary Blanchard. Thank you very much uh, for hearing me, uh, Mr. President and members of the council. This is a very simple concept, making life easier for citizen visitors of Albuquerque and doing having zero fares and even extending it to the art system is a very positive step. It tells people that they are welcome to be here. It helps people get around the city. Passes do not stop crime. And that's just common sense. It may help you track criminals, but if you engineer a pass system that requires um, electronic surveillance, essentially, of who gets on a bus, where they get on the bus, where they go, what the bus number is, what the route number is, what time of day. That's almost surveillance. And I truly hope we don't go there. We want to make Albuquerque a modern comfortable, welcoming city and not trusting people enough to ride a bus does not stop fentanyl use. It does not stop petty crime. It does not stop people driving. Uh, it's all of these things, but we want another want a friendly system. So please make it simple, make it friendly, make it equitable. Thank you very much. Finally, Rosemary Blanchard. Okay. I can't start my video, it says, because you have the host has stopped it. So you don't get to see my cat. <laughs> okay, she came back. Okay, I spoke on the earlier, uh, in the public comment period, and I I stated, you know, we do need safe public transit. However, we do not need public transit that creates a spurious aura of safety by exclusions plagued by stereotypes. We do not need to increase the ways in which we criminalize people with no place to go or with a difficulty negotiating systems, either electronically or in person. As you consider these newly combined and refined ordinances, I urge you to, to alter, to some extent, the language of enforcement and removal to provide also for assisting people who are having trouble meeting the free pass requirements or the no hanging out at the bus stops language, especially people who are trying to figure out what to do and when to be there to get the free bus ride or where they need to go. 
I think we will have a safer and more community friendly transit system if we factor in helpers, for want of a better word, who can both assist people on site who need help facilitating the transit requirements and build a safer bus, bus stop environment by their presence. Of course, on-site helpers would need backup for situations that may arise, but really, Walmart has been doing a version of this for years, with the first greeter being a totally unthreatening person with backup security available if needed. Add to that a little helpfulness in the navigating the system, and you might find that friendly and safe go together. Thank you. My cat, Randy, agrees. That concludes public comment. Thank you, sir. Councilors, uh, if there's anybody who wants to go back based on comment that wants to reconsider, we will. Otherwise, we'll move on. I, I won't reconsider, but can I make some comments since? Um, go for it. Yeah, since we did have public comment, um, I just don't want people to get the idea somehow that that our bus system is is clean and safe, and ridership is up, and bus drivers are happy, and everything's wonderful. Um, because that 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 just could not be further from the truth right now. Um, and, you know, Councilor Sanchez mentioned some, some scenarios. I mean, I, so I, I rode the bus one time in, I don't know, 20 years, you know, but, and so I, I, I would love to be able to think that, uh, you know, um, you know, you ride the bus one time, you're going to have a great experience. And, you know, I, I wish that was the case. You know, I had a, I had an experience where I had, you know, two cases of people using fentanyl on the bus when I rode it. Uh, the bus driver had to stop, ask the people to stop using fentanyl. Um, you know, talking to a person who is homeless, who said he was homeless, that's how I know, and she said, uh, um, you know, I don't feel safe on this bus, you know. Um, and so, you know, the, the bus stops were dirty. Um, it was not a good experience. And, I, and I'd love to be able to say, too, that, hey, you just had a freaked ride, Dan. I mean, that was just a, you know, <laughs> went the wrong time, wrong, you know, wrong time, you know, you got to ride another time. But but that's just not the case either. Um, there's story after story of bus drivers who are unhappy, um, who, who attribute that to the current way that we're running things. Um, you know, people say the bus stops are dirty, the buses are dirty, and I can't recommend my own daughter, my family riding the bus. I, I, and I, I, would, I would tell them it's not safe, I can't do that. And so why as a city councilor would I, would I recommend anybody from riding the bus if I can't recommend my own family uh, to ride this bus system right now? People aren't choosing to, you know, give up their cars and, you know, hey, you know, let's go take the bus. And so we're not, we're not, we're not accomplishing that purpose whatsoever. We have some serious problems with the transit system in Albuquerque. Um, uh, ridership is not up. It's in fact down 33 percent from 2019 before pre-pandemic. So I, I would love to be able to see some data that would show that this current program has contributed to more riders on the bus. Uh, there are other cities that have pass programs, other cities that have fare programs, uh, and people don't claim that those cities and the, and the politicians and the people that implemented the taxpayers that approved those fare systems, pass systems, are making criminals out of people, are racist, or in any way, you know, treating a certain amount of people differently than anywhere else. And yet somehow that's, that's continually a part of this discussion. And uh, so, uh, we, we, uh, this is serious, absolutely serious. I think this bill addresses a lot of things. Um, and, uh, and I think you know, we could pass this bill, but it is up to the administration and the transit department um, to be able to implement these things and to, I mean, execute the very best possible way we can serve the people of the city of Albuquerque. Um, so uh, probably be a few weeks before we talk about this again. I wanted to share that. And I, I do appreciate the public comment. And I do appreciate all the emails and the many, many people from bus drivers and from many people who've expressed many, many concerns um, and, and many that are just desperate concerns uh, about our system right now that's in great need of help. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Pena. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, since we're adding a couple of comments, I would like to add a couple of comments. Um, just, you know, knowing about the fentanyl, knowing that we were on the bus and there were smoking fentanyl on the bus, and, and hearing um, Councillor Sanchez's comments about the fentanyl, I would really like transit to look at a policy, right? I mean, we should have a policy. If there's a bus driver and he's exposed to fentanyl, 
Should he continue on that bus? And I think it's a liability for passengers who continue to get on that bus if we don't notify them that there's been fentanyl smoke. Because as you know, as he stated, I mean, you can actually OD from the smoke. So um, that's a, a very serious concern. So I think um, I'd like to hear before we come back that in the next two weeks, you know, something something in relation to that. And then just a, a, another couple comments, and I'll be brief. Just bus driver pay, I heard APS bus drivers get um, paid more than our city bus drivers. So when we start to look at the budget, I'd really like to, um, um, the administration to really look at that. And as a council, I think we should definitely look at that. And then um, last budget cycle, um, I had put in an amendment with the support of the, this council to add three additional bus stop maintenance workers. And the combined funding, it says, I think it would bring us up to, i um, looking for the wording in here. I think it said it would bring it up to, I don't want to misstate, I'll find it. But how many do we have who are cleaning the bus stops currently, I'd like to know. And then if the money has not been used for those three additional, on top of the number that we were given, um, what, what's that money being used for? So those were just a few questions for the next council meeting. So with that, I wouldn't, um, I wouldn't move to change my motion. Thank you, ma'am. Councilors, other questions or comments? We're gonna, if not, we're gonna move on to 062 briefly. Councilor Peeblecorn. Thank you, Mr. President. I'd like to move to withdraw 062. Second, is this much? Councilors, any discussion? So this is because we've rolled 062 or the big pieces of it into the third version of 47 a minute ago, so it's not needed anymore. All those in favor of the withdrawal for 62? Oh, Councilor, oh, you're good. Okay. All those in favor of withdrawing 62, say yes. That matter carries. Councilor Basson. Mr. President. 064 is amending Chapter 5, Article 5 of the Revised Ordinances of Albuquerque, the Public Purchases Ordinance relating to definitions, preferences, exemptions, pay equity, and purchases of software. I move it to pass. We have a motion and a second from Councillor Feeblecorn. Councillor Bassan on your bill. Um, Mr. President, I know that there's some I, there's amendments in the iPads. I'm trying to get to it now. Yeah, go ahead. I'm looking for it too. So. Okay. Mr. President, I believe it's, I believe if I'm correct, it's, it's your, yeah, your amendment. Thank you, my apologies. Councilors, I'll move floor amendment number one to 02264. Amendment number one, uh, I'll read it because it's quick and otherwise, uh, on page 12, line three and four, remove the strike through. On 12, remove the language in brackets, whatever that was. On page 12, uh, remove the strike through, and on page 13, removing the strike through. This amendment disallows changes to the public purchase ordinance um, related to the pay equity reporting uh, process and preference. The amendment maintains the pay equity requirements uh, as outlined in the current ordinance. And a second from Councilor Feeblecorn. Let me, I want to ask the administration specifically to weigh in on this, but uh, here's what we're trying to do here. The council years ago, uh, some of you were here, I think it was before I was here, passed a pay equity ordinance that required city contractors and vendors to report um, and basically do an analysis to ensure that they were paying women and men equally to close that equity gap. The city was a national leader on that. Councilor Gibson uh, worked with Council Mayor Barry on that, actually. It was a, a passed unanimously here. We revised it a couple of times. I recognize, and, and Ms. Yara and the purchasing department and I have had some discussions about this, I recognize, thank I recognize that um, the implementation of this has gotten a little cumbersome, particularly for small vendors um, who don't have the technical and payroll expertise to do it. But it's also important that the city of Albuquerque maintains our commitment to paying women equally and work doing business with those who do. So our intent this evening is to ensure that we maintain our pay equity ordinance provisions and work with the administration to modernize that ordinance and the way the reporting and the detailing is done so we actually get some usable data out of it now. Um, I'm sorry that's a long explanation, but I want everybody to understand that I don't think the administration's intent was to get rid of pay equity. I know that's not it. And our intent here is not to reinforce the system that everybody hates and doesn't give us anything useful anymore in our system. Um, but we need to keep it in the bill so we have a time to work on it. 
Did I do that pretty well, Ms. Shara? Okay. Questions from the counselors or Ms. Shara, if you want to briefly. Yeah, um, I'm, I'm sorry, I can't have the mic. We don't know if which oh, one works either. Hold on. Sorry, Mr. All right, uh, Mr. President, thank you uh, for that explanation, and I think you're right on. Um, we just want to take a step back from the requirement to have vendors um, submit that form every time they have an RFP or RFB submittal. It does get kind of cumbersome for smaller businesses who don't have the means um, to get that form filled out for us. Um, unfortunately, the case is that not very many, probably less than a handful of vendors who we have collected data from all these years actually certify for pay equity. So um, it's more useful for us now to look at the data we've collected and other sources of data um, to see where things are at and how we can make changes to com compel our vendors to you know, um, maintain a pay equity structure as you know, we, uh, we also have some inadvertent pay equity disparities that we are working on ourselves. And um, I'd really like to focus our efforts on that as well. Well said, thank you. Thank you. It's good to see you back. Thank Counselors, you. other questions? Counselor Bassan. Mr. President, so am I, because that, that's a lot to put back in, and I just read it, right, to compare it. But so administration is in agreement with the amendment to put all this back in. Mr. President and Councilor Bassan, um, for tonight we would like, if it makes it easier, the other elements of this change we do need to go forward with. So if we can go ahead and pass, if the council wishes to pass this amendment, but I would like to keep the conversation open about how we're going to change the pay equity program going forward. Okay, Ms. thank you, thank you, Director. Um, Mr. President, I just, I mean, I'm fine if everybody's on the same page, I guess, with that change. I just would be, and it sounds like even a deferral is not, because this is significant enough that I want to make sure that we are being mm -hmm. equitable, but also not being too cumbersome. So um, I'm definitely happy to keep the conversation open. If you'd like to reach out to me, I invite you to do so. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Council Persson. Let me, I had the same concern, and so let me respond. We'll go to Council Lewis. I agree with you. I think by leaving the pay equity provisions in the purchasing order cleanup, it essentially leaves that portion of our current program where it is. It doesn't change it for anybody in the process or where we are, but we don't need a whole bunch of language to agree that we need to go revisit this and come back with a better solution through this process, but not hold the whole purchasing program up. I think the bigger danger is us abandoning this and then trying to add it back in later mid-cycle for a new purchasing process. Um, and I think we all agree it needs to be done, and I think we don't need a whole bunch of extra language to tell us how to set up a committee and get it done. I trust that we can do it. So, Councilor Bassan, the Council List. Mr. President, I just want to say that I hear you saying we're going to revisit redoing this ordinance again. Just that part. Okay, thank you. Just the pay equity part. Councilor Lewis. So, to be clear, uh, the, the administration recommended this originally, um, these strike-throughs. Uh, Ms. Yard, did you all recommend that this be done in this bill and these changes to the ordinance? Mr. President and Councilor Lewis, yes, we recommended that these strike-throughs happen uh, so that we could reevaluate the program and stop collecting data, uh, these forms. Um, it, it costs my department about $10,000 a year to do that. So... so um, I mean, for financial reasons, but also because you probably felt like by striking that language, it wouldn't, um, I mean, you're just talking about some paperwork and some further hindrances to the process, not, not uh, you know, going against the, um, uh, you know, our, our city laws and requirements for, you know, equity in that way. You're just talking about, so, so that, I, I just want to make sure this was the administration's recommendation and the amendment um, is... Uh, I guess, canceling some of those strike throughs. Yes, um, Mr. President and Councilor Lewis, that's exactly correct. Um, we were trying to get it removed from the ordinance so that we could, re we could think about changing the program and stop collecting the form, really, is why that I had recommended the strikeouts. But if it makes it easier tonight, uh, we, there are other elements in the bill that we would like to go forward. So if we can remove this part, 
with the amendment and talk about it later. That would be my preference. Okay, thank you. And I guess, uh, Mr. Mr. President, um, I mean, it's kind of a dilemma because this is something that, uh, you know, if, if uh, you know, one of the counselors were to introduce a bill, I mean, certainly the, the administration is kind of like introducing this and saying this is really what we want, what we need, uh, but then for us to come back and say, well, you're going to get this, but not these few things. Um, yeah, I just want to make sure that we're that we're we're clear on that. I mean, that doesn't seem ideal either. Yeah, and Mr. President and Councilor Lewis, I just want to mention that this pay equity change was a last minute at addition to this ordinance amendment. Um, we had been working on the on the other three changes for quite some time. So, um, I, I apologize that we didn't think that through. Thanks, Councilor Sanchez. Yes, thank you, Mr. President. I just was wanting to make a comment. Didn't we just deal, aren't we dealing with a massive lawsuit right now in reference to pay equity between, um, for women and, and men? So it's just confusing to me that we'd even be um, reaching there. Um, I think it's important that we always have the equity and we keep that, and we keep that equity in mind on everything that we do all the time. and with that big lawsuit that we're paying out, I guess it's probably the biggest lawsuit we've ever had to deal with, right? So um, I think we need to stay with um, our, our equity. Thank you, sir. Char, anything else from the administration or other council? See, seeing uh, uh, Councilor Bassan. Mr. President, just to close, sort of, uh, Ms. Yara, just please, let's make sure to revisit this. Because I, you know, I support leave it. It is easier to leave it in than try to add it back later, and I, I totally respect that. But at the same time, I do think that it sounds like there's some good reasoning here and there. And as Miss Kulidon, get ready. We're doing another, <laughs> we're doing another one. So mm -hmm. if we can make sure to please revisit this so that we can figure out yeah. checking it and crossing all the T's and dotting all the I's for it, I just don't want us to forget to do that and then have it be something that didn't ever really happen. Yeah, Mr. President, I'd like to revisit this before the, the budget's done. So, yeah. yeah, I think okay. Ms. Jar is not going to let us forget this. Uh, <laughs> I'm confident of that. But uh, if Councilor Bassan, uh, as our budget chair, uh, I know that's not necessarily related to purchasing, but I'd love to work on it with you or let any other members of the council jump and run with it. Um, but I know Ms. Jar won't let us forget it because it's been a burden for them to administer, but we understand why. So thank you. Councilors, other questions, other comments? Seeing none, all those in favor of amendment number one, say yes, raise your hand. Yes. Any opposed? We are back on the bill. Councilor Bassan, by request. As amended. Mr. President, I forgot we were doing the amendment, so I still urge, and now I urge your support as amended. Okay. Councilors, other questions, and thank you for the administration. Seeing none, all those in favor of uh, 064 as amended, say yes, raise your hand. That matter carries, thank you. Thank you, Ms. Jara. I'll call us tomorrow. Next up, 067 is, oh, you've been waiting for this, amending the police oversight ordinance. Hassan Benton, Davis, and Grout, whoever wants to take this first. Councilor. Go ahead, Councilor Bassan. Mr. President, 067 is amending the po police oversight ordinance, chapter nine, article four, part one of the revised ordinances of Albuquerque. I move it do pass. Second, Councilor Benton, go ahead. Mr. President, I would like to move the floor substitute in your iPads. A second from Councilor Benton on the floor substitute. Councilors, do you want to explain the sub? Mr. President, I'm going to ask for Ms. Kulidon to use her very educated and expertise in this, being that she's been so invested in helping. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. President, Councillor Bassan. Uh, just to briefly summarize the uh, bill itself and uh, what's contained in the floor substitute, uh, this ordinance proposes several amendments to the police oversight ordinance, which of course governs the CPOA, the agency, and the board. Uh, first, the amendments would change the size of the board from a nine-member board down to five members, and the term advisory would be added to the board's title, consistent with the board's intended function so it would be called the uh, Civilian Police Advisory Board. As part of this process, all seats on the board would be uh, vacant until uh, refilled through the council's appointment process. 
um, existing board members could reapply if they're interested in serving on the new board. Um, the aim of these changes is to clarify the board's role and alleviate some systemic changes with the existing board structure to longstanding issues for the CPOA. Second, the ordinance seeks to address another recurring challenge, which is that the volunteer board is currently uh, being asked to engage in upper level management of city staff members. These amendments would clarify that the board's main objectives is to uh, main objective is to conduct community-based review of certain civilian police complaints and review of police policies. And the management responsibilities would be delegated to an independent contractor retained by the city council, a contract compliance officer who would be tasked with monitoring and tracking CPOA compliance with the requirements of this ordinance and the CASA. The CCO would also interview candidates for the director, conduct the director's annual performance review, and establish the director's compensation uh, in consultation with some other uh, folks in those processes. Um, other big ticket items in the bill include uh, that the director no longer is limited to a three-year term. Uh, the CPOA will select its independent legal counsel from City Legal's conflict counsel list. Um, community policing councils would be folded into certain CPOA processes, including conducting a first review of policy proposals from APD um, and receiving CPOA findings and recommendations on uh, civilian police complaints just for informational purposes. Board members would also receive an honorarium for completing their training requirements, as well as a stipend for uh, regular meetings of the board. Uh, other, there are other uh, minor modifications throughout, um, mostly cleanup and clarifications. Uh, the floor substitute includes additional amendments, most notably that the director is no longer required to obtain board approval before issuing disciplinary recommendations. And then as a procedural fix, those disciplinary recommendations are now sent to the Office of Police Reform instead of the chief, because the Office of Police Reform now handles and has the final say in police disciplinary matters. Additionally, the portions of the APD Civilian Police Academy training that board members are required to complete are now listed in the ordinance itself. Uh, it currently just says board members have to complete the portions of the academy that APD deems are necessary, so just for additional transparency about what that training looks like. And then the sub um, also clarifies that the CCO, that, that new position, will not be anyone who has been employed by APD in the past or any current or past CPOA board members. And then again, there's some reorganizations, um, most notably where um, sections dealing with um, appeal procedures are put into the appeals section of the board, whereas they lived elsewhere in the previous version. Um, and again, um, various numerous cleanup and clarifying changes throughout. Well done, thank you. Councilor Prasad. Mr. President, I think that, you know, I, I think that my, myself with the co-sponsors, especially our staff, uh, we said we would revisit. We did the ordinance update last year uh, between the, the council, and we said we were going to revisit it again, and I think that we've done a really good and thorough job of doing that. I also know that, you know, I, I think it's important to clarify that from my perspective, it's very important that with the agency, it is a independent department that is supposed to investigate the use of force um, complaints and other cases within APD, it's the board's job to decide if the agency's recommendations and findings match. And the board has not seemingly been, been doing that. And on the last update, I think that we did a really good job of trying to streamline them and help give them some directives so that there wasn't um, an essential rabbit hole with every investigation, and that seems to not have happened. So I'm really proud of my work with the co-sponsors and with our staff, with City Legal, who has put in a lot of time and effort. I don't think that this is being rushed through. I think that this is something that we've spent a lot of time on. I realize that some people might say it's rushed for, through because we didn't necessarily obtain their personal opinions and recommendations, but I, I think that we really took into heart and consideration the opinions and the and the, opi uh, the opinions from the people that really are involved and invested in this, and I know this council has taken it very seriously along with the city um, legal, so thank you, Ms. Keefe, 
We've also worked very closely with the monitor and the DOJ to make sure that the changes in here are also something that will be approved. So we're really not doing anything wrong. Um, but we do need to restructure this and we do need to give some more guidance and some clarity and I think that this is definitely going to achieve it and I sure hope that it creates an agency and a board that are much more functional than they are right now. Thank you, Councillor. Here's what I think we ought to do here. I'm going to take that as a close, I think, on the sub. I think what I'd like to do, if anybody wants to comment on that, let's do that. But I think we'd like to get the sub in, see where we are with that. We'll go to public comment so that commenters know what we're doing. Then we'll come back and go around for anything additional. But if there's anything from other councillors on the motion to for the fourth sub, Councillor Pena. Mr. President, I don't have anything, but I do have two amendments. So that let's get, okay, let's get the sub in and then we'll go back to your amendments first, then that's great. Councilors, other questions on the motion to substitute? The only question that I had in reference to um, the sub was, there was an item in there that stated that uh, the recommendation now is pushed to DOJ instead of the chief of police. Um, the only thing that concerns me here is that the chief of police has, he knows what the officers are going to go through in reference to the situation that they're involved in. Um, he has probably real life experience. Um, you have the fact that um, he knows what is going on in reference to the law. He knows what's going on in reference to SOPs. And most importantly, he knows what's going on to officer safety. Councilor, can I interrupt you and just say, sure. I think there's a miscommunication there. It doesn't go to DOJ. It goes to the Office of uh, Police Reform, which is the superintendent that does police discipline now. Okay, so is that a, is that within the Albuquerque Police Department? Yes, yes. Okay, because, They've okay. separated out those functions now, so the police okay. chief doesn't do discipline anymore. All righty, then that's fine. Yep. I understand. Yep. Councilor, other questions? All those in favor of the motion for the four substitutes say yes. Raise your hand. Yes. All those opposed? That matter carries unanimously. So if it's okay, counselors, sponsors, let's go to public comment really quickly. I'll have a few and then we'll come back for amendments and round table. Mr. Cornelius. Thank you, Mr. President. Our first speaker is Amir Chappelle or Chapel. Yeah, thank you. Uh, good evening, Council President, members of the council. Amir Chapel, longtime resident of District 6. Uh, at first reading of this uh, amendments in the ordinance, it looked like the city council was trying to walk down the autonomy of the CPOA. But after reading it about five more times, I understand some of the intent. So here to say, basically on page three, line 30 and 31, considering allowing the language for the director of the CPOA to work in collaboration with the city attorney's office to obtain independent counsel as opposed to just picking off the city legal's conflict list. Uh, on page four, line 17 to 22, there's language in there about community outreach. Striking language that's very specific about what community outreach is, what community outreach is minimizes and puts the city in a position where the subpar community outreach that it currently engages in is problematic. Subsequent to that, a provision about accountability and impartiality being removed is questionable. On page eight, line nine, they mentioned several years. 9-4-14C2H5, what is it? Several years, five or 10 years? Just being a little more specific and trying to understand what that is. Page nine, line 10 through 15, it may conflict with SOP 352 from APD, the policy development process and the timelines therein. Um, I have intimate knowledge of that policy as I worked on it. And so I wanna make sure that this SOP is, not, is in line with the department's policy. Also, um, on page 10, line 16, it refers to policy development committees. There, I don't know of any policy development committee at the department. Also, page 10, line 22, the city council and APD have six districts, six area commands. Why not six seats? Page 11 and line 12, line two, the background check, someone like myself would be excluded. I have the knowledge, the capability, and the competency to do the work. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Mr. Chapel. Up next, Deirdre Ewing. Good evening, uh, Mr. President, members of the council. I'm coming to you this evening 
as the most recent executive director of CPOA, asking you to please pass the amendments before you this evening. Uh, these amendments are the best option the city has to bring the city into compliance with the police oversight portions of the CASA. In IMR after IMR, the independent monitor has commented on the board's repeated failure to focus on its job at hand, primarily policy issues, audits, and uh, to a lesser extent appeals, because they keep getting bogged down in minutia of trying to micromanage the day-to-day -day of the agency. This, uh, this amendment strongly deals with that. Um, in the last week and a half, I've been rather distressed and concerned about some of the messaging I've been hearing out of the board, claiming that uh, this, these amendments somehow gut police oversight in Albuquerque. They do the exact opposite. It replaces the current ineffective board with a more focused and more professional board. It allows the uh, current agency, the professionals who focus on the day-to-day -day task of investigation that is at the heart of oversight, uh, to continue doing their job unimpeded by a board that sometimes gets a little focused on personal uh, issues and vendettas rather than on the task at hand. And it gives a bit more responsibility to the community policing councils, which have been widely recognized as a national example and continue to do good work in the city. I thank the co-sponsors for bringing forth this bill and clearly listening to the three directors, two of us permanent, one interim, who are run off by this board in a period of 15 months. I ask all of you to join Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Mr. President, that concludes comment. Thank you. And thank you to those who stuck around with us for that. All right, so we've got a few amendments. Uh, Councilor Pena, you spoke up earlier, so you're first. Thank you, Mr. President. I just want to say that public speakers should definitely be um, considered for the CPOA board. <laughs> um, Mr. Amar, was it Amar? Amar? Um, okay, so floor amendment number one to floor sub 02267. This is um, um, something that he spoke about, and this is community outreach. It was kind of deleted from, from the um, floor sub, so I'd like to kind of put it back in, but change the language a little bit. Um, Julia, did you want to just go ahead and I can read it, but you'd probably do a better job at it than I do. Uh, before you do, I want to be sure this is going to be the same amendment, Councillor. Yep, there we go. That's the one we're talking about first. Thank you. So floor amendment number one is going to relate to community outreach. Thank you. Uh, Mr. President, Councillor Pena, so this amendment uh, proposes to revert back to the original language of the ordinance as it currently stands. Uh, the floor substitute would strike out the language that is now underlined in the amendment, so it just puts it back to, to how it was originally. Is there a second? There's multiple. Um, so um, the reason is, I mean, on the CPC boards, this board, um, one of the issues, especially with the CASA, is that, you know, we always um, um, have stated that community outreach is important, and as you all know, on both these boards, we've had some issues in terms of really providing good outreach to, to the community, so I think it should, should remain in the legislation, so I would urge your support. Thank you. Councilor Peeble Court on that motion. Thank you, Mr. President. I'm just wondering if somebody can give um, a little bit of background on why it was removed. It was my understanding that um, past directors um, said that they really didn't feel that they had enough time to do that outreach. And so I agree that outreach is, to the community is vital, but I, I want to make sure that we're not setting up um, a new director when and if we find one to not be able to do a complete job. So if you could just give a little background. Mr. President, Councilor Feeblecorn, um, your recollection is accurate. The ordinance as it exists today um, includes this requirement for community outreach um, and actually includes even some more uh, specific language about um, the nature of the outreach that would need to be conducted very specifically um, by the director. The CPOA has had the authority to um, retain a community outreach person, but as we know, 
Um, as is the case uh, right now in our labor market in general and, and with the city, that position hasn't been filled in, in recent memory. And so the director um, was under an obligation under the ordinance to wear yet another hat, even, even beyond sort of the, the big hat that they already wear, managing the agency and doing investigations. So the idea was to um, eliminate some of the, the very specific requirements for outreach, but still uh, include a more general re uh, requirement that some level of outreach occur. Thank you, Mr. President. So there is a position funded within the CPOA that would do that kind of outreach if it were filled. Mr. President, uh, Councilor Feeblecorn, the CPOA um, has that, uh, yes, the, the ability to hire that position. I believe, I mean, the, the agency's been around now for about seven or eight years, and I believe that they have had a person do that at one point in history, um, but it's not a position that has been filled in recent memory. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. President. Councilors, other questions on the amendment? Councilor Bassan. Mr. President, I'm wondering, it, and I don't know if it would make a difference or not, to say instead of um, shall develop, implement, and from time to time amend as necessary a program of community outreach, would it make a difference to say a process for them to create a process so that it doesn't necessarily mean that they have to hire somebody to implement a program and actually operate a program, but to actually come up with a process and procedure for how they will make sure to do community outreach aimed at so soliciting public input from the broadest. I, and it might just, it might not be what you're looking for, but I wonder if that might be a middle ground. To the sponsor. Um, Mr. President, um, I mean, we can say a process, but they develop a process, but they don't implement the process. So that would be, that would be the issue, right? And so with the language in there, the fact that the, direct, the director is saying that they weren't able to do it, um, I mean, not hiring someone is, you know, I mean, it's not that it can't be done. It's just we need to hire somebody to make sure we fill that position and, and, and get it done so that we can really in, engage with the community the way um, this is all intended to be. Okay. Thank you. Councilors, other questions or discussion on the amendment? You're seeing none. All those in favor of amendment number one say yes. Raise your hand. Yes. Any opposed? Oh, I'm sorry. Councilor Lewis, did you have a comment there before? All those in favor of amendment number one, say yes, raise your hand. Yes. That matter carries unanimously. Oh, Councilor Jones is a no. Councilor, all those in no, say no. One, two, or two. Seven, two. Councilor Pena, you have another amendment? Thank you, um, Mr. President. I don't know if this one is more digestible, but just an issue for me. I just um, don't think people should have... Um, kind of a financial incentive to sit on a board. So this, um, I'll leave it to Julia to explain, but this would eliminate the um, payments to CPOA board members. Mr. President, uh, that's accurate. Uh, this would remove the portions of the bill that would provide for an honorarium for board members upon completion of both their initial training and then their required ongoing annual training, as well as um, a stipend for um, board members for attendance at regular meetings of the board. Um, that would be $100 per meeting, uh, not to exceed $200 per month per board member. So those two provisions would be removed. We need a second. Is there a second first? If Councilor Bassan seconds, and Councilor Bassan with the comment. Mr. President, uh, so some of the background on this, and honestly the stipend part I could deal without as well. Uh, the honorarium is, uh, the background on that is sort of the conversations that were had as in comparison with some of the other boards and commissions that exist, the amount of training involved yeah. in order to become a CPOA board member is quite a bit more significant. Um, so it wasn't really necessarily um, an incentive that, that I was looking for, more as a once they complete the training, then they can get that honorarium as... Um, for their, for their time and for their childcare, that was something that came up in the last uh, amendment uh, or the ordinance update that we did last year was some people don't volunteer for this board because they don't have somebody to watch their kid or to cook dinner or they have a work and so they can't make all of these additional trainings uh, because it is, is more challenging for them, which is actually part of the problem in some of the other parts of Albuquerque to the point where this was a way to say, well, if you are willing to serve and if you are willing to commit the time to it, then we are willing to find a way to have that middle ground to say that after the fact, 
and you complete the training and you were in compliance with the requirements, then, then we will make sure that you get compensated with that honorarium. Again, the stipend, I mean, there's plenty of volunteer boards that don't get paid to go every month to a meeting, so I'm fine leaving that in there, but I, I, I do like the idea of the honorarium to help compensate for those that need it more. Let me make a comment and I'll come back to sponsors, go around real quick. Just to comment yes, on um, Councillor Passan is, yeah, so, um, I mean, I, I think there's other boards like, you know, trying to get people to serve on, on District 3 just to serve on the library board. You know, it's just difficult and they have the same kind of issues. So for me, it, it's, it's just something that, you know, but um, if we broke them out into two different amendments, because this one is also um, not just for the training, but this would be to attend a meeting, right? So they would be for attending the meeting. So I think you mentioned we can, if we can take that out and then um, I would still keep this other amendment. Um, and if it failed, it failed. But I, um, I still, you know, knowing that it is a challenge and, you know, maybe we should change policy citywide about um, people being able to um, get compensation to serve on boards because I have such difficulty getting people in District 3, not only because we're checkerboard and they can't <laughs> to live in the city, but anyway, but just the fact that, um, that um, it's, um, it's difficult across the board. So for, that, for those reasons, so what I would do is I would withdraw my amendment and then re um, make a motion for um, the line two of this amendment, first of all. However staff, want, however staff wants to do it, we're just going to do section one of this amendment instead of section, section two, two at, first. at the sponsor's request. So I think mm -hmm. that's fine. Yeah. So um, my floor amendment number two, two would be um, the line two, and I would move approval of that one first. <laughs> Second. Okay. So only section two or line two, whatever that is, uh, with a second from Councilor Benton. Um, I'm going to recognize myself, and then I'll go to Councilor Ben for comment. We're good where we are. Okay. The, I agree with you, and I, I wanted to say exactly what you landed on, Councilor Pena. Um, this is one of those boards. I feel like EPC is one of those boards. We have a number of boards and commissions that are more than a quarterly check-in meeting um, that require lots of homework, lots of sacrificing of time. You've got to be here during business hours because you've got to be able to, in this one, and sometimes you have to go to APD, to review documents that can't leave the building. We heard from folks that this was for some board members at some part of the process, a 40 hour and then week job. Um, plus you have to do weekend trainings. Um, and we are trying to revise that to eliminate some of those extra requirements. And I like some of the other amendments, Lou, but you're exactly right. But all that said, um, it is wonderful to have people participate, but I think we should look at this as trying to set a new standard for boards and commissions um, and uh, compensate people for their time if they're willing to devote it to us instead of the Girl Scouts or the Boy Scouts or to work on, you know, working a second job or volunteering at a homeless shelter. Whatever it is, we should place value on that because we need them and mm -hmm. help take care of their kids and do all the things that, that Councilor Bassan rightly brought up. So for that reason, I love the stipend idea. Um, or the honorarium idea at those places um, because that is the extra training that goes into this that is a little more than being um, on one of the other boards. Um, I'm fine with the per meeting thing, but I don't, I agree with you. I, I think it probably won't pass, and so I'd be willing to support the sponsor's amendment here. Um, but I'd love to look at that for other boards as well. Uh, Councilor Benton. Yeah, I, I uh, support the, uh, <laughs> the amendment. Um, I just want to point out, Councillor Feeblecorn and I have a, an amendment that does reduce some of the hourly burden of the training in areas where we feel it's not necessarily that important to for the board to receive these training. That may affect whether we're at the right number here. I don't know. I'm not going to quibble over whether it should be 500 or 400 or something like that with that reduction, but that's just something to keep in mind. You know, maybe we see how it goes and, and see whether that's uh, the right the right number or not. <clears throat> I do think it's important to, to compensate for the serious amount of training that's re, uh, that's required, regardless of whether our amendment passes or not. 
Thank you. Uh, other counselors? I'm going to go to Councilor Grout because she hasn't spoken yet, and then we'll keep coming this way. Councilor Grout. Thank you, Mr. President. I think that um, a, an honorarium is very important. Um, I think the training is very important that these um, board members have. Um, this is one of the most important boards that we have. Um, they're, what they're reviewing is very serious. And they need to have the training on both sides. They need to know, understand what the officers are going through. They also need to have that background training for other, um, you know, conflicts and so forth. So, um, and, and it needs to be done. I don't think there should be any kind of um, reduction for it. I think that it's, um, we've taken that into consideration, the, the amount of um, time that they need. Um, and so I think that being compensated is important. Again, this is a very, very serious board, and the repercussions from their decisions um, are, are huge. So um, I think uh, I, I like um, giving them something, um, giving back to the community and being compensated for that. Thank you, ma'am. Councilor Feeblecorn. Thank you, Mr. President. I just, I agree with Councilor Grout. I think it's really important that we provide folks some amount of um, monetary compensation for the massive amount of time they're spending on this board and all others. And I'm, I'm with Councilor Davis on we should be rethinking that for all city um, boards and commissions. But particularly on this board, I think it's really important that we have folks from um, all socioeconomic levels participate and represent on this board. And I think when you have something that's this time consuming and we don't offer a stipend and you don't offer an honorarium, we're going to end up with a lot of folks who are privileged like me. I can take off time in the day to go to these meetings to do this work. Um, but not everyone is like that. And I, I just want to make sure that we're able to get representation from all folks in the city that want to serve on such an important board. Councilor Sanchez. Well, thank you, Mr. President. The only question that I have, and I think we should all look at this question pretty seriously is what do the voters and the taxpayers say about us um, paying people for being on their boards? I mean, I'd like to hear from them before we make the decision, um, even talk to, talk to some of these folks and see what they say. I mean, even our legislators don't even get paid. So, and they serve in Santa Fe. So I'm hoping that, um, I'd like to defer it even to, to, to see what the voters and the taxpayers have to say. Have we even gone there yet? Any other, <clears throat> any other questions, comments? Thank you, Councilor. Seeing none, Councilor Pena to close on amendment number, whatever this is now, two. Um, thank you, Mr. President. Yeah, I would agree with everyone, but I still think the same thing holds true for like the library board and, you know, same thing. So. Um, uh, I would support, I would withdraw the amendment um, for, for the training, I think, you know, but I really do think that we should revisit that in, in terms of all our boards and commissions, but really setting a precedence and paying a stipend for all the reasons you stated, um, Councilor Fiebercorn, I agree, but we have other very important boards that, you know, that people serve on and take time away from their young families and, you know, trying to balance work and everything. So if we could come to a place where we can get people paid to be on boards and commissions, I think that would that would be fantastic. I think it would alleviate some, some issues. So with, with that, you know, um, I wouldn't move the other one forward, but I would urge your support on um, the stipend for the monthly meeting. Councilors, all those in favor of amendment number two to remove the stipend, say yes and raise your hand. Yes. All those opposed? One, two, three, four. I'm missing somebody. Four, five. So that fails. Okay. Councilor Pena, do you want to move your other one? Um. No, I said I wouldn't, so I won't. Okay. So you're good. Anything else, Councilor Pena? No. That's it, that's right? it. Thank you. Councilor Feeblecorn and Benton. Thank you, Mr. President. I'll move floor amendment number three. Um, it's short, so I'll read it. On page 14, line 18, strike auto theft. On line 20, strike homicide. On line 21, strike horse mounted unit. On tw line 23, strike K9, um, and then renumber sub the subsections accordingly. 
the point behind this is really what we were just talking about, which is this board requires a vast amount of training. And while a lot of the training that's required is useful for the work that the CPOA board does, um, looking through the list, I'm not sure that understanding how the, how the horse mounted unit, for example, works and spending one and a half hours in that training is really beneficial to the, the end product that these folks are going to be doing on this important board. So with that, um, I'll move it to pass on floor amendment number three. A second from Councillor Ben. Councillors, any discussion on the amendment? Councillor Bassan. Mr. President, I just have a general question regarding the amount of training, and I, it might have escaped my mind, and maybe I just don't know it, but on average, do we know about how many hours of training it is to become fully trained to be a board member on the CPOA? Um, Councillor President, Councillor Bassan, I actually don't know that number. I do know, I mean, it's certainly been an ongoing issue with the board members asserting that it's too intensive. Um, but I haven't added up the no total number of hours. Councillor Feeblecorn has. We have, so, Mr. President, I mean to interrupt, but um, we have. Uh, Lots of smart people know. Somebody raise your hand or tell us. Yeah. I hear 33. Is there a. He's saying how in much the back. say it? I hear a 20. I hear a 33. I trust Chris. How old? 20 hours now. About 30 something in the new ordinance. Mr. President, it's 32.5 in the current ordinance, um, the floor subs that we, substitute that we just um, approved. Um, and it is all on page 14, and they are lined um, out. So it goes from everything from recruiting one hour, basic training one hour, field training and evaluation one hour, field services one hour. Response to re resistance, three hours. Crisis intervention and coast, three hours. Community policing, one hour. Impact investigations, one hour. Auto theft, one hour. Active listening and de-escalation, three hours. Homicide, three hours. Horse mounted unit, 1.5 hours. SWAT, 1.5 hours. Canine, 1.5 hours. Less lethal options, three hours. Reality-based training, part one, three hours. And reality-based training, part two, three hours. Councilor Bassan. Mr. President, yeah, I'm so sorry. I, I guess I didn't ask it, my question clearly, because I'm not, I'm not talking just about this. I mean, I'm in support of minimizing these. I totally agree that they don't need that. But I'm wondering, like, on the whole, what is the approximate amount of hours to become fully trained as a CPOA board member, including the NACOL conference and including learning from the agency how things work, how to conduct investigations, all of the things that are in there. What is the total number of hours in approximation? Mr. President, Councilor Bassan, this, this question has come up before. I, I wish that I had mentally noted it when we added it up you know, all once before. Um, my best recollection, uh, based on the cum cumulative initial training, which included the, the Civilian Police Academy, was somewhere in the neighborhood of 60 hours. It's pretty significant. Um, this, this would reduce it by eliminating some of those uh, civilian police academy requirements. Um, however, this is just the civilian police academy. And so there are a number of other training requirements, including ride-alongs, that would still contribute to the overall training of this board. Mr. President, thank you for that, Mr. Melendrez. And I, I completely agree. I just was curious because for some reason that is a question I guess I've never asked. I know that it's been a lot, which is where we had the discussion about honorariums. Uh, but thank you for educating me on that. Councilors, other questions on the amendment number three? Seeing none, all those in favor of amendment number three say yes. Raise your hand, please. One, two, three, four, all those opposed? Two. That matter carries. Do we have any other amendments on this? Okay, Councilors, we are back on the bill as amended. Uh, Councilor Bassan, Benton, People Corn, and Grout. Councilor Benton. Yeah, happy to hear other comments from, this isn't a close by any means, but, but uh, uh, yeah, I, I do think we've, uh, we keep, we keep uh, hammering away at this ordinance, and um, I think it's, it, we're going to continue to need to amend this ordinance, most likely. Uh, just the discussions tonight uh, indicate that, and, and, and from just how it's gone. 
and co-sponsors, and, and uh, this is a tough nut to crack. And, and I think we've, we've tried very hard. It's, it's not out of disrespect for, to any particular board member that, that present or past, but, um, but it hasn't worked. And uh, it does need a revamp. And, and unfortunately, that required the uh, dissolution of, of the current board, uh, who may reapply. Uh, those members, as long as they qualify under the new rules, may uh, reapply for the new, uh, the new uh, structure. So uh, um, I wanted to make those points and, and not have anyone think that we're shutting the door here and thinking everything's going to be great because it's, uh, it's been a learning process and it's going to continue to be one just as the whole CASA settlement and all the history that I think uh, Councillor Jones and I at least have been here for every bit of it. I think, uh, <laughs> I think uh, Councillor Lewis was here for a lot of it too. So uh, we're still sitting here talking about it years later and, and uh, this is our piece of, of the action, if you will, with regard to the CASA settlement and uh, big responsibility for this council and I appreciate the, the work of the co-sponsors on this. And uh, yeah, thank you. Let me go, Councillor Grout. I'm just going to go this way, Councillor Grout. And then we'll keep going. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, I know that this is not the first time there's been a reset with this, so this is not unique. Um, I'm going to read a few things. Council is responsible for making the policies that make sure that city is complying with the CASA and that APD has appropriate oversight from the agency and its board. I think this revised ordinance does a good job of clarifying the board's relationship to the police oversight agency and the agency's role in investigating police use of force. The current board, board has undertaken a big job and we thank them for their commitment. This new ordinance, we hope, clarifies that the volunteers on this board provide valuable review and input on police policies on behalf of the community and it assigns tracking and monitoring compliance with the CASA to an independent contract compliance officer. This ordinance simplifies the role of the CPOA board, and it also gives a greater role in policy review to our community policing councils. We urge your support. Councilor Sanchez. Thank you. As a former law enforcement officer, um, I saw how cumbersome the previous board um, was in terms of trying to deal with nine different individuals um, trying to fill the board. Um, it was really, really a difficult situation. Um, I've heard that I am probably the hardest interviewer um, on the board, so I urge some of these folks to, to, to reapply if they'd like. I'd also like to thank um, an individual that I asked to join the board. Uh, Mr. Greg Jackson, he has a lot of insight in reference to how the police work and how the board functioned. And so I'd just like to say thank you to him um, for serving. Also, um, when it comes to the popularity of the board within the police department, it's very, very um, difficult for the officers to um, have to have their cases um, put in front of the, in front of the board. And, uh, but it's very, very important that we do what's right to protect the citizens and also to protect the officers. So we need a fully functional um, board that understands the dynamics that go on. And I know we've worked with DOJ to make sure that we um, strengthen the board in terms of making sure that we don't uh, have these individuals um, run off um, into a rabbit hole, so to speak, or go into a different direction. So I think. We've done what the DOJ wants us to do, and I think we're gonna have a lot better functioning board once we get this board fully staffed. And I just wanna ask, are we ready to start staffing that board right now? How are we doing, Mr. Melendres, with that? Mr. President, uh, Councilor Sanchez, the recruitment for the board is ongoing. Um, you referenced earlier council interviews, and there are two two folks um, uh, sort of 
that have gone through that vetting process and that we're prepared to move forward and also scheduling interviews with additional folks to go through that process. Um, it's, it's a lengthy process, you know, as we tell the applicants that come through it, um, the, the significance and the intensity of the process is reflective of the importance of the job that they're volunteering to do. Um, however, um, I, I, I think that we could probably get folks processed through and, and have a, uh, at least a quorum on this board uh, by, by March if this goes forward because uh, we do continue ongoing enrolling recruitment and interviews for that board. Thank you, Mr. Melenders, and thank you for answering the, the time uh, table there. Um, you're saying more likely mid-March? Mr. President um, and Councilor Sanchez, the, the fact that I've given a date is making me yeah, nervous I get it. about that but it's, already. But, um, but yeah, I think that that is, that is totally doable with the process that we have. I mean, one, one of the issues that we run into is not um, lack of attention, but uh, because of the high intensity of the board, sometimes we go through a process of working with someone and then they realize it's not the right fit for them because they do have you know, somebody that they need to take care of or they have a job or something like that. So um, there is sort of an iterative process of educating people about the obligation and then reassuring that they still want to complete that. But um, our success with getting people through that process, I don't see why we wouldn't be able to have at least a quorum on this board by March. Thank you, Mr. Merlendris, and I hope that actually satisfies um, the community, uh, citizens of Albuquerque, and uh, the people that we're out here trying to protect. So that was my question. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Anything else from counselors? Let me say, I, I, oh, I'm sorry. Yep, go ahead. Thank you, Mr. President. Just a quick question from Mr. Melendres. Would someone be disqualified for having a, a felony in their background? Mr. President, Councilor Pena, um, there's no specific um, requirement or limitation uh, in this ordinance that would impose that. And the city's um, general requirement is that that is not a hard bar to service on any board. Um, that is a recent development that I think the city is, is pretty proud of in revamping its background check system um, so that it does not present any hard bars, but it's more of a, a sliding scale that depends on the recency of a particular incident and, and potentially its severity, but to the extent that you know somebody has an issue from years back and, and it was not something that was repeated, et cetera, then those folks um, are, are get, make it through the background check and would not have an issue. Mr. President, Mr. Melendez, thank you. Um, that was my understanding. I was, I was given different information, but it was my understanding that if you'd had a felony, you could still serve on the city board. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor. Let me recognize myself and close here, and then we'll go to the administration and Ms. Keefe, if anybody. I, I just want to say I agree. This has been a lot of work, um, and Councilor Feebleford has participated in a lot of the conversations and getting pieces of this together as well. Um, and the, the folks that I've heard from who are worried about what they perceive to be the elimination of the police oversight agency or the police oversight board and that mission, um, I, I share your concern. I was an advocate in the community before I joined when the counselors who were here were setting this up the first time. Um, we we're all part of that concern. That said, that's not what's happening here. What's happened, in my opinion, in my experience, is that original the, the agency piece, the professional, the director, the investigators, we keep funding that. We keep adding positions for outreach that need to be hired and done, data analysts to look at trends and get us information professional investigators who know how to do investigations and follow up on complaints. A lot of that work used to be done by the nine people or whoever showed up that week um, who set up here who were civilian volunteers and had to go through all this background and was asking them to do that. We've really professionalized the oversight investigation part. And through this process, I'm going to simplify this and so I'll ask the lawyers will correct me because I'll say it wrong. But really what happens here is if the outside investigators and the agent and the APD agree that somebody did something wrong and the discipline is correct, recommended discipline is right, to me there doesn't need to be a whole lot of hearing about that. There's a public notice, but there's no need to rehash it and reinvestigate it here because there's lots of other things to do. But that board is there to provide that backstop for somebody who disagrees, who thinks that we got it wrong, who thinks we have a wrong policy that impacts the whole city at large, that's really what we're doing. We're trying to say we want to keep an eye on the process. We want to keep an eye on the investigators, an eye on the agency, an eye on the department, 
Um, and that's what this does, but it was asking too much to ask citizen volunteers to manage a multi-million dollar agency and professional staff and expect them to keep that going every day at the highest level that absolutely must be done with this critical mission. And so now I think we have an agency and an oversight uh, process that gives us confidence um, and transparency on both sides. So we've got the watchers, and, and APD's familiar with this because they've got the force investigation teams and the outside force investigation teams, um, and we kind of have this here. Here's the complaint process, and now the board is the outside investigators watching the investigators. Um, and we're all sitting here with the new compliance officer to watch all of that process. I like the way this works. I think it just continues to reform and grow up as we do better in our job every day and, and check off those things that we're in compliance on. So I really appreciate everybody's work on this. Um, it's the next generation of what we needed to do, and I think we can do it well by appointing the right people. Uh, so thank you, and I urge your support. Uh, we'll start here. Ms. Coolanon, Mr. Melinders, anything we missed? Ms. Keefe, administration, anything here? Wow, all right. We did close on that. Oh, no. All right, counselors, anything further? All those in favor of 067 as amended, say yes. That matter carries unanimously. Congratulations. Councilor Pena, R70. Mr. President, I'd like to withdraw R70, even though I don't have it in front of me. <laughs> so there's a motion and a second to withdraw R70. This is the one requiring the transit security incident response plan. Thank you. <laughs> I found it. Well, there's a motion and a second. That's what we need. Counselors, any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor of withdrawal say yes. Raise your yeah. hand. Yes. Any opposed? That matter carries unanimously. All right, next up, counselors, we're going to do a slate of nuisance structures. We are watching the clock a little bit, but we're going to see how far we can get before we have to extend this. So uh, the first one is R80. Uh, we have our owner and uh, and translator here, but first I will move R80, which is a nuisance substandard dwelling or structure in need of abatement at 629 San Mateo Southeast. Well, counselors, what I intend to ask for tonight is a deferral for 30 days if the planning department is willing to work with us on this. Um, the owner has had, we've had some trouble contacting the owner over time, uh, but due diligence by the planning department and, and cooperation, we've been able to find the owner and they've started to have some positive conversations. Um, and so I'm going to make a motion for a 30-day uh, deferral on this matter. But I want to make clear, and, and thank you so much, Ms. Juwasade. Is that close? Sorry, thank you. Um, this is a one-time 30-day, we've talked about this, a, a one-time deferral that I would make to give you some time to come up with a plan and continue to work. Um, and so my intent would be a 30-day deferral if we have a second. So we have a second from Councilor Feeble Corn. Thank you. Mr. Uh, Sada, yes, ma'am. Welcome. Point of privilege. Is it possible for us to extend our time? Um, yeah. Our, our uh, client is actually requested for a translator uh, provided by the city of Alton. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Hodge, welcome and thank you for being our translator today. Thank you, President Pat Davis. And Vice President Gross and Ambusaba, and thank you for giving me a chance to present myself. Could you, Ms. Hodge, could you help her speak into the microphone just a little? Oh, um, thank you for giving me a chance to improve my property. I didn't know that it'd be that bad. This morning I went there and took a picture because it get burned on Monday. It, get, it make it get worse for what I plan to do. I already contact uh, the junk remover, okay. and I contact um, several people that, but I haven't get the result yet, but he told me he's gonna contact me today, because he only have time to go at 12 o'clock. But what I plan to do clean it up first and uh, fix the window, fix the door, fix whatever I need, and then also fix the fence with what I'm afraid 
To fix the fence, I did it before many times, and it only lasts a week. They cut, I don't know where they get the tool to, to, to cut all the chingli fence, cut the, the, the chains that I put the lock, mm -hmm. they chain to the own new lock, and uh, I, I uh, sent some of my friends to go because I'm afraid. And then my friend came back to me and said, Busaba, don't go nearby, they have guns. Yes. And that's why I, I only drive by. I don't go there. And, uh, Thank you. And uh, I'm willing to do anything, you know. Uh, I couldn't think the right way. Mrs. Thank you. Yes, ma'am, would you introduce yourself? My just name is Tiki Hodges. I'm a justice interpreter, a <coughs> system interpreter. Thank you. And uh, this is my first time here because this is totally different than the court that yes. I worked before. So two minutes, I, I can't make it. Thank, thank you for being here. We thank Ms. Ciarza for helping us with the uh, Asian American Business Association to help us find uh, a translator to do that. Uh, thank you. Would you mind have a seat just a minute? I want to let the director speak and then we'll come back and speak with you. Uh, Mr. President and Council Members, Alan Varela, Director of the Planning Department. Our Code Enforcement Division works very hard to rid the city of major problem properties that present a danger to the citizenry. Uh, and in this case, even a danger to the owner, as you just heard, afraid to go there. Uh, the property continually getting broken into. Uh, a couple days ago, half of it burnt down. We do not feel that it is anywhere close to being something that is reparable. And so if you do defer for 30 days, I, I, I'm glad that you emphasized the reality that we'll be back in 30 days. And if some miracle hasn't happened, then uh, we're going to have to proceed with the with a demolition resolution here. Uh, this property has uh, uh, had code enforcement go out 63 times in the last two and a half years. There have been over 23 calls for the police department to go out there as well. Uh, there have been seven calls for the fire rescue department and there have been three fires at the property. And so this is uh, not simply a matter of a property that we feel is going to be able to be fixed up uh, and uh, we do want to let you know we'll be ready to come back and proceed with what needs to be done to protect the city of Albuquerque. Thank you. Thank you, Director. Um, uh, uh, yes, Councilor Pena. Um, thank you, Mr. President. I just wanted to ask, and this is a question that I had been wanting to ask just because we had passed during, I think, last budget cycle, we had put a million dollars to try because I kind of on principle vote against this because we're here struggling with um, people um, maintaining their houses, um, not maintaining, um, um, ho our housing shortage and people not being able to access house housing. And, you know, I, I kept saying that we didn't have a program in place at the city of Albuquerque to help people to fix their houses or to, um, so we put in a million dollars last year during the budget. I know HomeWise was awarded. Do you work, um, Director, with HomeWise to, help people um, so that they can get the funding that we allocated to um, make home repairs? And uh, President Davis and uh, Councillor Pena, that would be administered, I believe, by the Family and Community Services Department, um, possibly with some assistance from the Senior Affairs Department. That is not something that's done through the Planning Department. Uh, I do want to reemphasize again that this property would not be amenable to repair. This is a caving in, falling down, uh, half burnt up property. And so many times in cases like this and the others that you're going to hear about tonight, it is much more economical to just scrape it and build from scratch. Uh, you, you can't prop up something that it does not meet any codes whatsoever and that it's getting ready to fall down. You'll spend a lot more time and money trying to do that than simply starting from scratch in such a, such a piece of property. Mr. President, so, so I understand that in this situation is a little different, right? But when we have, um, you know, people coming to us, I think that it should, um, and I think maybe we should meet with HomeWise and figure out how we um, do this process because I think it should go through the planning department. So, because when some people are having their houses um, condemned, 
um, the planning department should be able to provide them or send them the direction of family and community to see if there's money available to help make those repairs to their home. This obviously sounds like it's it's beyond that, um, but um, um, so you know, I just wanted to make that comment because I know that we had put that money in um, to do precisely that, and it sounds like it's not working the way maybe um, I had envisioned it, or maybe the rest of the council had envisioned it. So, and, and, and Mr. President, uh, Councilor Pena, if I could please address that, we do work with the other departments to provide those referrals to them, and my understanding is that they do use that money where it makes sense to use the money to help people. But we, we certainly do point them in the right direction. We've had several instances where uh, we have uh, had people interface with senior affairs or with family and community services to try to get repairs uh, done on their property. So in the last year, have you referred this lady to um, To senior, Homewise? I have, to home, me? No, we, we refer them to the department that contracts with Homeways. So I've referred to people to senior affairs and to family and community services. Okay. But no, planning planning does not uh, manage the contract with homeowners. Correct, homes. correct. Yes, yes. But yes, we have referred them to our sister departments who have then uh, followed through on that. Yes. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Thank you, Councilor Pena. That's an important piece. I, I do want to point out this is a commercial property, and so I'm not sure it would apply in this case, but it is an important right. one, and I would love to know before we get to budget if we have used that appropriately. Right. And if we need some more. I mean, right. We have tons of money, so yeah. we should do that. Um, let me address really quickly, Ms. Jusuave. So we, we want to see you back in a month if, if everybody agrees, but there are some folks that want to help. So we've put you in contact with um, Commander Languet um, from APD who's the Asian American liaison, who's gonna help get some police officers there to get those people off your property so you can walk through it safely. Um, yeah, so he'll help you get over there, get safely, and Ms. Ciarza and my office can help. Yeah, okay. you know, yes. uh, uh, sometimes I show up and they say, he got permission, he got permission from the owner of the property, it's a man. But they don't <laughs> think a woman can own property, you right. know? And they, they don't have any respect to me at yes, all. And I, I feel scared because they're not one people. Right. Sometimes seven of them, sometimes three of them, sometimes four of them. And uh, it's they, they look really mean <laughs> to me, you know? Even though they they, they trespass. They should know I have the sign. Yes. And uh, I don't know what else to do. I just tell the officer, do what you have to do. Yeah. And, it, you know? It may, I, I want to say we, we have a, some other things to do, but we have and, a lot of respect for you. You are well and, respected and, in the Thai community for your business and your work. Yes. And we I, thank you. But I, I, I help, think, I, I even help homeless yes, for I more know. than 20, 10 years. So, what you need to speak with some folks and we'll get you some folks to help you but if you can't fix the building somebody's going to have to tear it down and you have to do it or the city will do it but then you can sell it so they're going to help you figure that out but we'll work on that and we'll be back to figure that out in a few weeks okay. thank you christo mr president Yes, I Councilor just, Sanchez. I just want to make sure that, um, Brandon, that you um, make sure you talk to, uh, um, I can't remember your name, ma'am, Miss? Jusawasti. Jusawasti? Yes. You can call me Busaba. Busaba? Busaba. Easier. Okay, I'm not sure what you said. Busaba. Busaba? Yes. Okay, Mrs. Busaba, I just want to make sure that you get with Brandon, because Brandon might have a resource for you. We just recently met with uh, some folks that might be able to help you in reference to your situation as well. Um, so Brandon will get some information and, and um, from you, and then we'll try to direct you to um, a place where we can, where they might be able to help out. And then um, we also have, you know, we just want to make sure. I mean, we have an immigrant, we have uh, we have minority. And we have a woman here that needs some help. And 
And you know, that's one of the things that we need to do is we need to make sure that we help all of our all of our communities um, um, to make sure that uh, things are getting taken care of. But I think the deferral is going to really, really help um, her situation yeah, a lot. I, I willing to do anything, but because I live by myself, you know, I have to do whatever to take care of me and my business. Get hurt from COVID in the last over two years, and yes. I struggle, but I still fight for my life. You know? Thank you. Thank you so much, counselors. The motion on the table is for a deferral for thirty days. Is there any other discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor say yes. Yes. Any opposed? No, that carries unanimously. Thank you. And we'll see you next. We'll see you in a few days. <coughs> Counselors, next up is uh, R81. This is a new substandard dwelling in need of abatement at 158 Trauma Northeast within the city that is so ruined, dilapidated, and damaged that it is a menace. I move a due pass. I have a second from Counselor Grout, Vice President Grout. I, we don't have any public comment on this. Uh, director, is there anything from the planning department beyond what's in the notes? Can, uh, can, you, can you hear me? Yeah. Oh, well, no. We can, but they can't, so we got to go through this whole thing. Just, just, just a brief summary to let you know. Uh, we appreciate the uh, the resolution, and we certainly urge uh, a pass on it. Code enforcement has been out there over 120 times. Uh, since this property came to our attention in June of 2019, APD has had uh, 26 calls for service out there. Fire Rescue has been out there six times alone just in the last 12 months. Uh, and there have been uh, uh, three fires in this property as well. Thank you. Thank you. Council Payton. So, Mr. President, and so, Director, so have you um, spoke with the owners? Is this residential? And uh, Mr. President and Councillor Pena, I'm really glad you asked that particular question. And the answer is the owner has been untraceable. Uh, we had learned uh, that the uh, owner of record, a, a Mr. Gonzalez, uh, hasn't been seen by neighbors in approximately three years. Uh, they believe he's passed away. We've been unable to, uh, without a date of birth, uh, get confirmation from the Vital Statistics Bureau on that. Uh, we're seeing a pattern now in Albuquerque, I think maybe it's due to the age of the city, to where there are abandoned properties with untraceable owners. And so we're going through the legal requirements for the, uh, make sure that we provide the requisite due process and the notice, but we're starting to see that more and more. As a matter of fact, the other two resolutions that you're gonna see this evening um, are similar as well. Thank you. You're welcome. Mr. President, it is residential and it's corner of Domingo and Chama, yep. and it is boarded up. It's well known. Council Bassan. Mr. President, Director Varela, you know, it if you can please include some images, we used to get those included in our update and in the report. I think that it does help us, at least it helps me, um, be able to kind of relate to where these are and, and what it's doing to the community and the neighborhoods around it. So when we get these, if we can have those included, that would be awesome. And, and Mr. President, Councilor Bassan, those were supposed to be included. The packet that I had uh, had pictures. I don't know why they didn't make it into the uh, the council packet, at least as an attachment to the resolution. Yeah. Thanks. Councilors, other questions on R81? Seeing none, all those in favor say yes. Raise your hand. Yes. Yes. As all those opposed? Yes. Carries H1. Councilors, next up, Councilor Bassan, R83. And then um, we're watching the clock too, so. Mr. President, R83 is amending the adopted capital implementation program of the city of Albuquerque by approving new projects, supplementing current appropriations, and changing the scope of existing projects. I move it to pass. Second. Several, Councilor Grout, go ahead. Mr. President, there's several amendments in the iPad. I don't know which order you'd like to take them. Sponsor's request. Mr. President, I'd like to move uh, amendment, floor amendment number one. This is by request on page six, delete lines 14 through 23. Uh, the explanation is this, amend, this amendment removes the appropriation for the New Mexico State Law Enforcement Recruitment Fund grant award from the CIP cleanup bill as it will be appropriated instead to the Law Enforcement Protection Fund 280 through the budget cleanup bill R2291. Funding will be appropriated by year as follows. I, I move floor amendment number one. 
a second from Councillor Jones. Councillor Bassan, anything further? Um, if the council has any questions of administration, I'd be happy to entertain them to explain it and say further, but I, it seems pretty clear to me. Great. Councillors, any questions? Anything from the administration? Seeing none, all those in favor for amendment number one, Councillor Bassan, say yes. 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 That matter carries unanimously. Councillor, you have another one, I believe? Mr. President, I do. Floor amendment number, we'll call it two because it is two. Thank you, Mr. President. I'd like to move floor amendment number two. This is also by request on page six after line 18, insert the following. Section four, that the following federal grant projects approved by the end of the year omnibus funding are hereby authorized. It's the Rail Spur Violence Intervention Program Facilities and Equipment Substance Use Services Cell Site Simulators Technology Tools and Smart Camera. This appropriates $1,071,000 of federal funds secured by Senator Heinrich. Multiple seconds, the clerk's choice. Can I ask a brief question of the administration? This is by request. The, this is the CIP, the capital program, but is the violence inter intervention program a capital allocation from the feds? Or is this the, the build out of the Gibson office or should this be in the mid-year with that other amendment? Mr. President and, um, and counselors, the violence intervention program is, is really a, a operational funding uh, stream. Yeah. Um, I think the, the idea here was that uh, we have a cleanup bill that we can include it in, but it would obviously fit well with uh, other cleanup that's before the council. So it's, it's really your prerogative. As long as it's legal, it's fine. I know we have another mid-year, so I just don't want somebody to come back and make us redo all this, which is what y'all usually do when we do it wrong, so. Uh, Mr. President, I think it's uh, perfectly legal. It's no due process from the council. We need violence interruption, so let's do it. Sure. Councilor's floor amendment number two. Any other discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor say yes. 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 Any opposed? That matter carries. That. Mr. President, I do have one more. Go ahead. Mr. President, I would like to move floor amendment number three. On page two after line 25, insert the following. Wyoming Boulevard, Alameda to Florence, trans tax 341. The scope is expanded to plan, design, construct, and acquire right-of-way on San Pedro Road from Alameda Boulevard to Paseo del Norte. This is something in our district, in my district, that uh, I had some funding for Wyoming, but I wanted to move it to San Pedro so I could actually get moving on a real project that's, that can happen, rather than sitting on partial funds for two projects that may take forever to get implemented. I urge your support. Is there a second? Several. Thank you. Councilors, any discussion on the amendment? All those in favor say yes. Yeah. Yes. Any opposed? Councilor Bassan, that's your three. Great. Anything else? Mr. President, there are other amendments in the iPad. I think Councilor Pena has yeah, one. Yeah, she has one. Okay. Uh, Mr. Blinders, our rules say 1030. We need to extend time. So I'm going to make a motion to extend our meeting until 11 p.m. We may not need it all. I don't think we do, but just to make it easy. Second. I have a second for Councilor Ben. Any discussion? All those in favor say yes. Yeah. Any opposed? All right. Here we go. Councilor Pena. Number four. Thank you, Mr. President. Mine are numbered um, incorrectly, and I have one on the iPad and one in here, but I only thought I had one, so I'm just going to read the one I have in my hand. So this would be for floor amendment number four. Is that correct? Yes, it would be okay. Four. Um, on page two, um, after line 21, insert the following: De Vargas Road improvements, 305. The scope is expanded to. Plan, design, um, construct, and acquire right away on 88th and Benavides intersection. On page two, after line 27, insert the following 98th and Gibson intersection improvements, uh, appropriating federal surface. So, without reading the whole thing, it just um, moves general obligation funds to from a postponed project to complete the build out of 98th. Basically, that's what it does. And it transfers that money. And so that it gives us a total of um, 1 million seven. They're both in my district. And a second from Councillor Brisson. Anything from the administration? Any other call? <clears throat> All of those in favor say yes. Yes. Any opposed? Floor amendment number four is approved unanimously. Do we have another amendment, Councillor Pena, or is that just um, two different versions? Let me see if this is. So I don't know who. Um, Jesse. Is this the same amendment? It looks like it's the same amendment. There's two amendments in the iPad and they look similar. Mr. I just Benice. want to make sure that. Mr. Benice, I don't have any others. So if you have it, would you help me? No, it looks. 
It looks different. Mr. Okay. President, yeah. there's one in there that says Pena, but it, I think it's the approved one from FGO. Is that the one you're looking at? Oh, or okay. no. This is the one that's already been created. Okay. okay. Great. Thanks. You just don't want to have to come back. So. Councilor Bassan, I know this is by request, but we are back on R83 as four times amended. Mr. President, I urge your support. Councilors, any questions? Seeing none, all those in favor say yes, raise your hand. Yes. yes. That matter carries unanimously. Thank you, Councilors. Next up, uh, Councilor Benton, R84. Hey, Mr. President, uh, nuisance substand or uh, dwelling or structure in need of abatement at 1301 Gerald Avenue. I believe this should be, uh, yeah, it is. Gerald Avenue Southeast within the city limits of Albuquerque, so ruin, damaged, et cetera, required to be removed. I move a due pass. Second. Motion and a second from Councilor Jones. Councilor Benton, or the director, which will be second. And I'll ask the director or uh, to come up. Uh, director Varela can tell us about this property. Yes, uh, thank you. Uh, Mr. President and Councillor Benton, this particular property is at 1301 Gerald Avenue Southeast. Uh, it has been on our radar uh, with a first notice of uh, a violation and order issued on 623 of 21, so uh, approximately a year and a half, going on, going on a couple of years. Uh, code enforcement has been out there uh, 80 times. APD has had 17 calls for service at that property. Uh, fire rescue has been out there twice for fires. Uh, this particular property has been boarded up 20 times at uh, substantial cost to, to the city um, and uh, cleaned up uh, six times as well. And so this property is well beyond repair uh, due to just inattention for years and years. And we would ask that the resolution be passed, please. Thank you, Councilor Benton. Um, this is a residential property, right? Correct. I'll ask. Councilor Pena's questions for her. I, I share her concern about, about these residential properties, and, and I know, you know, I haven't, I haven't looked at the, the property or anything, but, uh, but I have heard about it from the Neighborhood Association as being a nuisance. Um, but, you know, in general terms, just to follow along with, with what Councilor Pena was talking about, um, the HomeWise program is great, but that's probably not the answer to a lot of these properties to me and the question I keep answering or trying to answer and never have the answer for constituents who ask about them is uh, the question is why can't the city just condemn the property for a public purpose which would be to eliminate the nuisance and rehabilitate the property you know even if it's gutting it all the way down to stripping it down to the bare walls etc uh, and uh, offer it for resale as affordable housing or some kind of public, you know, benefit purpose. Is that something that's ever been discussed, Director? And, and Mr. President and Councillor Benton, as a matter of fact, your, your timing is impeccable on that. We're working with legal to make sure that state statutes allow us, for example, in a case like this, you have a lot that when it's all scraped maybe is worth Forty forty-five thousand dollars due to the area that it's in. It's not a very large lot. Uh, the demolition may run thirty thirty-five thousand dollars, and so the amount of the lien is almost the value of the property. The city in the past has not foreclosed on those large liens. Uh, they have always waited until the seller is trying to sell the property, and then the lien has to be paid off. This is another one of those situations, uh, Mr. President and Councillor Benton and Councillor Pena where uh, it's an absentee missing owner. Uh, we provide all the required legal notices. We even publish in the newspaper once a resolution is passed. And uh, this, I believe, along with a couple others, may be our test cases for going through the actual foreclosure process. Uh, to my understanding, there's a nine-month redemption process. So we would scrape the property, um, go to district court, seek title of that property, hold on to the property for the required redemption process, crossing our fingers and hoping that some error uh, or, or owner, you know, steps forward and says, I'll take it and, and puts it back into good use for us. And if not, then we're going to see if we can get title to it, uh, as you said, for public purpose. And then at that point, we would put it up, either put it into the MRA program, perhaps, uh, as a redevelopment, where we provide some incentives and maybe some subsidies for somebody to come in and, 
and do something with it, or at least to get it get it sold. There, there are many companies out there who I think if the price point was right, uh, would pick up would pick up properties and, and build a, a house or even better, uh, if we get our housing package through the IDO, build a duplex on there or a house in a casita. And that's really what we need rather than more single family residential properties. I mean, it's a wonderful neighborhood. It's a, it's a stable neighborhood. There's some outlier properties within it. And uh, you know, I've been around, I guess, long enough that a couple of times I've tried to intervene in these processes and try to somehow bail them out. I mean, I, I remember a wonderful historic property on Borellis Road <laughs> That we scraped, and uh, you know, I guess somebody's doing something with it at this point. But it, it actually had some historic value that that if we could have intervened, it might have been saved, and they still could have built some other houses on that property. But um, I'm really interested in that, and, and maybe Councilor Pena and I can just you know meet with you and, and really understand this and see how we could help, or you know, what sort of programs through. There's still. Uh, through our housing programs and try to do something innovative here. And, and Mr. President, uh, Councilor Britton, uh, we would welcome that opportunity to do some creative thinking on it and try to get these uh, properties back into, uh, into, into use. In the meantime, I think this, uh, this one has to go. So I'm going to move a due pass. And if I can just jump in and just make a comment, um, Mr. President. Uh, just to say that I agree with uh, Councillor Benton, I'd love to have that discussion because there's a property that was um, by my aunt's former house, um, a really nice, charming little house, and it had just been abandoned, and you guys ended up um, demolishing it, and now there's encampments there. So it really kind of deceived the purpose, right, because it, it's still a nuisance. So if we can do something like this to help, you know, salvage not just the house, but provide another opportunity for home ownership, and then also make sure the neighborhood um, is preserved because, like I said, this one example that I give, it just didn't do anything to, to help. And, and Mr. President, Councilor Pena, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm aware of some properties like that. With, with, uh, we had one where we demolished a couple of duplexes in a problem neighborhood. The, the neighborhood actually was out there in their lawn chairs watching it get demolished. Uh, they were they were cheering. They were happy because of all the, the gunshots and the drug use and the and the crime that was taking place in the property. Uh, we scraped a lot, and people then started just taking the crime outdoors instead of indoors, which makes it easier to detect and to uh, <laughs> to deal with. But um, you know, absent emergency fencing uh, or other measures like that, which uh, actually the council could help us with right now. We all know that there's a three foot fence height limitation in Albuquerque. If that was raised to five or six feet uh, for a situation like that, I think possibly we could put a fence up around there that would prevent a lot of that from, from happening. Thank you. Interruption. I supported that amendment. <laughs> <laughs> and Director Varela knows I don't. So here we go. Now, if there's anything else on that matter for R84. No, thank All those in favor say yes. 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 Any opposed? Eight to one. Counselors, we're going to do something really quickly uh, in our haste to, to do all the things. Ms. Ciarza had signed up uh, with our previous speaker on 080, which is the property on San Mateo. We mistakenly believe that Ms. Ciarza was here uh, as an assistant, but she also uh, signed up for speech, so we're going to allow her to do that uh, for her two minutes really quickly. Christelle, thank you for joining us, and I apologize earlier for skipping you. I misunderstood your role today. You've been so helpful. I don't want to. President Davis, um, members of the council, thank you so much. I really appreciate the time and the opportunity. For those of you who don't know who I am, my name is Crystal Ciarza. I'm a business owner here in Albuquerque, but I actually founded the Asian Business Collaborative. We are a nonprofit dedicated to small business support for Asian Americans in a cultural competent way. Um, the goal of us being here today is that, um, thanks to Councilor Davis's community, um, community of support, he um, and his team had introduced us to Busaba, and um, we understand that this property actually is a representative of her way of life as a business owner, and it is a classic story of the American dream. Uh, this is an asset, and her, one of her only few assets. She currently owns a restaurant on Carlisle and Indian School, and her rent is only $2,200 with one employee herself. 
Our, our organization barely was a concept during the pandemic at the height of the pandemic to be specific. So she received no funding, no PPP, none of the small business grants, didn't understand what the New Mexico Finance Authority and EIDL loans are. So this is a critical, this is a critical time for us to step in and we do appreciate the deferment. But here's the challenge that I wanted to bring up, which is why I stubbornly fought for my time. Um, the most important thing is that um, we are partially funded by Albuquerque Economic Development and we're grateful for the earmark on their budget. But one of the things that we've seen perpetually is that some of our departments accidentally exclude our Asian community when it comes to conversations about compliance. We saw her letter that she had received. Of course, you wouldn't have known, but this is not in her native language. We've seen environmental health fix multiple issues with their language access because our Asian business owners can't understand what the environmental health form simply says, so we translated it for them and we offered it to Asian businesses. So I ask to, to, to sincerely look at all of the departments and their language access. Thank you so much. Thank you, Priscilla. We appreciate it. You've done amazing work in advocacy mm -hmm. and we appreciate your, your partnership with the city and we gotta do more. Sorry, Councilor, thank you. And thank you for being patient and sticking around with us tonight. Councilors, next up is R85, Councilor Benton on Lombardi Road. Councilor Benton, uh, R85, nuisance substandard dwelling or structure in need of abatement at 3709 Lombardi Road Northwest, 87105, also known as 3711 Lombardi Road Northwest, 87105 within the city limits, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, that is to be required to be removed. I move a due pass. Second. Uh, director. And, and this one might have a happy ending uh, after all. Uh, the department uh, has been in contact now with the owner of this one. The owner was an absentee owner out of California and has stated that uh, she is working with a group to uh, demolish the properties herself and actually create a community garden, I believe, for, uh, for at-need uh, or at-risk at women. And so the department uh, would respectfully request the, if the Mr. President and uh, Councillor Benton, uh, if you would consider a 30-day deferral to see if this actually materializes. All right, thank you. I'll move a 30-day deferral. Motion and a second from Councillor Lewis on the 30-day deferral. Councillors, any other discussion? Uh, Councillor Sanchez. I have a quick question. I'm, I'm real familiar with Lombardi. I grew up in that area. And um, right behind that address, there is a massive open field lot. Is that associated with that property as well? Do you know? I'm not sure, but this property. I mean, there's enough room there to build an elementary yeah. school in that area. Yeah, yeah <laughs> it's and, just uh, really big. And I'm, I'm sorry. Uh, and uh, President Davis and, and Councillor Sanchez. It might be, but I'm not positive. This property actually has two structures on it. I was looking at it through the uh, you know Google Maps today, and there is a large filled area there. So it, it, it may be. Thank you. And those properties have been like that for quite some time, years, I think. And, uh, and Council President Davis and uh, Councilor Louis Sanchez, yes. Uh, code enforcement has been out to the, this address uh, 209 times. Uh, APD's been out there 13 times. AFR's been out there once for a fire. And this one also has been uh, boarded up or reboarded up to the tune of 19 times at the, uh, at the cost of the taxpayers. Thank you. Councilors, other discussion? Councilor Ben. Right. You want 30, a uh, motion for a 30-day deferral. And a motion and a second for a 30-day deferral. Councilors, any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor, I'm sorry, all in favor say yes. Yes. That matter carries unanimously. We'll see it again. Councilors, uh, R94. Mr. President, R94 is a floor substitute approving and authorizing the acceptance of grant funds from U.S. Department of Treasury and providing an appropriation to the Parks and Recreation Department in fiscal year 2023. I move a due pass. Mr. President, I would, I mean, Director Simon stayed this whole time. If he wants to say anything, I definitely invite him over here to do so. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but at the same time, I, I mean, I'm always a fan of grant funds being used in Albuquerque. So I, I would definitely urge your support. Thank you, Councilors. Any discussion? 
Seeing none, all those in favor are 80. 94 say yes. Yes. Any opposed? That matter carries unanimously. Counselors, we made a boo-boo. We're going to go back really quickly to your favorite topic tonight. Uh, Mr. Melinda, as we explain really quickly what we need to do just to be sure we tidy up the record. Mr. President, yes. On 067, which the council voted on um, earlier tonight, it was item D, uh, we, we should have done a rule suspension because that item was, was uh, substituted tonight. And so in order to get final action on that, um, the council should have gone through the motion of suspending the rule. The item passed unanimously, so that sort of fixes it. But just to um, clear the record, uh, I think it'd be best for someone to move for a rule suspension. We'll take a vote on that, uh, and then we'll be done. So Vice President Grout moves a rule suspension to allow us to vote on 067 tonight, as if we haven't already. We have a second from Councilor Bassan. Any discussion? All those in favor say yes. Yes. That matter carries unanimously. We're good? Mr. Melinda, is that covers us? Okay. Mr. President, yes, thank you. Thank you, and my apologies for, for not catching that as earlier. Uh, next up we have Councilors Benton, Jones, Feeblecorn, RA1. Thank you, Councilor Benton. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, RA1 is amending Article 1, Section 10 of the City Council Rules of Procedure relating to attendance. I move a due pass. There's a motion and a second, Councilor Benton. And, um, uh, let's see, I, I think you have an amendment. There, right. There's an amendment, I believe, from uh, Councilor Bassan. Councilor Bassan. Mr. President, I would like to move amendment number one, and honestly, uh, just to simplify it, I would like to move this amendment, and it's just to strike seven days. On page one, line 10, strike the words seven days. And I say that because I know when I had to attend via Zoom and everyone was here in full council, it was because I had COVID, and I didn't know I wouldn't be I wouldn't have had seven days notice to be able to communicate that to the president so I think as long as advance notice is provided to the president for each occurrence they can attend virtually we can attend virtually uh, up to five times per year if the council is in person um, just I would like to urge your support to strike seven days I'll, I'll second that but I want to ask a question of staff on that just as far as the Logistics of when a counselor uh, wants to exercise their the ability to do this. Um, how would 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 just an immediate notice or very short? I know that I know that with a. Um, I, I guess we're equipped to do this now with, with Zoom. Is that that's well, really my question, Mr. President, Councilor Benton? Yes. So um, all of our meetings now. Are, are hybrid when we're in council chambers and we have the ability to uh, have people in as long as our um, we're not having any technical glitch which we've been successful with not having too many lately um, we'll be able to add somebody onto our meeting at any time really that's uh, you know we get people coming in who are signing up to speak and coming in for their item and then jumping out so um, as long as we know to look for that person in the queue before the meeting we can let them in as an attendee. As far as staffing the actual meeting, the only change that it makes um, for the president, obviously, is to is to need to, the need to to be more mindful of the monitors and that person jumping in. And then for voting, um, every time we have a virtual participant, we would need to do a roll call voting, but we we can be prepared to do that at any time as well. Thank you, <laughs> Councilor Sanchez. Thank you. I'd just like to ask the sponsors a question: as the why five days if you if you hit nine times five that's 45 days that uh, someone's not going to be in in city council chambers up to 45 days so it could be it, it could actually end up that way i just think five days is a little bit much um two or three days would probably be a little more um, accurate in terms of the fact that we need to be here for the public I'm just uh, making that comment and I hear a couple of comments. I, I will say, I don't know how we enforce this anyway. Um, like, if you're not here, you're not here. You're excused. If you want to be virtual, I'm not sure we would tell somebody they couldn't. Um, but I, I do understand there needs to be an expectation. But uh, Councilor Jones. Thank you, Mr. President. I think um, our audience watches us on Zoom. If we're on Zoom, if we're, we're up there, they'll see us whether we are there here or they are, or we're live or they're live. It's, it's going to be broadcast everywhere immediately, in real time. 
I don't think it makes a difference, Mr. Sanchez. In fact, I think a lot of people will be very pleased not to have to come meet with us or see us. So uh, I think it's the way the world is going now. You can see by the meetings that we have uh, how many of them now are better accepted via Zoom than they are in person. So we don't get an audience anymore. We don't, it's, it's the way the world is. And I'm older than all of you, and it seems wrong to me, but it's the way it is. <laughs> <laughs> And, and so I don't think it's going to cause any harm. Okay, I just think it's just, I just think we're being a little bit lazy towards our taxpayers and our constituents to actually take five. I'd be more apt to see two or three. My comment. Yeah, I'm gonna go to Councilor Pena, then Vice President Ground, and we'll see where this goes. I think Councilor Luce had his hand up probably before me. Yeah, we're still in the amendment, I'm sorry. But I'll go ahead, okay. Uh, then, yeah. Go ahead. Ms. Pre oh, okay. She deferred um, to you. I just didn't. I, I, I do think it's important that we're hearing these meetings. Um, and, I, and also, I think the comment about people would rather, maybe, yeah, we, maybe there's some people that would rather be online, but there, I got to believe that there are some, that, that that could be a hindrance for somebody as well and could keep people from participating. I mean, you, have to, you have to admit that there may be some people that are not going to participate in this meeting if they're not allowed to be in here and if we're entirely online. So we have to keep that in mind as well. So. I, real quick, what is the current policy on this? I mean, is this the, is this the, the president's discretion? Um, I know Councilor Brisson had joined us recently online and I believe participated in that. I think, if I remember right, years ago it was you could call in but may not be able to vote. I mean, what, what is, is it the discretion of the president? Mr. President, Councilor um, Lewis, the, the rules don't address this right now, so it's um, something that has come up you know, obviously within the last couple of years that, that the rules are silent on with respect to um, the, whether or not virtual attendance counts as attendance. I think that it has been exercised um, by the president in the event that somebody is, is ill. Certainly um, it makes sense, you know, that we would be nimble enough to allow that flexibility. But I kind of see this as giving the council's ability to, um, to give some guidance on what it would like to see here. So. Uh, historically, before we were able to have a virtual interface with um, a video interface, uh, there was the ability to phone in to a meeting, and that was at the president's discretion, and that is still pretty clearly articulated within the rules um, that the president can authorize a phone in um, with, with some parameters there in the case of an emergency, in case of a major life event, and I think there's one other parameter there. So the rules have always addressed that for phone in, but they haven't addressed it um, now that the video platform is available. And I think in the past, Mr. President, that in the, the past, the expectation has always been that if there's a live meeting like this, the expectation is that counselors are here. And the only thing about this is uh, with, uh, with the ability to, I guess, take five meetings. And man, I'd love to go to Montana for four months this summer and call in on every single one of those, you know, but. Um, but I don't think that that's uh, really respectful of our city and respectful of this council, especially when there's, you know, people here that are making plans to be here. So, um, so I, I think you know I, I'm open to something like this. I think if we can uh, put in there that the expectation is that you know when we have live meetings, our, our, our meetings, you know, we're we're to be here. The expectations is counselors are here and present, just like we would, you know, want people to that can to be able to come here and participate in that way. And then probably not five in that regard. How about, would you be open to, uh, would the sponsors be open to three? Let's go back to the sponsor, but we've got some other counselors that want to weigh in. So let's let the sponsor respond to that, and then we'll keep going around. Yeah, I, I would just say that, that you know, I, I started out with a different number, and, and you know, one of the co-sponsors was interested in it being five, and that's the way we, we ran with it. Councilor Jones. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, the real key is no matter how many we put in it, and I think five is a good one to look at. If, it is, if it's too much, we, if it's being taken advantage of, we change it the next time. But in reality, that's where we're going anyway. Uh, I mean, I think that that's the way the world's going, and we're going to be starting to do partially Zoom and partially live and however it works. And uh, people have just as much opportunity, to, if not more, to interact with us when we are on Zoom or or not, they're not. They don't come down and interact with us, but they can much more comfortably 
<coughs> if we're doing it another way. So I, first of all, I would hope that the counselors wouldn't feel the need to take off all five days. But it is nice to have that in case of emergencies or other plans that they can't get out of. So I, I don't think it's excessive. Uh, but if it becomes excessive, we just change it. We have that right. Thank you. Councilors, other discussion? Councilor Grout, and then we'll go to, I'm sorry, I asked you earlier. Go ahead. Um, well, I was just going to say, you know, some people have a health issues too, you know, and sometimes, you know, I suffer from migraines and I come to these meetings live and in person <laughs> and suffering, you know, so it, it is good to be able to um, to zoom in for those reasons as, as well and um, I think Councilor Jones said it, you know, times are changing and I think that, you know, just to have this this opportunity where um, you could maybe sit back a little bit and not um, have to, to be here in person because we attend, probably with committees and all, we attend, um, what is it, 24 plus another probably yep. 24, like 50 some meetings in, in, in addition to our commission meetings, in addition to meeting with the administration, in addition to, you know, um, um, community events. We attend a lot of meetings. So I think five meetings is is good for us to little, the expectation that we are here um, live and in person. I agree with that. Um, but I think that we should have this little um, ability to have this little bit of a reprieve medical conditions or just um, what personal issues. Thank you. Councilor Grout, and then just a reminder, folks, we only have five more minutes to do this one and another one, and we're going to have to suspend the rules and keep going, which y'all don't want to do. So, Mr. President, thank you. I, um, I think it's important that when I, when I was elected, I knew that my expectation was to be here every two weeks, and I have made my um, plans around that. Um, I like to go out of town and see my grandkids, but I'm back here on Mondays because that's what I'm supposed to do. And um, I think if I'm sick, that's one thing. But if you know, I need to plan around this obligation. And um, I think five meetings is a lot. And if I would be more open to a couple. And then we also have, if we're sick, you know, we're excused from those. But that's my opinion. Councilors, other discussion on this. Councilor Benton. Yeah, I was just point out that that uh, I think it was implied by, by another uh, council, council person who spoke, but um, yeah, I mean, the perception is not going to be good if someone were to abuse this. But I mean, I, I do agree with Councilor Pena, and I do uh, w with, with the demands and so forth. And, uh, you know, this, this position was uh, originally imagined as a, as a part-time job, as something you could do and still completely live your life in a regular manner. And I'm here to say, at least for me, and in my district, that has not been the case. Um, and uh, uh, I certainly would never want to miss out <coughs> on the opportunity to attend a meeting, but sometimes uh, as my life changes, you know, that there, there are more often times when I need, I feel like I need uh, that ability, uh, that flexibility that uh, Councillor Pena was describing. Thank you. And I think we're still on, Councilor Fiberkor, remember, we're still on Councilor Bassan's amendment to the amendment, which we need to do, yeah. or y'all are going to have to extend this meeting some more. Councilor Bassan. Mr. President, I would like to change my amendment. Oh, good. I would like to change my amendment to strike seven days and read, uh, each councilor may virtually attend up to five in-person meetings of the city council per calendar year, so long as advance notice is provided to the president for each occurrence, and every possible effort is made to attend in person. So the motion is modified. The second, yeah, that's fine. Councilor Benton. Questions on that? Councilors, all those in favor of Councilor Bassan's amendment to the amendment say yes and raise your hand. Yes. Any opposed? That's unanimous. We are back on the amendment as amended. Thank you. Or the rules amendment, I guess I should say. Councilor Benton and sponsors, anything further? Or any other discussion? Mr. Any other sponsors want to speak? Otherwise, I'll just urge your support. Mr. President, uh, can I offer a friendly amendment to include the CAO in that uh, amendment as well? You got to take that up with the bed upstairs. <laughs> Counselors, all those in favor of rules amendment say yes. 
Raise your hand. Yes. Any opposed? That's one opposed, eight to one. That matter carries. Councilors, the last item on our agenda this evening is approval of our committee appointments. I move approval of the committee appointments distributed today and they're on your dais uh, and in iPads. We have multiple seconds. Any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor. Councilor Pena. One. Does anybody want to trade water with me? <laughs> the water. <laughs> Councilors, as we always have, if uh, there is an opportunity to swap with somebody who would like to do that, just send that along and we can always do that on the fly at any meeting. So all those in favor of the committee approval, say yes. Any opposed? I think we're done and we got all the legal things right, right? 30 seconds to spare. There being no more further business, the city council is adjourned. All right.